Dead Souls, Nikolai Gogol, Volume 2, Chapter 1 Why, then, make a show of the poverty of our life and our sad imperfection, unearthing people from the backwoods, from remote corners of the state? But what if this is in the writer's nature, and his own imperfection grieves him so, and the makeup of his talent is such, that he can only portray the poverty of our life? unearthing people from the backwoods, from remote corners of the state. So here we are again in the backwoods. Again we have come out in some corner. Yes, but what a backwoods and what a corner. Over a thousand miles and more raced the meandering mountain heights. Like the giant rampart of some endless fortress they rose above the plains. Now as a yellowish cliff, a gullied and pitted wall in appearance, now as a rounded green prominence covered, as if with lamb swool, with young shrubs growing from the stumps of cut trees, or, finally, with dark forest so far spared the axe. The river, sometimes faithful to its high banks, followed them in their angles and bends over the whole expanse, but at other times abandoned them to go into the meadows, meandering there through several meanders, flashing like fire in the sun, then vanished in groves of birches, aspens, and alders, to rush out again in triumph, accompanied by bridges, mills, and dams that seemed to pursue it at every turn. In one place the steep side of the heights heaved itself higher than the rest and was decked out from top to bottom in a greenery of thickly crowding trees. Everything was there together. Maples, pear trees, low-growing willows, gorse, birches, firs, and mountain ash all twined with hops. Here flashed the red roofs of manor buildings, the fretwork cornices of cottages hiding behind them, and the upper story added to the manor house itself. And over this whole heap of trees and roofs the ancient church raised aloft its five gleaming tops. On each of them stood a gold openwork cross, attached to the cupola by gold openwork chains, so that the gold shone from afar as if it were suspended in air, not attached to anything. And this whole heap of trees and roofs, together with the church, turned upside down was reflected in the river, where picturesquely ugly old willows, some standing on the bank, some right in the water, trailing their branches and leaves in it, were as if gazing at this picture, which they could not get their fill of admiring through all their long lives. The view was not bad at all, but the view from above, from the upper story of the house, onto the plains and the distance, was better still. No guest or visitor could long stand indifferently on the balcony. His breath would be taken away, and he would only be able to say, Lord, how spacious it is, the space opened out endlessly. Beyond the meadows strewn with copses and water mills, thick forests stood green and blue, like seas or mist spreading far away. Beyond the forests, through the hazy air, showed yellowing sands. Beyond the sands, a ridge against the far curve of the sky, lay chalk mountains, their dazzling whiteness gleaming even in rainy spells, as if an eternal sun shone on them. Here and there upon them, light misty blue spots smoked. These were remote villages, but the human I could no longer make them out. Only the golden dome of a church, flashing like a spark, made known that it was a large, populous village. All this was wrapped in imperturbable silence, which was not broken even by the barely audible echoes of the aerial singers that filled the air. In short, no guest or visitor could long stand indifferently on the balcony, and after some two hours of contemplation he would utter the same exclamation as in the first minute. Heavenly powers, how spacious it is who then was the occupant of this estate, which, like an impregnable fortress, 
could not even be approached from here, but had to be approached from the other side, through meadows, wheat fields, and finally, a sparse oak grove spread picturesquely over the green, right up to the cottages and the master's house. Who was the occupant, the master and owner of this estate? To what happy man did this remote corner belong? To Andrei Ivanovich Tintetnikov, landowner of the Tremolakan district, a young gentleman, 33 years old, a collegiate secretary, an unmarried man. And what sort of man, then, of what disposition, what qualities and character, was the landowner Andrei Ivanovich Tintetnikov? To be sure, these inquiries ought to be addressed to his neighbors. One neighbor, who belonged to the race of retired staff officers and firebrands, expressed himself about him in a laconic expression. A natural-born brute. The general who lived six miles away used to say, a young man, no fool, but with too many ideas in his head. I could be useful to him, because I have in Petersburg, and even at the, the general never finished his speech. The district captain of police observed, No, but his rank is trash, and what if I come by tomorrow to collect the arrears? A mujik from his estate, if asked what sort of master he had, usually gave no answer. In short, the public opinion of him was rather unfavorable than favorable. And yet, in his essence, Andrei Ivanovich was neither a good nor a bad being, but simply, a burner of the daylight. Since there are already not a few people in the world occupied with burning the daylight, why should Tintetnikov not burn it as well? However, here in a few words is the full journal of his day, and from it the reader himself can judge what his character was. In the morning he awoke very late and, sitting up, stayed in bed for a long time rubbing his eyes. His eyes, as ill luck would have it, were small, and therefore the rubbing of them was performed for an extraordinarily long time. All the while the servant Michaela would be standing at the door with a wash basin and a towel. This poor Michaela would stand there for one hour, two hours, then go to the kitchen, come back again. The master would still be rubbing his eyes and sitting on his bed. Finally he would get up, wash himself, put on his dressing gown, and come out to the drawing room to have tea, coffee, cocoa, and even fresh milk, taking little sips of each, crumbling his bread unmercifully, and shamelessly scattering pipe ashes everywhere. Two hours he would spend over his tea. What's more, he would take a cold cup and with it move to the window looking out on the yard. And at the window the following scene would take place each time. First of all, the unshaven butler Grigory would bellow, addressing himself to the housekeeper, Perfilievna, in the following terms, You wretched petty landowning soul, you nonentity, you'd better shut up, vile wench and that's all. I take no orders from the likes of you, you guzzling gullet, the nonentity, that is, Perfilievna, would shout back. Nobody can get along with you. You even scrap with the steward, you barnyard piddler, Grigory would bellow. The steward's a thief, just like you. The nonentity would shout back, so that it could be heard in the village. You're both drunkards. You're ruining the master. You bottomless barrels. You think the master doesn't know it? There he is, and he can hear you. Where is he? He's sitting there in the window. He can see everything. And indeed the master was sitting in the window and could see everything. To crown it all, a house serf's brat was yelling his head off, having received a whack from his mother. A borzoi hound was whimpering, crouched on the ground, for reason of being scalded with boiling hot water by the cook, who was peeking out from the kitchen. In short, everything was howling and squealing insufferably. The master could see and hear it all. And only when it became so unbearable 
that it even prevented the master from doing nothing, would he send to tell them to make their noise more quietly. Two hours before dinner, Andrei Ivanovich would go to his study in order to occupy himself truly and seriously. The occupation was indeed a serious one. It consisted in pondering a work which had been long and continuously pondered. This work was to embrace Russia from all viewpoints, civic, political, religious, philosophical, to resolve the difficult problems and questions posed for her by the times, and to define clearly her great future, in short, a work of vast scope. But so far it had all ended with the pondering. The pen got well chewed, doodles appeared on the paper, then it was all pushed aside. A book was taken up instead, and not put down until dinner time. The book was read with the soup, the sauce, the stew, and even the pastry, so that some dishes got cold as a result, while others were sent back quite untouched. Then came a pipe and the sipping of a cup of coffee, then a game of chess with himself. What was done from then until supper time it is really quite difficult to say. It seems that simply nothing was done. And thus, as alone as could be in the whole world, this young man of thirty-three spent his time, sitting around in a dressing gown without a tie. He did not feel like strolling, like walking, did not even want to go upstairs and have a look at the distances and views, did not even want to open the windows and let some fresh air into his room, and the beautiful view of the countryside, which no visitor could admire with indifference, was as if it did not exist for the owner himself. From this journal, the reader can see that Andrei Ivanovich Tentetnikov belonged to that race of people, so numerous in Russia, who are known as sluggards, liabeds, sloths, and the like. Whether such characters are born that way or become that way later on, who can answer? I think that, instead of an answer, it would be better to tell the story of Andrei Ivanovich's childhood and upbringing. In childhood he was a clever, talented boy, now lively, now pensive. By a lucky or unlucky chance, he landed in a school of which the director was, in his own way, a remarkable man, despite certain whimsicalities. Alexander Petrovich possessed the gift of sensing the nature of the Russian man and knew the language in which to speak to him. No child left his presence crestfallen. On the contrary, even after a severe reprimand, he would feel a certain cheerfulness and a desire to smooth over the nastiness or trespass committed. The crowd of his charges seemed to look so mischievous, casual, and lively that one might have taken them for disorderly, unbridled freebooters. But that would have been a mistake. One man's power was felt only too well by these freebooters. There was no mischief maker or prankster who would not come to him on his own and tell all the mischief he had done. The least movement of their thoughts was known to him. In all things he acted extraordinarily. He used to say that one ought first of all to awaken ambition in a man. He called ambition the force that pushes a man forward, without which he cannot be moved to activity. Many times he did not restrain playfulness and prankishness at all. In elementary playfulness he saw the awakening development of the soul's qualities. He needed it in order to see precisely what lay hidden in a child. So an intelligent doctor looks calmly at the temporary fits approaching and the rashes appearing on the body, not combating them, but studying them attentively, so as to find out for certain precisely what is concealed inside the man. He did not have many teachers, the majority of the subjects he taught himself, and, truth to tell, he knew how to convey the very soul of a subject in a few words, without any of the pedantic terminology, the enormous views and opinions that young professors like to flaunt, so that even a young child could see clearly the precise need for this subject. He maintained that what man needed most was the science of life, that once he knew that, 
he would then know for himself what he must occupy himself with predominantly. This science of life he made the subject of a separate course of study, to which he admitted only the most excellent. Those of small ability he let go into government service after the first year, maintaining that there was no need to torment them too much. It was enough for them if they learned to be patient, industrious workers, without acquiring presumptuousness or any long-range views. But with the clever ones, the gifted ones, I must take a lot more trouble, he used to say. And in this course he became a totally different Alexander Petrovich, who from the first announced to them that so far he had demanded simple intelligence from them, but now he would demand a higher intelligence. Not the intelligence that knows how to taunt a fool and laugh at him, but one that knows how to endure any insult, ignore the fool, and not become irritated. It was here that he started to demand what others demand of children. It was this that he called the highest degree of intelligence, to preserve the lofty calm in which man must abide eternally amid any griefs whatever. It was this that he called intelligence. It was in this course that Alexander Petrovich showed that he indeed knew the science of life. Of subjects those alone were selected which were able to form a man into a citizen of his country. The majority of the lectures consisted of accounts of what lay ahead for a man in all careers and steps of government service and private occupations. All the troubles and obstacles that could be set up on a man's path all the temptations and seductions lying in wait for him. He gathered before them in all their nakedness, concealing nothing. Everything was known to him, just as if he himself had filled every rank and post. In short, what he outlined for them was not at all a bright future. Strangely enough, whether because ambition was already so strongly awakened in them, or because there was something in the very eyes of their extraordinary mentor that said to a young man, Forward, that word which produces such miracles in the Russian man. In any case, the young men sought only difficulties from the very start, longing to act only where it was difficult, where one had to show great strength of soul. There was something sober in their life, Alexander Petrovich did all sorts of experiments and tests with them, inflicting palpable insults on them either himself or by means of their comrades, but, perceiving as much, they would become still more prudent. Few finished this course, but those few were stalwarts, people who had been under fire, in the service they held out in the most unstable posts, while many far more intelligent men, not able to endure, quit the service on account of petty personal troubles, quit altogether, or, quite unawares, wound up in the hands of bribe-takers and crooks. But those educated by Alexander Petrovich not only did not waver, but, wise in their knowledge of man and the soul, acquired a lofty moral influence even over the bribe-takers and bad people. But poor Andrei Ivanovich did not manage to taste this learning. He had just been deemed worthy of moving on to this higher course as one of the very best, and suddenly, disaster. The extraordinary mentor, from whom one word of approval sent him into sweet tremors, unexpectedly died. Everything changed at the school. To replace Alexander Petrovich there came a certain Fyodor Ivanovich a man both kind and diligent, but with a totally different view of things. He imagined something unbridled in the free casualness of the children in the first course. He began to introduce certain external rules among them, demanded that the young men remain somehow mutely silent, that they never walk otherwise than in pairs. He himself even began to measure the distance between pairs with a yardstick. At table, to improve appearances, he seated them all by height rather than by intelligence, so that the asses got the best portions and the clever got only scraps. All this caused murmuring, 
especially when the new head, as if in defiance of his predecessor, announced that intelligence and success in studies meant nothing to him, that he looked only at conduct, that even if a person was a poor student, if his conduct was good, he would prefer him to a clever one. But Fyodor Ivanovich did not get exactly what he wanted. Secret pranks started, which, as everyone knows, are worse than open ones. Everything was tip-top during the day, but at night, a spree. In his manner of teaching subjects, he turned everything upside down. With the best intentions, he introduced all sorts of novelties, all of them inappropriate. He brought in new teachers with new opinions and new points of view. They taught learnedly, showered their listeners with a host of new words and terms. One could see the logical connection and the conformity with new discoveries, but, alas, there was simply no life in the subject itself. It all seemed like carrion in the eyes of listeners who had already begun to have some understanding. Everything was inside out. But the worst thing was the loss of respect for their superiors and for authority. They began to mock both mentors and teachers. The director came to be called Fedka, Breadroll, and various other names. Such things got started that many boys had to be expelled and thrown out. Andrei Ivanovich was of a quiet disposition. He did not participate in the nighttime orgies of his comrades, who, despite the strictest supervision, had got themselves a mistress on the side, one for eight of them, nor in other pranks that went as far as blasphemy and the mockery of religion itself, only because the director demanded frequent attendance at church, and the priest happened to be a bad one. But he was downcast. Ambition had been strongly awakened in him, but there was no activity or career before him. It would have been better for him not to be awakened. He listened to the professors getting excited at the podium and remembered his former mentor, who had known how to speak clearly without getting excited. He heard lectures in chemistry and the philosophy of law and profound professorial analyses of all the subtleties of political science and the universal history of mankind on such an enormous scale that in three years, the professor managed only to give an introduction and to speak on the development of communes in some German cities. But all this remained as some sort of misshapen scraps in his head. Thanks to his natural intelligence, he simply felt that that was not how to teach, but how to teach, he did not know. And he often remembered Alexander Petrovich, and it made him so sad that he did not know where to turn for sorrow. But youth has a future. The closer he came to graduation, the more his heart beat. He said to himself, this is still not life. This is only the preparation for life. Real life is in the service. The great deeds are there. And without even a glance at the beautiful corner that so struck every visiting guest, without paying respects to his parents' remains, Following the pattern of all ambitious men, he raced off to Petersburg, where, as is well known, our ardent youth flock from all ends of Russia, to serve, to shine, to make careers, or simply to skim the surface of our colorless, ice-cold, delusive higher education. Andrei Ivanovich's ambition was, however, brought up short from the very beginning by his uncle, the actual state counselor Anya Fry Ivanovich. He announced that the chief thing is good handwriting, that and nothing else, and without it one can become neither a minister nor a state counselor. Whereas Tintetnikov's handwriting was the sort of which people say, a magpie wrote it with her claw, and not a man. With great difficulty, and with the help of his uncle's connections, after spending two months studying calligraphy, he finally found a position as a copying clerk in some department. When he entered the big, bright room, all filled with writing gentlemen, sitting at lacquered desks, scratching with their quills, and tilting their heads to one side, 
and when he himself was seated and straighter, Wei handed some document to copy. An extraordinarily strange feeling came over him. For a moment it seemed to him that he was at some primary school, starting to learn his ABCs over again. As if on account of some delinquency, he had been transferred from the upper grade to the lowest. The gentlemen sitting around him seemed to him so like pupils. Some of them were reading novels, holding them between the big pages of the case in hand, pretending to be busy with it, and at the same time giving a start each time a superior appeared. His school days suddenly stood before him as an irretrievably lost paradise. So lofty did his studies suddenly become compared with this petty writing occupation. How much higher that school preparation for the service now seemed to him than the service itself. And suddenly in his thoughts Alexander Petrovich stood before him as if alive. His wonderful mentor, incomparable with anyone else, irreplaceable by anyone else and tears suddenly poured in streams from his eyes. The room spun, the desks moved, the officials all mixed together, and he almost fell down in a momentary blackout. No, he said to himself, recovering, I'll set to work, however petty it seems at the start. Harnessing his heart and spirit, he resolved to serve on the example of the others. Where will one not find pleasures? They also live in Petersburg, despite its stern, somber appearance. A biting twenty below zero outside. A witch blizzard shrieking like a desperate demon. Pulling the collars of fur coats and greatcoats over heads. Powdering men's mustaches and animals' muzzles. But friendly is the light in a window somewhere high up. Perhaps even on the fourth floor. In a cozy room by the light of modest steering candles, to the hum of the samovar, a heart and soul-warming conversation goes on. A bright page from an inspired Russian poet, such as God has bestowed upon his Russia, is being read, and a youth's young heart flutters so ardently and loftily, as never happens in any other lands, even under splendid southern skies. Tentetnikov soon got accustomed to the service, only it became not the first thing or aim, as he had thought at the start, but something secondary. It served to organize his time, making him better cherish the remaining minutes. The uncle, the actual state counselor, was already beginning to think that something good would come of his nephew, when the nephew suddenly mucked things up. It must be said that among Andrei Ivanovich's friends there were two of what are known as disgruntled men. They were the sort of troublesomely strange characters who are unable to bear with equanimity not only injustice, but even anything that in their eyes looks like injustice. Basically kind, but disorderly in their actions, they were full of intolerance towards others. Their ardent talk and loftily indignant manner influenced him greatly. Arousing the nerves and the spirit of vexation in him, they made him notice all the trifles he had never even thought of paying attention to before. He suddenly took a dislike to Fyodor Fyodorovich Lenitsyn, the head of the department he worked in, a man of most agreeable appearance. He began to find myriads of faults in him and came to hate him for having such a sugary expression when talking to a superior, and straightaway becoming all vinegar when addressing a subordinate. I could forgive him, said Tintetnikov, if the change in his face did not occur so quickly, but it's right there in front of my eyes, both sugar and vinegar at once. After that he started noticing every step. It seemed to him that Fyodor Fyodorovich gave himself far too many airs, that he had all the ways of a minor official, to wit, making note of all those who did not come to congratulate him on festive occasions, even taking revenge on all those whose names were not found on the doorkeeper's list, and a host of other sinful accessories which neither a good nor a wicked man can do without. He felt a nervous loathing for him. 
Some evil spirit prompted him to do something unpleasant to Fyodor Fyodorovich. He sought it out with some special enjoyment, and he succeeded. Once he exchanged such words with him that the authorities declared he must either apologize or retire. He sent in his resignation. His uncle, the actual state counselor, came to him all frightened and beseeching. For Christ's sake, have mercy. Andrei Ivanovich, what are you doing? Leaving a career that has begun so profitably, only because the superior happens to be not so. What is this? What is if one looked at such things, there would be no one left in the service. Be reasonable, be reasonable. There's still time. Renounce your pride and your amour propre. Go and talk with him. That's not the point, dear uncle, said the nephew. It's not hard for me to apologize, the more so as I am indeed to blame. He is my superior, and I should never have spoken to him in that way. But the point is this. You forget that I have a different service. I have three hundred peasant souls. My estate is in disorder, and the steward is a fool. It will be no great loss to the state if someone else sits in the office copying papers instead of me. But it will be a great loss if three hundred men don't pay their taxes. I am a landowner. The title is not a worthless one. If I take care to preserve, protect, and improve the lot of the people entrusted to me, and present the state with three hundred fit, sober, and industrious subjects, will my service be in any way worse than the service of some department chief Lenitsen? The actual state councillor stood gaping in astonishment. He had not expected such a torrent of words. After a moment's thought, he began in the following vein, but all the same, all the same, why go perish yourself in the country? What sort of society is there among mujiks? Here, after all, you can come across a general or a prince in the street. If you wish, you can walk past some handsome public buildings, or else go and look at the Neva, but there whatever comes along is either a mujik or a wench. Why condemn yourself to ignorance for the rest of your life? So spoke his uncle, the actual state counselor. He himself had never once in his life walked any other street than the one that led to his place of service, where there were no handsome public buildings. He never noticed anyone he met, either general or prince. He had not the foggiest notion of the fancies that are the attraction of a capital for people greedy for license and had never once in his life even been in a theater. He said all this solely in order to stir up the young man's ambition and work on his imagination. In this, however, he did not succeed. Tintetnikov stubbornly held his own. He had begun to weary of the departments and the capital. The countryside had begun to appear as a sort of haven of freedom, a nourisher of thoughts and intentions, the only path for useful activity. Some two weeks after this conversation, he was already in the vicinity of the places where his childhood had flown by. How it all started coming back to him. How his heart began to beat when he felt he was nearing his father's estate. He had already completely forgotten many places and gazed curiously, like a newcomer, at the beautiful views. When the road raced through a narrow ravine into the thick of a vast, overgrown forest, and he saw above, below, over, and under himself three century old oaks of enormous girth, mixed with silver firs, elms, and black poplars that overtopped the white, and when, to the question, whose forest, he was told, Tintetnikov's, when, emerging from the forest, the road raced across meadows, past aspen groves, willows, and vines young and old, with a view of the distant mountains, and flew over bridges which in various places crossed one and the same river, leaving it now to the right, now to the left of him, and when, to the question, whose fields and water meadows, he was answered, Tintetnikov's, when, after that, 
The road went uphill and over a level elevation past unharvested fields of wheat, rye, and oats on one side, and on the other past all the places he had just driven by, which all suddenly appeared in the picturesque distance, and when, gradually darkening, the road started to enter and then did enter under the shade of wide-spreading trees, scattered over a green carpet right up to the estate and before him peasant cottages and red-roofed manor buildings began to flash. When the ardently pounding heart knew even without asking where it had come to, the constantly accumulating feelings finally burst out in almost these words, Well, haven't I been a fool all this while? Destiny appointed me the owner of an earthly paradise, a prince, and I got myself enslaved as a scrivener in an office. After studying, being educated, enlightened, laying up quite a large store of information necessary precisely in order to direct people, to improve the whole region, to fulfill the manifold duties of a landowner as judge, manager, keeper of order, I entrusted this place to an ignorant steward, and instead of that chose what? Copying papers which a cantonist who never went to any school can do incomparably better, and once again Andrei Ivanovich Tentetnikov called himself a fool, and meanwhile another spectacle awaited him. Having learned of the master's arrival, the population of the entire village gathered by the porch. Gay-colored kerchiefs, headbands, scarfs, homespun coats, beards of all sorts, spade, shovel, wedge-shaped, red, blonde, and white as silver, covered the whole square. The mujiks boomed out, our provider, we've waited so long, the women wailed, gold, the hearts silver, those who stood further away even fought in their zeal to press forward. A wobbly crone who looked like a dried pear crept between the other's legs, accosted him, clasped her hands and shrieked, Our little runny nose, what a weakling you are. The cursed Germans have starved you out. Away with you. Granny, the spade, shovel, and wedge-shaped beards all shouted at her. Watch where you're shoving, you old scraggy one. Someone tacked on a little word, at which only a Russian peasant could keep from laughing. The master could not help himself and laughed, but nevertheless he was deeply touched in his soul. So much love, and what for, he thought to himself, for never having seen them, for never concerning myself with them. I give my word that henceforth I will share all your labors and concerns with you. I'll do everything to help you become what you ought to be, what the good nature that is in you meant you to be so that your love for me will not be in vain, so that I will indeed be your provider. And in fact, Tintetnikov began managing and giving orders in earnest. He saw on the spot that the steward was an old woman and a fool, with all the qualities of a rotten steward. That is, he kept a careful account of the hens and the eggs, of the yarn and linen the women brought but did not know a blessed thing about harvesting and sowing, and on top of that suspected the peasants of making attempts on his life. He threw out the fool steward and chose another to replace him, a perky one. He disregarded trifles and paid attention to the main things, reduced the corvée, decreased the number of days the mujiks had to work for him, added more time for them to work for themselves, and thought that things would now go most excellently. He began to enter into everything himself, to appear in the fields, on the threshing floor, in the barns, at the mills, on the wharf where barges and flatboats were loaded and sent off. He's a quick stepper, that he is, the mujik started saying, and even scratched their heads, because from long-standing womanish management, they had turned into a rather lazy lot. But this did not last long. The Russian mujik is clever and intelligent. They soon understood that though the master was quick and wanted to take many things in hand, 
yet precisely how, in what way to take them in hand. Of this he still knew nothing. He spoke somehow too literally and fancifully, puzzling for a mujik and beyond his ability. As a result, while there was not really a total lack of comprehension between master and mujik, they simply sang to different tunes, never able to produce the same note. Tentetnikov began to notice that everything turned out somehow worse on the master's land than on the mujik's. The sowing came earlier, the sprouting later. Yet it seemed they worked well. He himself was there, and even ordered a reward of a noggin of vodka for diligent work. The mujiks had long had rye in the ear, oats swelling, millet bushing out, while his grain was still in the shoot and the ears had not yet begun to form. In short, the master began to notice that the mujiks were simply cheating him, despite all his good turns. He made an attempt to reproach them, but received the following answer. How can it be, your honor, that we haven't been zealous for the master's profit? You yourself were pleased to see how diligently we plowed and sowed. You ordered us given a noggin of vodka each. What objection could he make to that? But why has it turned out so badly now? The master persisted. Who knows? Must be worms gnawed it from below. And just look at this summer. No rain at all. But the master could see that worms had not gnawed the mujik's crops from below. And it rained somehow oddly. In strips, the mujik's got it while the master's fields did not get so much as a single drop. It was harder still for him to get along with the women. They asked so often to be excused from work, complaining about the heaviness of the corvée. How strange. He had abolished outright all bringing in of linen, berries, mushrooms, and nuts, and reduced the other tasks by half. Thinking that the women would spend this time on housework, sewing, making clothes for their husbands, improving their kitchen gardens. Not a bit of it. Such idleness, fights, gossip, and all sorts of quarrels set in a. Mong the fair sex that the husbands kept coming to him with such words as, Master, quiet down this demon of a woman, just like some devil. She won't let me live, several times, with heavy heart, he wanted to introduce severity. But how could he be severe? The woman would come as such a woman. Get into such shrieking. Was so sick. So ailing. Would wrap herself up in such poor, vile rags. God only knows where she got them. Go, just leave my sight. God be with you, poor Tintetnikov would say. After which he would have the pleasure of seeing how the sick woman, coming out, would start squabbling with a neighbor over some turnip and give her such a drubbing as even a healthy man would not be capable of. He decided to try and start some sort of school among them, but such nonsense came out of it that he even hung his head. It would be better not to think about it. All this significantly chilled his enthusiasm both for management and for acting as judge and generally for all activity. He was present at the field work almost without noticing it. His thoughts were far away. His eyes searched for extraneous objects. During the mowing he did not watch the quick raising of sixty scythes at once, followed by the measured fall, with a faint sound, of rows of tall grass. Instead he looked off to the side at some bend of the river, on the bank of which walked some red-nosed, red-legged stalker. A stork, of course, not a man. He watched the stork catch a fish and hold it crosswise in its beak, as if considering whether to swallow it or not, and at the same time looking intently up the river, where, some distance away, another stork could be seen who had not yet caught a fish, but was looking intently at the one who already had. During the harvest, he did not look at how the sheaves were piled in shocks, in crosses, or sometimes simply in heaps. He hardly cared whether the piling and stacking was done lazily or briskly. 
eyes closed, face lifted up to the spacious sky. He allowed his nose to imbibe the scent of the fields and his ears to be struck by the voices of the songful populace of the air. When it comes from everywhere, heaven and earth, to join in one harmonious chorus with no discord among themselves. The quail throbs, the corn crate crakes in the grass, linnets warble and twitter as they fly from place to place. The trilling of the lark spills down an invisible stairway of air, and the whooping of cranes rushing in a line off to one side, just like the sounding of silver trumpets, comes from the emptiness of the resoundingly vibrant airy desert. If the field work was close to him, he was far away from it. If it was far away, his eyes sought out things that were close, and he was like the distracted schoolboy who, while looking into his book, sees only the snook his comrade is cocking at him at the same time. In the end, he stopped going out to the field work altogether, dropped entirely all administering of justice and punishments, firmly ensconced himself inside, and even stopped receiving the steward with his reports. From time to time a neighbor would stop by, a retired lieutenant of the Hazars, a thoroughly smoke-saturated pipe smoker, or the firebrand colonel, a master and lover of talking about everything. But this, too, began to bore him. Their conversation began to seem to him somehow superficial, lively, adroit behavior, slappings on the knee, and other such casualness began to seem much too direct and overt to him. He decided to break off all his acquaintances, and even did it quite abruptly. Namely, when that representative of all firebrand colonels, he who was most pleasant in all superficial conversations about everything, Barber Nikolaik Vishnapokromov, came calling precisely in order to talk his fill, touching on politics and philosophy and literature and morality and even the state of England's finances, he sent word that he was not at home and at the same time was so imprudent as to appear in the window. The guests and host's eyes met. One, of course, grumbled brute through his teeth, while the other also sent after him something like a swine. Thus ended their acquaintance. After that no one came to see him. Total solitude installed itself in the house. The master got permanently into his dressing gown, giving his body over to inaction and his mind, to pondering a big work about Russia. How this work was being pondered, the reader has already seen. The day came and went, monotonous and colorless. It cannot be said, however, that there were not moments when he seemed to awaken from his sleep, when the mail brought newspapers, new books and magazines, and in the press he came across the familiar name of a former schoolmate, who had already succeeded in some prominent post of the government service, or made a modest contribution to science and world knowledge, a secret, quiet sadness would come to his heart, and a doleful, wordlessly sad, quiet complaint at his own inactivity would involuntarily escape him. Then his life seemed revolting and vile to him. Before him his past school days rose up with extraordinary force, and suddenly Alexander Petrovich stood before him as if alive. A flood of tears poured from his eyes, and his weeping continued for almost the whole day. What was the meaning of this weeping? Was his aching soul thereby revealing the doleful mystery of its illness, that the lofty inner man who was beginning to be built in him had had no time to form and gain strength, that, not tried from early years in the struggle with failure, he had never attained the lofty ability to rise and gain strength from obstacles and barriers, that, having melted like heated metal, the wealth of great feelings had not been subjected to a final tempering and now, lacking resilience, his will was powerless, that an extraordinary mentor had died too soon 
and there was no longer anyone in the whole world capable of raising and holding up those forces rocked by eternal vacillation and that feeble will lacking in resilience, who could cry out in a live and rousing voice, cry out to his soul the rousing word, forward, which the Russian man everywhere, at every level of rank, title, and occupation, yearns for. Where is he who, in the native tongue of our Russian soul, could speak to us this all-powerful word, forward, who, knowing all the forces and qualities, and all the depths of our nature, could, by one magic gesture, point the Russian man towards a lofty life? With what words, with what love the grateful Russian man would repay him? But century follows century. Half a million loafers, sluggards, and sloths lie in deep slumber, and rarely is a man born in Russia who is capable of uttering it, this all-powerful word. One circumstance, however, nearly roused Tintetnikov and nearly caused a turnabout in his character. Something resembling love occurred, but here, too, the matter somehow came to nothing. In the neighborhood, Six miles from his estate lived a general who, as we have already seen, spoke not altogether favorably of Tintetnikov. The general lived like a general, was hospitable, liked his neighbors to come and pay their respects. He himself, naturally, paid no visits, spoke hoarsely, read books, and had a daughter, a strange, incomparable being who could be regarded more as some fantastic vision than as a woman. It happens that a man sometimes sees such a thing in a dream, and afterwards he dwells on this dream all his life. Reality is lost to him forever, and he is decidedly good for nothing anymore. Her name was Yulinka. Her upbringing had been somehow strange. She was brought up by an English governess who did not know a word of Russian. She had lost her mother while still a child. The father had no time. Anyway, loving his daughter to distraction, he would only have spoiled her. It is extraordinarily difficult to paint her portrait. This was something as alive as life itself. She was lovelier than any beauty, better than intelligent, trimmer and more ethereal than a classical woman. It was simply impossible to tell what country had set its stamp on her, because it was difficult to find such a profile and facial form anywhere, except perhaps on antique cameos. As a child brought up in freedom, everything in her was willful. Had anyone seen the sudden wrath all at once gather wrinkles on her beautiful brow, as she ardently disputed with her father, he would have thought she was a most capricious being. Yet she was wrathful only when she heard of some injustice or cruel act done to anyone. But how this wrath would suddenly vanish if she saw misfortune overtake the one against whom she was wrathful, how she would suddenly throw him her purse, without reflecting on whether it was smart or stupid, or tear up her own dress for bandages if he were wounded. There was something impetuous in her. When she spoke, everything in her seemed to rush after her thought. The expression of her face, the expression of her speech, the movements of her hands, the very folds of her dress seemed to rush in the same direction. And it seemed as if she herself were about to fly off after her own words. Nothing in her was hidden. She would not have been afraid of displaying her thoughts before anyone, and no power could have forced her to be silent if she wished to speak. Her charming, peculiar gait, which belonged to her alone, was so dauntlessly free that everything inadvertently gave way to her. In her presence a bad man became somehow embarrassed and speechless, and a good one, even of the shyest sort could get to talking with her as never with anyone in his life before. And, strange illusion, from the first moments of the conversation, it would seem to him that he had known her sometime and somewhere, that it had been in the days of some immemorial infancy, 
in his own home on a gay evening with joyful games amid a crowd of children, and after that for a long time he would remain somehow bored with sensible adulthood. Andrei Ivanovich Tintetnikov could by no means have said how it happened that from the very first day he felt as if he had known her forever. An inexplicable new feeling entered his soul. His dull life became momentarily radiant. The dressing gown was abandoned for a while. He did not linger so long in bed. Michaelo did not stand for so long holding the wash basin. The windows got opened in the rooms, and the owner of the picturesque estate would spend a long time strolling along the shady, winding paths of his garden, standing for hours before the enchanting views in the distance. The general at first received Tintetnikov rather nicely and cordially, but they could not become completely close. Their conversations always ended with an argument and some unpleasant feeling on both sides. The general did not like to be contradicted or objected to, though at the same time he liked to talk even about things of which he had no knowledge. Tentetnikov, for his part, was also a ticklish man. However, a great deal was forgiven the father for the daughter's sake, and their peace held until some of the general's relatives came for a visit. The Countess Boldurev and the Princess Uzayakin, one a widow, the other an old maid, both erstwhile ladies-in-waiting, both chatterboxes, both gossips, of not entirely charming amiability, yet with important connections in Petersburg, and upon whom the general even fawned a bit. It seemed to Tintetnikov that since the very day of their arrival, the general had become somehow colder with him, scarcely noticed him, and treated him as a mute extra or a clerk employed for copying, the lowest sort. He called him now brother, now my dear fellow, and once even addressed him as boy. Andrei Ivanovich exploded. The blood rushed to his head. Teeth clenched and heart contrary, he nevertheless had enough presence of mind to say in an unusually courteous and gentle voice. As spots of color came to his cheeks and everything seethed inside him. I must thank you, General, for your good disposition. By your manner of address you invite me and summon me to the most intimate friendship, obliging me, too, to address you similarly. But allow me to observe that I am mindful of our difference in age, which utterly rules out such familiarity between us. The general was embarrassed. Collecting his words and thoughts, he began to say, albeit somewhat incoherently, that the familiarity had not been used in that sense that it was sometimes permissible for an old man to address a young one in such fashion. He did not mention a word about his rank. Naturally, after that their acquaintance ceased, and love ended at its very beginning. Out went the light that had gleamed before him momentarily, and the gloom that followed became still gloomier. The sloth got into his dressing gown once again. Everything steered itself once again towards prostration and inaction. Nastiness and disorder came to the house. A broom stood for days on end in the middle of the room together with its sweepings. His trousers sometimes even stopped for a visit in the drawing room. On an elegant table in front of the sofa lay a pair of greasy suspenders, as a sort of treat for a guest and so worthless and drowsy did his life become that not only did the house serfs stop respecting him, but even the barnyard chickens all but pecked him. He spent long hours impotently tracing doodles on paper. Little houses, cottages, carts, troikas, or else writing, Dear Sir, with an exclamation point in all sorts of hands and characters. And sometimes, all oblivious. The pen would trace of itself, without the master's knowledge, a little head with fine, sharp features with light, combed up tresses, falling from behind the comb in long, delicate curls, young bared arms, as if flying off somewhere, 
and with amazement. The master saw emerging the portrait of her whose portrait no artist could paint, and he would feel still sadder after that, and, believing that there was no happiness on earth, would remain dull and unresponsive for the rest of the day. Such were the circumstances of Andrei Ivanovich Tintetnikov. Suddenly one day, going up to the window in his usual way, with pipe and cup in hand, he noticed movement and a certain bustle in the yard. The scullion and the charwoman were running to open the gates, and in the gates horses appeared, exactly as they are sculpted or drawn on triumphal arches. A muzzle to the right, a muzzle to the left, a muzzle in the middle. Above them, on the box, a coachman and a lackey in a loose frock coat with a bandana tied around his waist. Behind them a gentleman in a peaked cap and an overcoat, wrapped in a rainbow-colored scarf. When the carriage wheeled around in front of the porch, it turned out to be nothing other than a light spring britska. A gentleman of remarkably decent appearance jumped out onto the porch with the swiftness and adroitness of an almost military man. Andrei Ivanovich quailed. He took him to be an official from the government. It must be mentioned that in his youth he had been mixed up in a certain unreasonable affair. Some philosophers from the Hazars, plus a former student and a ruined gambler, started a sort of philanthropic society under the supreme leadership of an old crook, a mason, a card sharper, a drunkard, and a most eloquent man. The society was set up with the purpose of bestowing solid happiness on all mankind from the banks of the Thames to Kamchatka. The cash box required was enormous. The donations collected from magnanimous members were unbelievable. Where it all went, only the supreme leader knew. Tentetnikov had been drawn into it by two friends who belonged to the class of disgruntled men, good men, but who, from the frequent toasting of science, enlightenment and progress, eventually became certified drunkards. Tentetnikov soon thought better of it and left this circle. But the society had already managed to get entangled in some other actions, even not entirely befitting a nobleman, so that later they also had to deal with the police. And so it was no wonder that, Though he had left and broken all relations with the benefactor of mankind, Tintetnikov nevertheless could not remain at peace. His conscience was somewhat uneasy. Not without fear did he now watch the door opening. His fear, however, passed suddenly, as the visitor made his bows with unbelievable adroitness, keeping his head slightly inclined to one side in a respectful attitude. In brief but definite words he explained that he had long been traveling over Russia, urged both by necessity and by inquisitiveness, that our state abounds in remarkable objects, to say nothing of the beauty of places, the abundance of industries, and the diversity of soils, that he was attracted by the picturesque setting of his estate, that nevertheless, Notwithstanding the picturesqueness of the setting, he would not have ventured to trouble him by his inopportune visit. If something had not happened to his britska which called for a helping hand from blacksmiths and artisans, that for all that, nevertheless, even if nothing had happened to his britska, he would have been unable to deny himself the pleasure of personally paying his respects. Having finished his speech, the visitor, with charming agreeableness, scraped with his foot, and, despite the plumpness of his body, straightaway made a little leap backwards with the lightness of a rubber ball. Andrei Ivanovich thought that this must be some inquisitive scholar and professor, who traveled over Russia with the purpose of collecting some sort of plants, or even minerals. He expressed all possible readiness to be of assistance, offered his artisans, wheelwrights and blacksmiths to repair the britska, begged him to make himself at home, 
seated his courteous visitor in a big Voltaire armchair, and prepared himself to listen to him talk, doubtless on subjects of learning and natural science. The visitor, however, touched more upon events of the inner world. He started speaking about the adversities of fate, they likened his life to a ship on the high seas, driven about by winds from every quarter, mentioned that he had had to change places and posts many times, that he had suffered much for the truth, that even his very life had more than once been in danger from enemies, and there was much else he said which let Tintetnikov see that his visitor was rather a practical man. In conclusion to it all, he blew his nose into a white cambric handkerchief, so loudly that Andrei Ivanovich had never heard the like of it. Sometimes in an orchestra there is one rascally trumpet which, when it strikes up, seems to quack not in the orchestra but in one's own ear. Exactly the same noise resounded in the awakened rooms of the dozing house, and was immediately followed by the fragrance of eau de cologne, invisibly diffused by an adroit shake of the cambric handkerchief. The reader has perhaps already guessed that the visitor was none other than our respected, long-abandoned Pavel Ivanovich Chichikov. He had aged slightly. One could see that the time had not been without storms and anxieties for him. It seemed as if the very tailcoat on him had aged slightly, and that the britska, and the coachman, and the servant, and the horses, and the harness were all as if a bit more scuffed and worn. It seemed as if the finances themselves were not in an enviable state. But the expression of his face, the decency, the manners had remained the same. He had even become as if still more agreeable in his movements and ways, still more deftly tucked his feet under when sitting in an armchair. There was still more softness in the enunciation of his speech, more prudent moderation in his words and expressions, more skill in his comportment, and more tact in everything. Whiter and cleaner than snow were his collar and shirt front, and though he had only just come from the road, there was not a bit of fluff on his tailcoat, fit even for a party. His cheeks and chin were so clean-shaven that only a blind man could fail to admire their pleasant prominence and roundness. In the house a transformation took place. Half of it, hitherto abiding in blindness, with nailed shutters, suddenly recovered its sight and lit up. Luggage began to be carried in from the Britska. Everything began to settle itself in the lighted rooms and soon it all acquired the following look. The room that was to be the bedroom accommodated the things necessary for the evening toilet. The room that was to be the study. But first of all, it should be known that there were three tables in this room. One a writing table in front of the sofa, the second a card table between the windows by the wall, the third a corner table in the corner between the door to the bedroom and the door to a large, uninhabited room filled with disabled furniture. This corner table accommodated the clothing taken from the trunk, namely, trousers to go with a tailcoat, trousers to go with a frock coat, gray trousers, two velvet waistcoats and two of satin, a frock coat, and two tailcoats. The white peak waistcoats and summer trousers joined the linen in the chest of drawers. All of this was stacked up in a little pyramid and covered with a silk handkerchief. In another corner, between the door and the window, boots were lined up side by side. Boots that were not quite new. Boots that were quite new, boots with new uppers, and patent leather shoes. These, too, were modestly curtained off by a silk handkerchief, as if they were not there. On the table between the two windows the little chest found a place for itself. On the writing table in front of the sofa, a briefcase, a bottle of eau de cologne, sealing wax, toothbrushes, a new calendar, and a couple of novels, both second volumes. The clean linen was put into a chest of drawers that was already in the room. 
The linen that was to go to the washerwoman was tied in a bundle and shoved under the bed. The trunk, once it was unpacked, was also shoved under the bed. The sword, too, found its place in the bedroom, hanging on a nail not far from the bed. Both rooms acquired a look of extraordinary cleanness and neatness. Not a scrap, not a speck, not a bit of litter. The very air became somehow ennobled. In it there was established the pleasant smell of a healthy, fresh man, who does not wear his linen long, goes to the bathhouse, and wipes himself with a wet sponge on Sundays. In a vestibule, the smell of the servant Petrushka first presumed to establish itself, but Petrushka was promptly relocated to the kitchen where he belonged. For the first few days Andrei Ivanovich feared for his independence, lest his guest somehow bind him and hinder him with some changes in his way of life and the order of his day, so happily established, be violated. But his fears were in vain. Our Pavel Ivanovich showed an extraordinary flexibility in adapting to everything. He approved of the philosophical unhurriedness of his host, saying that it promised a hundred-year life. About solitude he expressed himself rather felicitously, namely, that it nursed great thoughts in a man. Having looked at the library and spoken with great praise of books in general, he observed that they save a man from idleness. In short, he let fall few words, but significant. In his actions, he acted still more appropriately. He came on time, and he left on time. He did not embarrass his host with questions during the hours of his taciturnity. With pleasure he would play chess with him, with pleasure he would be silent. While the one was sending up curly clouds of pipe smoke, the other, not a pipe smoker, nevertheless invented a corresponding activity. He would, for instance, take from his pocket a silver niello snuff box and, placing it between two fingers of his left hand, Spin it quickly with a finger of the right, just as the earthly sphere spins on its axis, or else he would simply drum on the snuff box with his fingers, whistling some tune or other. In short, he did not hinder his host in any way. For the first time I see a man one can get along with, Tintetnikov said to himself. Generally we lack this art. There are plenty of people among us who are intelligent, and educated and kind, but people who are constantly agreeable, people of a constantly even temper, people with whom one can live for ages without quarreling. I don't know that we can find many such people. Here is the first, the only man I've seen. Such was Tintetnikov's opinion of his guest. Chichikov, for his part, was very glad to have settled for a while with such a peaceful and placid host. He was sick of the gypsy life. To have a bit of rest, at least for a month, on a wonderful estate, in view of the fields and the approaching spring, was useful even in the hemorrhoidal respect. It would have been hard to find a more reposeful little corner. Spring adorned it with an unutterable beauty. What brightness of green! What freshness of air! What bird calls in the garden! Paradise, mirth, and exultant rejoicing in everything! The countryside resounded and sang as if newborn. Chichikov walked a lot. Sometimes he directed his steps over the flat top of the heights, with a view of the valleys spreading out below, where flooding rivers left big lakes everywhere. Or else he would go into the ravines, where the trees, barely beginning to be adorned with leaves, were laden with birds' nests, and be deafened by the cawing of crows, the chatter of jackdaws, and the croaking of rooks that darkened the sky with their crisscross flight, or else he went down to the water meadows and burst dams, to watch the water rush with a deafening noise and fall upon the wheels of a mill, or else he made his way further to the pier from which, borne along by the current, the first boats rushed, laden with peas, oats, barley, and wheat. 
where he set out for the first spring work in the fields, to watch the freshly plowed furrow cutting a black stripe through the green, or the deft sower casting handfuls of seed evenly, accurately, not letting a single seed fall to one side or the other. He had discussions with the steward, the mujiks, the miller, talking of what and of how, and of whether the harvest would be good, and how the plowing was going, and how much grain they sell, and what they charged for grinding flour in the spring and fall, and what was the name of each mujik, and who was related to whom, and where he had bought his cow, and what he fed his sow on, in short, everything. He also found out how many mujiks had died. Not many, it turned out. Being an intelligent man, he noticed at once that Andre Ivanovich's estate was not in good shape. Everywhere there was negligence, carelessness, theft, and not a little drunkenness. And mentally he said to himself, What a brute Tintetnikov is, though. To so neglect an estate that could bring in at least 50,000 a year. And, unable to restrain his righteous indignation, he kept repeating, decidedly a brute. More than once in the middle of these walks the thought occurred to him of himself becoming someday. That is, of course, not now but later on, when the main business was taken care of, and the means were in hand of himself becoming the peaceful owner of such an estate. Here he usually pictured a young mistress, a fresh, fair-skinned wench, perhaps even of merchant class, though nonetheless educated and brought up like a gentlewoman, so that she also understood music, for, while music is, of course, not the main thing, still, since that is the custom, why go against the general opinion? He also pictured the younger generation that was to perpetuate the name of the Chichikovs, a frolicsome lad and a beautiful daughter, or even two boys, two or even three girls, so that everyone would know that he had indeed lived and existed, and had not merely passed over the earth like some shadow or ghost, so that there would be no shame before the fatherland. He even pictured that a certain addition to his rank would not be amiss. State counselor, for instance, is a venerable and respectable rank, and much came into his head of the sort that so often takes a man away from the dull present moment, frets him, teases him, stirs him, and gives him pleasure even when he himself is sure that it will never come true. Pavel Ivanovich's servants also liked the estate. Like him, they made themselves at home there. Petrushka very soon made friends with the butler Grigory, though at first they both put on airs and blustered before each other insufferably. Petrushka threw dust in Grigory's eyes by saying that he had been in Kostroma, Yaroslavl, Nizhny Novgorod, and even Moscow. Grigory immediately pulled him up short with Petersburg, where Petrushka had never been. The latter tried to rise and get his own back with the considerable remoteness of the places he had been. But Grigory named a place for him, such as could not be found on any map, and reckoned it was over 20,000 miles away, so that Petrushka stood like an owl, gaping, and was immediately laughed at by all the servants. However, matters ended between them in the closest friendship. Bald Uncle Peeman kept a well-known pothouse at the end of the village, called Akulka. In this establishment they could be seen at all hours of the day. There they became fast friends, or what is known among the people as pothouse fixtures. Cellophon took a different sort of bait. Every evening in the village songs were sung and spring round dances twined and untwined. Trim, well-built winches, such as can hardly be found elsewhere, made him stand gawking for several hours. It was hard to say which one was better. They were all white-bosomed, white-necked, all with eyes like turnips, languishing, strutting like peacocks, with braids down to their waists. When, holding white hands in his own, 
he slowly moved in a circle with them, or came towards them in a wall with the other lads, while the hotly glowing evening died out, and the surrounding neighborhood slowly faded, and from away across the river came the F. Faithful echo of an inevitably sad tune. He did not know himself what was happening to him. Long afterwards, in sleep or in waking, at dawn and at dusk, he kept imagining his hands holding those white hands and moving with them in a round dance. With a wave of the hand he would say, Cursed winches, Chichikov's horses also like their new abode. The shaft horse and the chestnut outrunner called a cesser, and that same dapple gray which Selifan referred to as a scoundrel of a horse, found their stay at Tentetnikov's far from dull, the oats of excellent quality, and the layout of the stables uncommonly convenient. Each stable was partitioned off, yet over the partitions one could see the other horses, so that if any of them, even the furthest off, suddenly got a notion to start whinnying, it was possible to respond in kind straight away. In short, everyone settled as if into their own home. The reader may be astonished that Chichikov had so far not made a peep about the notorious souls. Perish the thought. Pavel Ivanovich had become very cautious with regard to the subject. Even if he had been dealing with perfect fools, he would not have started suddenly on it. And Tintetnikov, after all, reads books, philosophizes, tries to explain to himself the various reasons for everything. Why and how? No. Devil take him. Maybe I should start from the other end. So thought Chichikov. Chatting frequently with the servants, he found out from them, among other things, that the master once used to visit his neighbor the general quite often, that there was a young miss at the general's, that the master had been sweet on the young miss, and the young miss on the master, too, but then suddenly they had a falling out over something and parted. He himself noticed that Andre Ivanovich kept drawing some sort of heads with pencil or pen, all looking the same. Once, after dinner, spinning the silver snuff box on its axis with his finger, as usual, he spoke thus. You have everything, Andrei Ivanovich. Only one thing is missing. What is that? The other responded, letting out curls of smoke. A life's companion, said Chichikov. No reply came from Andrei Ivanovich. And with that the conversation ended. Chichikov was not embarrassed. He chose another moment, this time just before supper, and while talking about one thing and another, said suddenly, but really, Andre Ivanovich, it wouldn't do you any harm to get married. Not a word of reply came from Tintetnikov, as if the very mention of the subject was disagreeable to him. Chichikov was not embarrassed. For the third time he chose a moment, this time after supper, and spoke thus, but all the same. Whichever way I turn your circumstances, I see that you must get married. You'll fall into hypochondria. Whether it was that Chichikov's words this time were so convincing, or that Andrei Ivanovich's mood was somehow especially inclined to frankness, he sighed and said, sending up smoke from his pipe. For all things one needs to be born lucky, Pavel Ivanovich. And he told everything as it had been, the whole story of his acquaintance with the general and its breakup. As Chichikov listened, word by word, to the whole affair and saw that because of one word such an incident had occurred, he was dumbfounded. For several minutes, he looked intently into Tentetnikov's eyes and concluded, Why? He's simply a perfect fool, Andrei Ivanovich, for pity's sake, he said, taking both his hands. Where's the insult? What's insulting in one familiar word? There's nothing insulting in the word itself, said Tintetnikov, but the sense of the word, the voice in which it was uttered, that's where the insult lies. The word means, remember your trash. 
I receive you only because there's no one better. But if some princess Uzziakin comes, you know your place, you stand by the door. That's what it means. As he said this, the placid and meek Andre Ivanovich flashed his eyes, and in his voice the irritation of offended feelings could be heard. But even if that is the sense of it, what matter? said Chichikov. What? said Tentetnikov, looking intently into Chichikov's eyes. You want me to continue visiting him after such an action? But what sort of action is that? It's not an action at all, said Chichikov. What a strange man this Chichikov is, Tentetnikov thought to himself. What a strange man this Tentetnikov is, Chichikov thought to himself. It's not an action, Andrei Ivanovich. It's simply a general's habit. They call everyone boy. And, incidentally, why not allow it in a venerable, respectable man? That's another matter, said Tentetnikov. If he were an old man, a poor man, not proud, not conceited, not a general, I would allow him to address me that way, and even take it respectfully. He's an utter fool, Chichikov thought to himself. To allow it to a ragamuffin, and not to a general and, following this reflection, he objected to him aloud. Thus, very well, suppose he did insult you. But you also got even with him. He you, and you him. But to part forever on account of a trifle, for pity's sake, that's beyond anything. Why abandon an affair that's just begun? Once the goal has been chosen, one must push one's way through. No point in looking at a man who spits. Men are always spitting. You won't find anyone in the whole world who doesn't spit. Tentetnikov was completely taken aback by these words. Dumbfounded, he stared into Pavel Ivanovich's eyes, thinking to himself, a most strange man though, this Chichikov. What an odd duck, though, this Tentetnikov. Chichikov thought meanwhile. Allow me to do something about this matter, he said aloud. I could go to His Excellency and explain that on your part it occurred owing to misunderstanding, youth, and ignorance of men and the world. I have no intention of groveling before him, Tentetnikov said strongly. God forbid you should grovel, said Chichikov, crossing himself, to influence with a word of admonition, like a sensible mediator, yes, but to grovel. Excuse me. Andrei Ivanovich, for my good will and devotion. I never expected that you would take my words in such an offensive sense. Forgive me. Pavel Ivanovich, I am to blame. Tentetnikov said, touched, and seizing both his hands in gratitude. Your kind sympathy is precious to me, I swear. But let's drop this conversation. Let's never speak of it again. In that case, I'll simply go to the general without any reason, said Chichikov. What for? asked Tentetnikov, looking at Chichikov in bewilderment. To pay my respects, said Chichikov. What a strange man this Chichikov is, thought Tentetnikov. What a strange man this Tentetnikov is, thought Chichikov. Since my Britska, said Chichikov, has not yet attained the proper condition, Allow me to take your coach. I'll go and visit him tomorrow at around ten o'clock or so. Good gracious, what a request. You are full master. Choose any carriage you like. Everything's at your disposal. They said good night and went to bed, not without reflecting on each other's strangeness. An odd thing, however. The next day, when Chichikov's horses were ready, and he leaped into the carriage with the ease of an almost military man, dressed in a new tailcoat, a white tie and waistcoat, and drove off to pay his respects to the general. Tentetnikov felt an agitation in his soul, such as he had not experienced for a long time. All the rusty and drowsy course of his thoughts turned into an actively troubled one. A nervous excitement came over all the feelings of the sloth 
who hitherto had been sunk in careless indolence. Now he sat down on the sofa. Now he went to the window. Now he would take up a book. Now he wanted to think. Feudal wanting. Thought refused to come into his head. Now he attempted not to think about anything. Feudal attempt. Scraps of something resembling thoughts. Odds and ends of thoughts. Kept creeping and pecking into his head from everywhere. A strange state he said and moved to the window to gaze at the road cutting through the grove, at the end of which the clouds of dust raised by the departing carriage had not yet had time to settle. But let us leave Tintetnikov and follow Chichikov. Chapter 2 In a little over half an hour, the horses carried Chichikov across the six-mile space, first through the grove, then through wheat fields already beginning to green amid the freshly plowed earth, then over the skirts of the hills, from which views of the distance opened every M. Anut, and along a wide avenue of spreading lindens leading to the general's estate. The avenue of lindens turned into an avenue of poplars, fenced at the base with wicker boxes, and ran up to wrought iron gates through which appeared the splendidly ornate carved facade of the general's house, resting on eight columns with Corinthian capitals. Everywhere there was a smell of oil paint, with which everything was renewed, allowing nothing to get old. The yard was as clean as parquet. Having rolled up to the front entrance, Chichikov respectfully jumped off onto the porch, asked to be announced, and was introduced directly into the general's study. The general struck him with his majestic appearance. He was, at that moment, dressed in a raspberry satin dressing gown. An open look, a manly face, grizzled side whiskers and a big mustache, hair cut short and even shaved at the nape, a thick, broad neck, in three stories, as they say, or three folds with a crease across the middle, the voice a bass with some huskiness, the movements those of a general. Like all of us sinners, General Betrushev was endowed with many virtues and many defects. Both the one and the other were scattered through him in a sort of picturesque disorder. Self-sacrifice, magnanimity in decisive moments, courage, intelligence, and with all that, a generous mixture of self-love, ambition, vanity, petty personal ticklishness, and a good many of those things which a man simply cannot do without. He disliked all those who got ahead of him in the service, spoke of them caustically, in pointed, sardonic epigrams. Most of it hit at a former colleague, whom he considered his inferior in intelligence and abilities, but who had nevertheless outstripped him and was already the governor-general of two provinces and, as if by design, of the very ones in which his own estates were located, so that he found himself as if dependent on him. In revenge, he derided him at every opportunity, criticized his every directive, and looked upon all his measures and actions as the height of folly. Despite his good heart, the general was given to mockery. Broadly speaking, he liked being first, liked incense, liked to shine and display his intelligence, liked knowing things that others did not know, and did not like those who knew something he did not know. Brought up with a half-foreign upbringing, he wanted at the same time to play the role of a Russian squire. With such unevenness of character, with such big, striking contrasts, he was inevitably bound to meet with a heap of troubles in the service, as a result of which he took his retirement, accusing some enemy party of everything and not having enough magnanimity to blame himself for any of it. In retirement he preserved the same picturesque, majestic bearing. In a frock coat, a tailcoat, or a dressing gown, he was the same. From his voice to his least gesture, everything in him was imperious, commanding, inspiring, if not respect, 
then at least timidity in the lower ranks. Chichikov felt both the one and the other, both respect and timidity. Inclining his head respectfully to one side, he began thus, I felt it my duty to introduce myself to your excellency, nursing the greatest respect for the men of valor who have saved the fatherland on the field of battle. I felt it my duty to introduce myself personally to your excellency. The general obviously did not dislike this sort of assault. With a rather gracious motion of his head, he said, Very glad to meet you. Pray be seated. Where did you serve? My career in the service, said Chichikov, sitting down not in the center of the armchair, but obliquely, and grasping the armrest with his hand, began in the treasury department, your excellency, in the further course of same was PERS. You'd in various places. I was in the civil courts, on a building commission, and in customs. My life may be likened to a ship amidst the waves, your excellency. I grew up, one might say, on patience, nursed by patience, swaddled by patience, and am myself, so to speak, nothing but patience. And how much I have suffered from enemies no words or colors can tell. And now, in the evening, so to speak, of my life. I am searching for a little corner in which to pass the rest of my days. And I am staying meanwhile with a near neighbor of your excellencies. Who is that? Tintetnikov, your excellency. The general winced. He greatly regrets, your excellency, his not having paid due respect. To what? To your excellency's merits. Words fail him. He says, if only I could somehow. Because really, he says, I know how to value the men who have saved the fatherland, he says. Good gracious, what's the matter with him? Why, I'm not angry, the softened general said. In my heart, I sincerely loved him, and I'm sure that in time he will become a most useful man. Quite correctly put, your excellency, if you please, a most useful man with a gift for eloquence, and wielding a skillful pen. But he writes trifles, I suppose, some sort of verses, no, your excellency, not trifles, what, then, he writes, history, your excellency, history, the history of what, the history, here Chichikov paused, and either because there was a general sitting before him, or simply to give more importance to the subject, added, the history of generals, your excellency. How of generals? Of what generals? Of generals in general, your excellency. Overall, that is, as a matter of fact, the generals of the fatherland, Chichikov said, and thought to himself, what drivel I'm pouring out, excuse me, I don't quite understand. Would that mean a history of some period or separate biographies? And is it all of them? Or only those who took part in the year 12? That's right, your excellency. Those who took part in the year 12. Having said which, he thought to himself. Strike me dead if I understand. But why doesn't he come to me then? I could gather quite a bit of curious material for him. He doesn't dare, your excellency. What nonsense. Because of some trifling word. But I'm not that sort of man at all. I might even be ready to call on him myself. He wouldn't allow that. He'll come to you, Chichikov said, and at the same time thought to himself. The generals came in nicely, and yet my tongue just stupidly blurted it out. A rustling was heard in the study. The walnut door of a carved wardrobe opened by itself. On the other side of the open door, her wonderful hand grasping the door handle, a live little figure appeared. If a transparent painting, lit from behind, were suddenly to shine in a dark room, it would not be so striking as this little figure radiant with life, appearing as if in order to light up the room. It seemed as though along with her a ray of sunlight flew into the room, suddenly illumining its ceiling, its moldings, 
and its dark corners. She seemed to be of glorious height. This was an illusion. It came from her extraordinary slenderness and the harmonious relation of all the parts of her body, from head to little toe. The solid color dress that was thrown on her was thrown on with such taste that it seemed as if all the seamstresses of the capital had held a council among themselves on how best to adorn her. But it only seemed so. She made her own dresses, haphazardly, gathered an uncut piece of fabric in two or three places, and it clung and arranged itself around her in such folds as a sculptor could at once transfer to marble. And the young ladies who dressed fashionably all looked like some sort of motley hens beside her. Though her face was almost familiar to Chichikov from Andrei Ivanovich's drawings, he looked at her as if stunned, and only later, having come to his senses, did he notice that she lacked something very essential, namely, plumpness. Allow me to introduce my naughty little girl, said the general, addressing Chichikov. However, I still don't know your name. Though why should people know the name of a man not distinguished by deeds of valor, said Chichikov. Still, however, one must know, Pavel Ivanovich, your excellency, said Chichikov, inclining his head slightly to one side. Yulinka, Pavel Ivanovich has just told me the most interesting news. Our neighbor Tentetnikov is not at all as stupid a man as we thought. He's occupied with something rather important, the history of the generals of the year 12. Yulinka suddenly seemed to flush and became animated. But who thought he was a stupid man? She said quickly. Maybe only Vishnapokromov could think that, whom you believe, Papa, though he's both empty and mean. Why mean? He's a bit empty, it's true, said the general. He's a bit base and a bit vile. Not just a bit empty. Yulinka picked up promptly. Whoever offends his own brothers like that, and throws his sister out of the house, is a vile man. But that's just talk. There wouldn't be talk for no reason. You, father, have the kindliest soul and a rare heart. But the way you act could make people think quite otherwise about you. You'll receive a man who you yourself know is bad, only because he's a fancy talker and an expert at twining himself around you. But, dear heart, I couldn't really throw him out, said the general. Don't throw him out then, but don't love him either. Not so, your excellency, Chichikov said to Yulinka, inclining his head slightly, with a pleasant smile. According to Christianity, it's precisely them that we ought to love. And, straight away turning to the general, he said with a smile, this time a somewhat coy one. If you please, your excellency, have you ever heard it said, in this regard, love us black? Anyone can love us white? No, I haven't. It's a most singular anecdote, said Chichikov, with a coy smile. There was, your excellency, on the estate of Prince Gokzovsky, whom your excellency is no doubt pleased to know, I don't. There was a steward, your excellency, of German stock, a young man. He had to go to town for supplying recruits and on other occasions, and of course, to grease the palms of the court clerks. Here Chichikov, narrowing one eye, showed with his face how court clerks' palms are greased. However, they also liked him and used to wine and dine him. So once, at dinner with them, he said, You know, gentlemen, one day you must also visit me on the prince's estate. They said, we will. Soon after that the court happened to go to investigate a case that occurred on the domains of Count Trekmetiev, whom your excellency is no doubt also pleased to know. I don't. They made no investigation properly speaking, but the whole court turned off at the steward's place to visit the count's old steward, and for three days and nights they played cards non-stop. The samovar and punch, Naturally, never left the table. The old man got sick of them. 
In order to get rid of them somehow, he says, why don't you gentlemen go and visit the prince's steward, the German? He's not far from here, and he's expecting you. Why not? In fact, they say, and half drunk, unshaven and sleepy, just as they were, they got into their carts and went to the German, and the German, be it known to your excellency, had just gotten married at that time. He married a boarding school girl, a genteel young thing. Chichikov expressed genteelness with his face. The two of them are sitting over their tea, not suspecting anything, when suddenly the doors open and the throng barges in. I can imagine. A pretty sight, the general said, laughing. The steward was simply dumbfounded. What can I do for you, he says. Ah, they said, so that's how you are. And all at once, with these words, there is a change of looks and physiognomies. To business. How much liquor is distilled on the premises? Show us the books. The man hymns and haws. Hey. Witnesses, they took him, bound him, dragged him to town, and the German actually spent a year and a half in jail. Well, now said the general. Yulinka clasped her hands. The wife went around soliciting, Chichikov continued. But what can a young, inexperienced woman do? Luckily there happened to be some good people who advised her to settle peaceably. He got off with two thousand and dinner for all. And at the dinner, when they all got quite merry, and he as well, they said to him, Aren't you ashamed to have treated us the way you did? You'd like to see us always neat and shaven and in tailcoats. No, you must love us black. Anyone can love us white. The general burst out laughing. Yulinka groaned painfully. I don't understand how you can laugh, Papa, she said quickly. Wrath darkened her beautiful brow. A most dishonorable act. For which I don't know where they all ought to be sent. My dear. I'm not justifying them in the least, said the general, but what can I do if it's so funny? How did it go? Love us white. Black, your excellency, Chichikov picked up. Love us black. Anyone can love us white. Ha, 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 and the general's body began to heave with laughter. Those shoulders that had once borne thick epaulets were shaking as if even now they bore thick epaulets. Chichikov also delivered himself of an interjection of laughter. But, out of respect for the general, he launched it with the letter E. He, 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 and his body, too, began to heave with laughter, though his shoulders did not shake having never borne thick epaulets. I can picture what a sight that unshaven court was, the general said, still laughing. Yes, your excellency, in any event it was, non-stop, a three-day vigil, the same as fasting. They wasted away, simply wasted away, said Chichikov, still laughing. Yulinka sank into an armchair and covered her beautiful eyes with her hand. As if vexed that there was no one to share her indignation, she said, I don't know. It's just that I'm so vexed. Indeed, of extraordinarily strange contrast were the feelings born in the hearts of the three conversing people. One found amusing the awkward ineptitude of the German. Another found amusing the amusing way the crooks wriggled out of it. The third was saddened that an unjust act had been committed with impunity. There only lacked a fourth to ponder precisely such words as could produce laughter in one and sadness in another. What does it mean, however, that even in his fall, the perishing dirty man demands to be loved? Is it an animal instinct? Or the faint cry of the soul smothered under the heavy burden of base passions? still trying to break through the hardening crust of abominations, still crying, Save me, brother! There lacked a fourth for whom the most painful thing of all would be his brother's perishing soul. I don't know, Yulinka said, 
taking her hand away from her face. It's that I'm just so vexed. Only please don't be angry with us, said the general. We're not to blame for anything. Give me a kiss and go to your room, because I'll be dressing for dinner now. You, my boy, the general said, suddenly turning to Chichikov, will be dining with me, if your excellency, no ceremonies, there's cabbage soup. Chichikov inclined his head agreeably, and when he raised it again, he no longer saw Yulinka. She had vanished. Instead of her there stood, in bushy mustache and side whiskers, a giant of a valet, with a silver pitcher and basin in his hands. You'll allow me to dress in your presence, eh? My boy, said the general, throwing off his dressing gown and rolling up the sleeves of his shirt on his mighty arms. Good gracious, not only to dress, you may do anything your excellency pleases in my presence, said Chichikov. The general began to wash, splashing and snorting like a duck. Soapy water flew in all directions. How did it go? He said, wiping his fat neck on all sides. Love us white. Black, your excellency. Love us black. Anyone can love us white. Very, very good. Chichikov was in extraordinarily high spirits. He felt some sort of inspiration. Your Excellency, he said. What? said the General. There's another story. What sort? Also an amusing story, only I don't find it amusing. Even if Your Excellency, how so? Here's how, Your Excellency. At this point Chichikov looked around and, seeing that the valet with the basin had left, began thus. I have an uncle, a decrepit old man. He owns three hundred souls and has no heirs except me. He himself, being decrepit, cannot manage the estate, yet he won't hand it over to me. And he gives such a strange reason. I don't know my nephew, he says, maybe he's a spinthrift. Let him first prove to me that he's a reliable man. Let him first acquire three hundred souls himself. Then I'll give him my three hundred souls as well. What a fool! Quite a correct observation. If you please, your excellency. But imagine my position now. Here Chichikov, lowering his voice, began speaking as if in secret. He has a housekeeper in his house, your excellency, and she has children. Just you watch, everything will go to them. The stupid old man's gone dotty. That's all, said the general. Only I don't see how I can be of use to you. Here's what I've thought up. Right now, before the new census lists have been turned in, the owners of big estates may have, along with their living souls, also some that are departed and dead, so that if, for instance, your excellency were to hand them over to me as if they were alive, with a deed of purchase, I could then present this deed to the old man, and he, dodge as he may, will have to give me my inheritance. Here the general burst into such laughter as hardly a man has ever laughed. He collapsed just as he was into his armchair. He threw his head back and nearly choked. The whole house became alarmed. The valet appeared. The daughter came running in, frightened. Papa, what's happened to you? Nothing, my dear. Ha! Ha, ha. Go to your room. We'll come to dinner presently. Ha, ha, ha. And, having run out of breath several times, the general's guffaw would burst out with renewed force, ringing throughout the general's high-ceilinged, resonant apartments from the front hall to the last room. Chichikov waited worriedly for this extraordinary laughter to end. Well, brother, excuse me. The devil himself got you to pull such a trick. Ha, ha, ha. To give the old man a treat. To slip him the dead ones. Ha, 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 ha. And the uncle, the uncle. Made such a fool of. Ha, 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 ha. Chichikov's position was embarrassing. 
The valet was standing right there with gaping mouth and popping eyes. Your Excellency, it was tears that thought up this laughter, he said. Excuse me, brother. No, it's killing. But I'd give five hundred thousand just to see your uncle as you present him with the deed for the dead souls. And what? Is he so old? What's his age? Eighty, your excellency. But this is in the closet, eyed, so that Chichikov gave a meaning look into the general's face, and at the same time a sidelong glance at the valet. Off with you, my lad. Come back later, the general said to the valet. The mustachio withdrew. Yes, your excellency, this, your excellency, is such a matter that I'd prefer to keep it a secret. Of course, I understand very well. What a foolish old man. To come up with such foolishness at the age of eighty. And what, how does he look? Is he hale? Still on his feet, yes, but with difficulty. What a fool. And he's got his teeth, only two, your excellency. What an ass. Don't be angry, brother. He's an ass, correct, your excellency. Though he's my relative, and it's hard to admit it, he is indeed an ass. And, however, as the reader can guess for himself, it was not hard for Chichikov to admit it, the less so since it is unlikely he ever had any uncle. So if you would be so good, your excellency, as to, as to give you the dead souls? But for such an invention, I'll give them to you with land, with lodgings. Take the whole cemetery. Ha 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 ha. The old man. Oh, the old man. Ha 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 ha. Made such a fool of. Ha ha. Ha ha. And the general's laughter again went echoing all through the general's apartments. The end of the chapter is missing. In the first edition of the second volume of Dead Souls, 1855, there was a note. Here omitted is the reconciliation of Betrushev and Tentetnikov. The dinner at the generals and their conversation about the year 12. The betrothal of Yulinka and Tentetnikov. Her prayer and lament on her mother's grave. The conversation of the betrothed couple in the garden. Chichikov sets out at General Betrushev's request, to call on his relatives and to inform them of his daughter's betrothal, and he goes to see one of these relations, Colonel Koshkarev. Trans. Chapter 3. No. Not like that, Chichikov was saying as he found himself again in the midst of the open fields and spaces. I wouldn't handle it like that. As soon as, God willing, I finish it all happily and indeed become a well-to-do, prosperous man. I'll behave quite differently. I'll have a cook and a house full of plenty, but the managerial side will also be in order. The ends will meet, and a little sum will be set aside each year for posterity. If only God grants my wife fruitfulness. Hey, you Tom fool. Selifan and Petrushka both looked back from the box. Where are you going, just as you were pleased to order, Pavel Ivanovich, to Colonel Koshkarev's, said Selifan. And you asked the way, if you please, Pavel Ivanovich, since I was pottering with the carriage, I saw only the general stable boy. But Petrushka asked the coachman, what a fool. I told you not to rely on Petrushka, Petrushka's a log. It takes no sort of wisdom said Petrushka, with a sidelong glance. Excepting as you go down the hill you should keep straight on. There's nothing more to it. And I suppose you never touched a drop, excepting the home brew? I suppose you got yourself well-oiled? Seeing what turn the conversation was taking, Petrushka merely set his nose awry. He was about to say that he had not even begun, but then he felt somehow ashamed. It's nice riding in a coach, sir, Selifan said, turning around. What? I say, Pavel Ivanovich, that it's nice for your honor to be riding in a coach, sir, better than a Britska, sir, less bouncy. Drive, drive. 
No one's asking your opinion. Cellophane gave the horse's steep flanks a light flick of the whip and addressed himself to Petrushka. Master Koshkarev, I hear tell, has got his muzhiks dressed up like Germans. You can't figure out from far off. He walks crane-like, same as a German. And the women don't wear kerchiefs on their heads, pie-shaped, like they do sometimes, or headbands either. But this sort of German bonnet, what German women wear, you know, a bonnet, a bonnet, it's called, you know, a bonnet. A German sort of bonnet. What if they got you up like a German, and in a bonnet, Petrushka said, sharpening his wit on cellophane and grinning. But what a mug resulted from this grin. It had no semblance of a grin, but was as if a man with a cold in his nose was trying to sneeze but did not sneeze, and simply remained in the position of a man about to sneeze. Chichikov peered into his mug from below, wishing to know what was going on there, and said, A fine one! And he still fancies he's a handsome fellow. It must be said that Pavel Ivanovich was seriously convinced that Petrushka was in love with his own beauty, whereas the latter even forgot at times whether he had any mug at all. What a nice idea it would be, Pavel Ivanovich, said Selifan, turning around on his box, to ask Andrei Ivanovich for another horse in exchange for the dapple gray. He wouldn't refuse, being of friendly disposition towards you, and this horse, sir, is a scoundrel of a horse and a real hindrance. Drive, drive, don't babble, Chichikov said, and thought to himself. In fact, it's too bad it never occurred to me. The light-wheeled coach meanwhile went lightly wheeling along. Lightly it went uphill, though the road was occasionally uneven. Lightly it also went downhill, though the descents of country roads are worrisome. They descended the hill. The road went through meadows, across the bends of the river, past the mills. Far away flashed sands, Aspen groves emerged picturesquely one from behind the other. Willow bushes, slender alders, and silvery poplars flew quickly past them, their branches striking cellophane and Petrushka as they sat on their box. The latter had his peaked cap knocked off every moment. The stern servitor would jump down from the box, scold the stupid tree and the owner who had planted it, but never thought of tying the cap on, or at least of holding it with his hand, still hoping that maybe it would not happen again. Then the trees became thicker. Aspens and alders were joined by birches, and soon a forest thicket formed around them. The light of the sun disappeared. Pines and firs darkled. The impenetrable gloom of the endless forest became denser, and it seemed was preparing to turn into night. And suddenly among the trees, light, here and there among the branches and trunks, like a mirror or like quicksilver, the forest began to brighten, trees became sparser, shouts were heard, and suddenly before them was a lake, a watery plain about three miles across, with trees around it and cottages behind them. Some twenty men, up to their waists, shoulders, or chins in water, were pulling a dragnet towards the opposite shore. In the midst of them, swimming briskly, shouting, fussing enough for all of them, was a man nearly as tall as he was fat, round all around, just like a watermelon. Owing to his fatness he might not possibly drown, and if he wanted to dive, he could flip over all he liked but the water would keep buoying him up, and if two more men had sat on his back, he would have gone on floating with them like a stubborn bubble on the surface of the water, only groaning slightly under the weight and blowing bubbles from his nose and mouth. That one, Pavel Ivanovich, said Selifan, turning around on the box, must be the master, Colonel Koshkarev. Why so? Because his body, if you'll be pleased to notice, is a bit wider than the others, and he's respectably portly, as a master should be. The shouts meanwhile were getting more distinct. 
The squire watermelon was shouting in a ringing patter. Hand it over, Dennis. Hand it over to Kozma. Kozma, take the tail from Dennis. You, big Foma, push there along with little Foma. Go around to the right, the right. Stop, stop. Devil take you both. You've got me tangled in the net. You've caught me, I tell you. Damn it. You've caught me by the navel. The draggers on the right flank stopped, seeing that an unforeseen mishap had indeed occurred. The master was caught in the net. Just look, Selifan said to Petrushka, they've dragged in the master like a fish. The squire floundered and, wishing to disentangle himself, turned over on his back, belly up, getting still more tangled in the net. Fearful of tearing it, he was floating together with the caught fish, only ordering them to tie a rope around him. When they had tied a rope around him, they threw the end to shore. Some twenty fishermen standing on the shore picked it up and began carefully to haul him in. On reaching a shallow spot, the squire stood up, all covered with the meshes of the net. Like a lady's hand in a net glove in summer, looked up, and saw the visitor driving onto the dam in his coach. Seeing the visitor, he nodded to him. Chichikov took off his cap and bowed courteously from his coach. Had dinner, shouted the squire, climbing onto the shore with the caught fish, holding one hand over his eyes to shield them from the sun, and the other lower down in the manner of the Medici Venus, stepping from her bath. No, said Chichikov. Well, then you can thank God. Why? Chichikov asked curiously, holding his cap up over his head. Here's why, said the squire, winding up on shore with the carp and bream thrashing around his feet, leaping a yard high off the ground. This is nothing, don't look at this. That's the real thing over there. Show us the sturgeon, big foma. Two stalwart mujiks dragged some sort of monster from a tub. What a princeling. Strayed in from the river. No, that's a full prince, said Chichikov. You said it. Go on ahead now, and I'll follow. You there, coachman, take the lower road, through the kitchen garden. Run. Little Foma, you dolt, and take the barrier down. I'll follow in no time before you. The colonel's an odd bird, thought Chichikov, finally getting across the endless dam and driving up to the cottages, of which some, like a flock of ducks, were scattered over the slope of a hill, while others stood below on pilings, like herons. Nets, sweep nets, drag nets were hanging everywhere. Little Foma took down the barrier, the coach drove through the kitchen garden and came out on a square near an antiquated wooden church. Behind the church, the roofs of the manor buildings could be seen farther off. And here I am. A voice came from the side. Chichikov looked around. The squire was already driving along next to him, clothed in a droshky, grass-green nankeen frock coat, yellow trousers, and a neck without a tie. After the manner of a cupid, he was sitting sideways on the droshky, taking up the whole droshky with himself. Chichikov was about to say something to him, but the fat man had already vanished. The droshky appeared on the other side, and all that was heard was a voice. Take the pike and seven carp to that dolt of a cook, and fetch the sturgeon here. I'll take him myself in the droshky. Again came voices, big foma and little foma. Kozma and Dennis, and when he drove up to the porch of the house, to his greatest amazement, the fat squire was already standing there and received him into his embrace. How he had managed to fly there was inconceivable. They kissed each other three times crisscross. I bring you greetings from His Excellency, said Chichikov. Which Excellency, your relative, General Alexander Dmitrievich? Who is Alexander Dmitrievich, General Betrushev? Chichikov replied in some amazement. 
Don't know him, sir. Never met him. Chichikov was still more amazed. How's that? I hope I at least have the pleasure of speaking with Colonel Koshkarev. Pyotr Petrovich Patuk. Patuk Pyotr Petrovich. When the host picked up, D Chichikov was dumbfounded. There you have it. How now? You fools, he said, turning to Selifin and Petrushka, who both gaped, goggle-eyed, one sitting on his box, the other standing by the door of the coach. How now? You fools. Weren't you told? To Colonel Koshkarev's? And this is Pyotr Petrovich Patuk. The lads did excellently, said Pyotr Petrovich. For that you'll each get a noggin of vodka and pie to boot. Unharness the horses and go at once to the servants' quarters. I'm embarrassed, Chichikov said with a bow. Such an unexpected mistake. Not a mistake, Pyotr Petrovich Patuk said promptly. Not a mistake. You try how the dinner is first, and then say whether it was a mistake or not. Kindly step in, he said taking Chichikov under the arm and leading him to the inner rooms. Chichikov decorously passed through the doors sideways, so as to allow the host to enter with him. But this was in vain. The host could not enter, and besides he was no longer there. One could only hear his talk resounding all over the yard. But where's Big Foma? Why isn't he here yet? Emelian, you gawk. Run and tell that dolt of a cook to gut the sturgeon quickly. Milt, roe, innards and bream. Into the soup. Carp, into the sauce. And crayfish, crayfish. Little Foma. You gawk. Where are the crayfish? Crayfish. I say, crayfish. And for a long time there went on echoing crayfish, crayfish. Well, the host's bustling about, said Chichikov sitting in an armchair and studying the walls and corners. And here I am, said the host, entering and bringing in two youths in summer frock coats. Slender as willow wands, they shot up almost two feet taller than Pyotr Petrovich. My sons, high school boys. Home for the holidays. Nikolasha, you stay with our guest, and you, Alexasha, follow me. And again Pyotr Petrovich Patuk vanished. Chichikov occupied himself with Nikolasha. Nikolasha was talkative. He said that the teaching in his school was not very good, that more favor was shown those whose mamas sent them costlier presents, that the Inkermanland Hussar Regiment was stationed in their town, that Captain Vetvitsky had a better horse than the colonel himself, though Lieutenant Zemsev was a far better rider. And, tell me, what is the condition of your papa's estate? asked Chichikov. Mortgaged. The papa himself replied to that, appearing in the drawing room again, mortgaged. It remained for Chichikov to make the sort of movement with his lips that a man makes when a deal comes to naught and ends in nothing. Why did you mortgage it? he asked. Just so. Everybody got into mortgaging. Why should I lag behind the rest? They say it's profitable. And besides, I've always lived here. So why not try living in Moscow a bit? The fool, the fool. Thought Chichikov. He'll squander everything. And turn his children into little squanderers too. He ought to stay in the country. Pork pie that he is. And I know just what you're thinking, said Patuk. What? asked Chichikov, embarrassed. You're thinking, he's a fool, a fool. This Patuk got me to stay for dinner, and there's still no dinner. It'll be ready, most honorable sir. Quicker than a crop-headed wench can braid her hair. Papa, Platon Michalik is coming, said Alexasha, looking out the window. Riding a bay horse, Nikolasha added, bending down to the window. Do you think our gray is worse than that, Alex Sasha? Worse or not? He doesn't have the same gait. An argument arose between them about the bay horse and the gray. Meanwhile, a handsome man entered the room, tall and trim, 
with glossy light brown curls and dark eyes. A big muzzled monster of a dog came in after him, its bronze collar clanking. Had dinner? asked Pyotr Petrovich Patuk. I have, said the guest. What, then? Have you come here to laugh at me? Patuk said crossly. Who needs you after dinner, anyhow, Pyotr Petrovich, the guest said, smiling. I have this comfort for you, that I ate nothing at dinner. I have no appetite at all. And what a catch we had, if only you'd seen. What a giant of a sturgeon came to us. We didn't even count the carp. I'm envious just listening to you, said the guest. Teach me to be as merry as you are. But why be bored? For pity's sake, said the host. Why be bored? Because it's boring. You eat too little, that's all. Try and have a good dinner. Boredom was only invented recently. Before no one was bored. Enough boasting. As if you've never been bored. Never. I don't know. I haven't even got time to be bored. In the morning you wake up, you have to have your tea, and the steward is there, and then it's time for fishing, and then there's dinner. After dinner you just barely have time for a snooze, then it's supper, and then the cook comes, you have to order dinner for the next day. When could I be bored? All the while this conversation was going on, Chichikov was studying the guest. Platon Michalik Platonov was Achilles and Paris combined. Trim build, impressive height, freshness, all met together in him. A pleasant smile, with a slight expression of irony, seemed to make him still more handsome. But in spite of it all, there was something sleepy and inanimate in him. Passions, sorrows, and shocks had brought no wrinkles to his virginal, fresh face, nor at the same time did they animate it. I confess, Chichikov spoke, I, too, cannot understand. If you will allow me the observation, cannot understand how it is possible, with an appearance such as yours, to be bored. Of course, there may be other reasons. Lack of money? Oppression from some sort of malefactors. For there exist such as are even ready to make an attempt on one's life. That's just it, that there's nothing of the sort said Platonov. Believe me, I could wish for it on occasion, that there was at least some sort of care and anxiety. Well, at least that someone would simply make me angry. But no. Boring. And that's all. I don't understand. But perhaps your estate isn't big enough, there's too few souls. Not in the least. My brother and I have about 30,000 acres of land, and a thousand peasant souls along with it. And yet you're bored. Incomprehensible. But perhaps your estate is in disorder? The harvests have been poor. Many people have died? On the contrary, everything's in the best possible order, and my brother is an excellent manager. I don't understand, said Chichikov, shrugging. But now we're going to drive boredom away, said the host. Run to the kitchen, Alexasha. Tell the cook to hurry up and send us some fish tarts. Where's that gawk chameleon and the thief in Tashka? Why don't they serve the hors d'oeuvres? But the door opened. The gawk chameleon and the thief in Tashka appeared with napkins, laid the table, set down a tray with six carafes filled with varicolored liqueurs. Soon, around the tray and the carafes lay a necklace of plates. Caviar, cheeses, salted mushrooms of various sorts, and from the kitchen a newly brought something on covered dishes, from which came a gurgling of butter. The Gawkameleon and the thief in Tashka were fine and efficient folk. The master had given them these appellations only because everything came out somehow insipid without nicknames, and he did not like insipid things. He himself had a good heart, yet he loved a spicy phrase. Anyhow, his servants were not angered by it. The hors d'oeuvres were followed by dinner. Here the good-natured host turned into a real bully. The moment he noticed someone taking one piece, 
he would immediately give him a second, muttering, Without a mate neither man nor bird can live in this world. The guest ate the two. He heaped on a third, muttering, What good is the number two? God loves the Trinity. The guest ate the third. Then he, whoever saw a cart with three wheels, does anyone build a cottage with three corners? For four he had yet another saying, and also for five. Chichikov ate about a dozen helpings of something and thought, well, the host can't come up with anything more now. Not so. The host, without saying a word, put on his plate a rack of veal roasted on a spit, the best part there is, with the kidneys and of such a calf. Milk fed for two years, said the host. I took care of him like my own son. I can't, said Chichikov. Try it, and then say, I can't. It won't go in. No room. There was no room in the church either. The governor came. They found room. And there was such a crush that an apple had nowhere to fall. Just try it. This piece is the same as the governor. Chichikov tried it. The piece was indeed something like a governor. Room was found for it, though it seemed impossible to find any. With the wines there also came a story. Having received his mortgage money, Pyotr Petrovich had stocked up on provisions for ten years to come. He kept pouring and pouring. Whatever the guests left was finished by Nikolasha and Alexasha, who tossed off glass after glass. Yet when they left the table, it was as if nothing had happened, as if they had just been drinking water. Not so the guests. With great, great effort they dragged themselves over to the balcony, and with great effort lowered themselves into their armchairs. The host, the moment he sat down in his, which was something like a four-seater, immediately fell asleep. His corpulent self turned into a blacksmith's bellows. Through his open mouth and the nostrils of his nose, it began producing sounds such as do not exist even in the latest music. Everything was there, drum, flute, and some abrupt sound, like a dog's barking. What a whistler, said Platonov. Chichikov laughed. Naturally, once you've had a dinner like that, Platonov said, how could boredom come to you? What comes is sleep. Yes, Chichikov said lazily. His eyes became extraordinarily small. All the same, however, I can't understand how it's possible to be bored. There are so many remedies for boredom. Such as, there are all sorts for a young man. You can dance, play some instrument, or else, get married. To whom, tell me, as if there were no nice and rich brides in the neighborhood, there aren't. Well, then, you could go and look elsewhere. Here a rich thought flashed in Chichikov's head. His eyes got bigger. But there is a wonderful remedy, he said, looking into Platonov's eyes. Which, travel. Where to, if you're free, then come with me, said Chichikov thinking to himself as he looked at Platonov, and it would be nice. We could split the expenses, and the repairs of the carriage could go entirely to his account. And where are you going, how shall I say? Where? I'm traveling now not so much on my own as on someone else's need. General Betrashev, a close friend and, one might say, benefactor, asked me to visit his relatives. Of course. Relatives are relatives, but it is partly, so to speak, for my own self as well. For to see the world, the circulation of people, whatever they may say, is like a living book, a second education. Platonov fell to thinking. Chichikov meanwhile reflected thus, truly it would be nice. It could even be done so that all the expenses would go to his account. It could even be arranged so that we would take his horses and mine would be fed on his estate. I could also spare my carriage by leaving it on his estate and taking his for the road. Well, then, why not take a trip? Platonov was thinking meanwhile. It really might cheer me up. 
I have nothing to do at home. The management is in my brother's hands anyway. So there won't be any trouble. Why, indeed, not take a trip? And would you agree? He said aloud. To being my brother's guest for a couple of days? Otherwise, he won't let me go. With great pleasure. Even three. Well, in that case, my hand on it. Let's go, said Platonov, livening up. Bravo, said Chichikov, slapping his hand. Let's go. Where? Where? The host exclaimed, waking up and goggling his eyes at them. No, gentlemen. I ordered the wheels taken off your coach and your stallion, Platon Michalik, is now ten miles away from here. No, today you spend the night, and tomorrow, after an early dinner, you'll be free to go. Well now, thought Chichikov. Platonov made no reply, knowing that Patuk held fast to his customs. They had to stay. In return, they were rewarded with a remarkable spring evening. The host arranged a party on the river. Twelve rowers, manning twenty-four oars, with singing, swept them across the smooth back of the mirrory lake. From the lake they swept on to the river, boundless, with gently sloping banks on both sides. No current stirred the water. They drank tea with kolachi on the boat, constantly passing under cables stretched across the river for net fishing. Still before tea the host had already managed to undress and jump into the river, where he spent about half an hour with the fishermen, splashing about and making a lot of noise, shouting at Big Foma and Kozma, and, having had his fill of shouting, bustling, freezing in the water, he came back aboard with an appetite and drank his tea in a manner enviable to see. Meanwhile the sun went down. Brightness lingered in the sky. The echoes of shouting grew louder. Instead of fishermen, groups of bathing children appeared on the banks everywhere, splashing in the water. Laughter echoed far away. The rowers, setting twenty-four oars in motion, would all at once raise them, and the boat would glide by itself, like a light bird, over the moveless mirror surface. A healthy stalwart, fresh as a young winch, the third from the tiller, led the singing alone, working in a clear, ringing voice. Five picked it up, six carried it on, and the song poured forth as boundlessly as all Russ, and hand on ear. The singers themselves were as if lost in its boundlessness. It felt somehow free, and Chichikov thought, Eh, really, someday I'm going to get me a little country estate. Well, where? Where's the good in it? Thought Platonov. In this mournful song? It makes one still more sick at heart. It was already dusk as they were coming back. In the darkness the oars struck waters that no longer reflected the sky. Barely visible were the little lights on the shores of the lake. The moon was rising when they pulled into shore. Everywhere fishermen were cooking fish soup on tripods, all of rough, the fish still quiveringly alive. Everything was already home. Geese, cows, and goats had been driven home long ago, and the very dust they raised had long settled, and their herdsmen stood by the gates waiting for a crock of milk, and an invitation for fish soup. Here and there some human chatter and clatter could be heard, the loud barking of dogs from this village, and distant barking from villages farther away. The moon was rising, the darkness began to brighten, and finally everything became bright. Lake and cottages. The lights in the windows paled. One could now see the smoke from the chimneys, silvered by moonbeams. Nikolasha and Alexasha swept past them just then on two dashing steeds, racing each other. They raised as much dust as a flock of sheep. Eh, really, someday I'm going to get me a little country estate, Chichikov was thinking. A young winch and little Chichikis again rose in his imagination. Who could help being warmed by such an evening? And at supper they again ate too much. 
When Pavel Ivanovich came to the room where he was to sleep, and, getting into bed, felt his tummy, a drum, he said. No governor could possibly get in, just imagine such a coincidence. On the other side of the wall was the host's study. The wall was thin, and one could hear everything that was being said there. The host was ordering the cook to prepare for the next day, in the guise of an early lunch, a decided dinner. And how he was ordering it. It was enough to make a dead man hungry. He sucked and smacked his lips. One heard only, and fry it, and then let it stew nice and long. And the cook kept saying in a thin falsetto, Yes, sir. It can be done, sir. That can be done, too, sir. And make a covered pie, a four-cornered one. In one corner put sturgeon cheeks and cartilage, and stuff another with buckwheat and mushrooms with onions, and sweet milk, and brains, and something else as well, whatever you know, yes, sir. That could be done, sir. And so that on one side, you understand, it gets nice and brown, but on the other, let it be a bit lighter. From the bottom, from the bottom, you understand, bake it from the bottom, so that it gets all crumbly, so that it gets all juicy through and through, so that you don't feel it in your mouth, it should melt like snow. Devil take it, thought Chichikov, tossing and turning. He just won't let me sleep. And make me a pig haggis. Put a piece of ice in the middle, so that it plumps up nicely. And put things around the sturgeon. Garnishes, more garnishes. Surround it with crayfish, and little fried fish, and layer it with a stuffing of smelts with some finely minced horseradish and mushrooms, and turnips, and carrots, and beans, and isn't there some other root? Some kohlrabi or star-cut beets could be put in, said the cook. Put in both kohlrabi and beets. And for the roast, you'll make me a garnish like this. Sleep's gone completely, said Chichikov, turning on his other side, burying his head in the pillows, and covering himself up with a blanket, so as not to hear anything but through the blanket came unremittingly, and fry it, and bake it, and let it plump up nicely. He finally fell asleep at some turkey. The next day the guests overate so much that Platonov was no longer able to ride on horseback. The stallion was sent with Patuka's stable boy. They got into the coach. The big muzzled dog walked lazily behind the coach. He, too, had overeaten. No. It's too much, said Chichikov, as they left the place. It's even piggish. Are you uncomfortable, Platon Michalik? Such a comfortable carriage it was, and suddenly it's become uncomfortable. Petrushka, you must have been fool enough to start repacking. There are boxes sticking out everywhere, Platon laughed. That I can explain for you, he said. Pyotr Petrovich put things in for the road. Right you are, said Petrushka, turning around from the box. We were ordered to put everything in the coach, pasteries and pies. Right, sir, Pavel Ivanovich, said Selifin, turning around from the box, merrily. Such a respectable master, a regaling landowner. Sent us down a glass of champagne each. Right, sir, and ordered them to give us food from the table very good food, of a delicate aroma. There's never yet been such a respectful master. You see? He satisfied everyone, said Platon. Tell me simply, however, do you have time to stop by at a certain estate, some six miles from here? I'd like to say goodbye to my sister and brother-in-law. With great pleasure, said Chichikov. You won't be any the worse for it. My brother-in-law is quite a remarkable man. In what sense, said Chichikov. He's the foremost manager that has ever existed in Russia. In a little over ten years, he's made it so that a run-down property that used to bring in barely twenty thousand now brings in two hundred thousand. Ah, a respectable man. Such a man's life merits being told for people's instruction. I'll be very... Very pleased to make his acquaintance. And what is his name? 
Costanz Hoglo. 2. And his first name and patronymic, Konstantin Fyodorovich. Konstantin Fyodorovich Kostans Hoglo. Very pleased to make his acquaintance. It's instructive to get to know such a man. And Chichikov started inquiring about Kostans Hoglo, and everything he learned about him from Platonov was indeed amazing. Look here. This is where his land begins, said Platonov, pointing to the fields. You'll see at once the difference from the others. Coachman, take the road to the left here. Do you see this young forest? It's been planted. With someone else, it wouldn't have grown that much in fifteen years, but has grew in eight. Look, the forest ends here. Now it's a wheat field, and after a hundred and fifty acres there will be a forest again, also planted, and so on. Look at the field, how much thicker the growth is than anywhere else. I see that. How does he do it? Well, you can ask him, you'll see that. He's a know-all, such a know-all as you won't find anywhere else. He not only knows which plant likes which kind of soil, he also knows in what sort of surroundings, next to what kind of trees a certain grain should be planted. We all have our land cracking with drought, but he doesn't. He calculates how much humidity is necessary and grows enough trees. With him, everything plays a double or triple role. The forest is a forest, but the fields profit from the leaves and the shade. And he's like that with everything. An amazing man, said Chichikov, gazing curiously at the fields. Everything was in extraordinarily good order. The woods were fenced off. There were cattle yards everywhere, also arranged not without reason and enviably well tended. The haystacks were of gigantic size. Everywhere was abundance and fatness. One could see at once that a top-notch owner lived here. Having climbed a small rise, they saw on the other side a large estate scattered over three hillsides. Everything here was rich. Smooth streets, sturdy cottages. If a cart stood somewhere, the cart was a sturdy one and new as could be. If one came upon a horse, the horse was a fine and well-fed one or upon horned cattle, then they were of the choicest quality. Even the mujik's pig had an air of nobility. Precisely here, one could see, lived those mujiks who, as the song says, shovel silver with their spades. There were no English parks here, no gazebos, whimsical bridges, or various avenues in front of the house. Workshops stretched between the cottages and the master's yard. On the roof there was a big lantern, not for the view, but for seeing where and in what shop and how the work was going on. They drove up to the house. The owner was absent. They were met by his wife, Platonov's sister, fair-haired, fair-skinned, with a real Russian expression, as handsome, but also as half-asleep as he was. It seemed she did not care much for what others cared about, either because her husband's all-absorbing activity left no share for her, or because she belonged, by her very constitution, to that philosophical order of people who, while having feelings and thoughts and intelligence, live somehow only halfway, look at life with half an eye, and seeing its upsetting struggles and anxieties, say, let them rage, the fools. So much the worse for them. Greetings, sister, said Platonov. And where is Constantine? I don't know. He ought to have been back long ago. He must have gotten busy. Chichikov paid no attention to the hostess. He was interested in looking over the dwelling of this extraordinary man. He hoped to discover in it the properties of the owner himself as one can tell by the shell what sort of oyster or snail sits in it. But there was nothing of the sort. The rooms were completely characterless, spacious, and nothing else. No frescoes, no paintings on the walls, no bronzes on the tables, no whatnots with china or cups, no vases of flowers or statuettes, 
In short, it was somehow bare, plain, ordinary furniture, and a grand piano standing to one side, and covered with dust at that. Apparently the mistress rarely sat down to it. From the drawing room, the door opened to the master's study, but there, too, everything was the same, plain and bare. One could see that the owner came home only to rest, not to live there. That for thinking over his plans and ideas, he had no need of a study with upholstered armchairs and various comfortable conveniences, and that his life consisted not of charming reveries by the blazing fireplace, but of real business. His thoughts proceeded at once from circumstances, the moment they presented themselves, and turned at once into business, without any need of being written down. Ah, here he is. He's coming, he's coming, said Platonov. Chichikov also rushed to the window. A man of about forty, lively with a swarthy appearance, was coming up to the porch. He was wearing a velour peaked cap. On both sides of him, their hats off, walked two persons of lower rank, walked, talking and discussing something with him. One seemed to be a simple mujik, the other, in a blue suburka, three some foxy looking itinerant dealer. Order them to take it, then. My dear, the mujik said, bowing. No, brother. I've already told you twenty times. Don't bring any more. I've got so much material stored up that I don. Do you know what to do with it? With you, dear Konstantin Fyodorovich, it will all be put to use. Such a clever man as you is not to be found in the whole world. Your healthfulness will find a place for anything. So give orders to take it. I need hands, brother. Bring me workers, not materials. But you won't lack for workers. Whole villages of ours will come to be hired. The breadlessness was such that no one remembers the like of it. It's a pity you won't just take us. You get tried and true service from us. By God you would. With you one gets ever wiser, Konstantin Fyodorovich. So give orders to take it for the last time. But you said before that it would be the last time. And now you've brought it again. For the last time, Konstantin Fyodorovich. If you don't accept it, no one will. So order them to take it, my dear. Well, listen. This time I'll take it, and that only out of pity, so that you won't have brought it in vain. But if you bring it next time, you can whine for three weeks. I won't take it. Yes, sir. Konstantin Fyodorovich. Rest assured, next time I won't ever bring it. I humbly thank you. The mujik went away pleased. He was lying, however. He would bring it again. Maybe, is a great little word. Now then, Konstantin Fyodorovich, sir, do me a kindness. Knock off a bit, said the itinerant dealer in the blue suburka, who was walking on the other side of him. You see, I told you from the very start. I'm not fond of bargaining. I tell you again. I'm not like some other landowner whom you get it just as his mortgage payment is due. Don't I know you all? You've got the lists and know who has to pay and when. So, what could be simpler? He's pressed. He gives it to you for half the price. But what's your money to me? My things can go on lying there for three years. I have no mortgage to pay. It's real business, Konstantin Fyodorovich. No, sir. It's so that I, it's only so as to have dealings with you in the future, and not for anything mercenary. Kindly accept a little deposit of three thousand. The dealer took a wad of greasy bills from his breast pocket. Kostan's Hoglo took them with great coolness, and put them into the back pocket of his frock coat without counting them. H.M., thought Chichikov, just as if it were a handkerchief. A moment later Kostans Hoglo appeared in the doorway of the drawing room. Ha, brother, you're here, he said, seeing Platonov. They embraced and kissed each other. Platonov introduced Chichikov. Chichikov reverently approached the host, planted a kiss on his cheek, 
and received from him the impression of a kiss. Costan's Hoglo's face was very remarkable. It betrayed its southern origin. His hair and eyebrows were dark and thick. His eyes eloquent, brightly gleaming. Intelligence shone in every expression of his face, and there was nothing sleepy in it. One could notice, however, an admixture of something bilious and embittered. What, in fact, was his nationality? There are many Russians in Russia who are of non-Russian origin, but are nevertheless Russians in their souls. Kostans Hoglo was not interested in his origins, finding the question beside the point and quite useless for the household. Besides, he knew no other language than Russian. Do you know what has occurred to me, Constantine, said Platonov. What, it has occurred to me to take a trip over various provinces. Maybe it will cure my spleen. Why not? It's quite possible. Together with Pavel Ivanovich here. Wonderful. And to what parts, Kostans Hoglo asked, addressing Chichikov affably, do you now purpose to travel? I confess, said Chichikov, inclining his head to one side and grasping the armrest of the chair with his hand. I am traveling, for the moment, not so much on my own necessity as on another's. General Betrushev, a close friend and, one might say, benefactor, asked me to visit his relatives. Relatives are relatives, of course, but it is partly, so to speak, for my own self as well, because, indeed, to say nothing of the good that may come from it in the hemorrhoidal respect, the fact alone that one sees the world, the circulation of people, whatever they may say, it is, so to speak, a living book, the same as learning. Yes, it does no harm to peek into certain corners. An excellent observation, if you please, Chichikov adverted, indeed, it does no harm. You see things you wouldn't see otherwise. You meet people you wouldn't meet otherwise. Conversing with some people is as good as gold. Teach me, my most esteemed Konstantin Fyodorovich, teach me, I appeal to you. I wait for your sweet words as for manna. Kostans Hoglo was embarrassed. What though? Teach you what? I have only a pennyworth of education myself. Wisdom, my most esteemed sir, wisdom? The wisdom for managing an estate as you do. For obtaining an assured income as you have. For acquiring property as you do. Not dreamlike, but substantial and thereby fulfilling the duty of a citizen and earning the respect of one's compatriots. You know what, said Kostans Hoglo, stay with me for a day. I'll show you all my management and tell you about everything. There isn't any wisdom involved, as you'll see. Stay for this one day, brother, the hostess said, turning to Platonov. Why not? It makes no difference to me, the man said indifferently. What about Pavel Ivanovich? I, too, with the greatest pleasure. But there's this one circumstance. I must visit General Betrushev's relative. There's a certain Colonel Koshkarev, but he's, don't you know? He's a fool and quite mad. That I've heard already. I have no business with him myself. But since General Betrushev is my close friend and even, so to speak, Benefactor, it's somehow awkward. In that case, I tell you what, said Kostans Hoglo, go to him right now. I have a droshki standing ready. It's even less than six miles away. You'll fly there and back in no time. You'll even get back before supper. Chichikov gladly took advantage of the suggestion. The droshki was brought, and he drove off at once to see the colonel who amazed him as he had never been amazed before. Everything at his place was extraordinary. The village was scattered all over. Construction sites, reconstruction sites, piles of lime, brick, and logs everywhere in the streets. There were some houses built that looked like institutions. On one there was written in gold letters, Farm Implement Depot on another. 
Main Accounting Office on a Third, Village Affairs Comedy, School of Normal Education of Settlers. In short, Devil knows what was not there. He thought he might have entered a provincial capital. The colonel himself was somehow stiff. His face was somehow formal, shaped like a triangle. His side whiskers stretched in a line down his cheeks. His hair, hair styling, nose, lips, chin. Everything was as if it had just been taken from a press. He began speaking as if he were a sensible man. From the very beginning he began to complain of the lack of learning among the surrounding landowners, of the great labors that lay ahead of him. He received Chichikov with the utmost kindness and cordiality, took him entirely into his confidence, and with self-delight told him what labor, oh, what labor it had cost him to raise his estate to its present prosperity. How hard it was to make a simple mujik understand the lofty impulses that enlightened luxury and the fine arts give a man. How necessary it was to combat the Russian mujik's ignorance, so as to get him to dress in German trousers and make him feel, at least to some extent, man's lofty dignity. That, despite all his efforts, he had so far been unable to make the peasant women put on corsets, whereas in Germany, where his regiment had been stationed in the year 14, a miller's daughter could even play the piano, speak French, and curtsy. Regretfully, he told how great was the lack of learning among the neighboring landowners, how little they thought of their subjects. How they even laughed when he tried to explain how necessary it was for good management to set up a record office, commission offices, and even committees, so as to prevent all theft, so that every object would be known, so that the scrivener, the steward, and the bookkeeper would not be just educated somehow, but finish their studies at the university. How, despite all persuasions, he was unable to convince the landowners of how profitable it would be for their estates if every peasant were so well educated that, while following the plow, he could at the same time read a book about lightning rods. At this Chichikov thought, well, it's unlikely that such a time will ever come. Here I am a literate man, and I've yet to read the Countess Lavalier. Terrible ignorance said Colonel Koshkarev in conclusion. The darkness of the Middle Ages, and no way to remedy it. Believe me, there is none. And I could remedy it all. I know of one way, the surest way. What is it? To dress every last man in Russia the way they go about in Germany. Nothing more than that, and I promise you everything will go swimmingly. Learning will rise, trade will develop, a golden age will come to Russia. Chichikov was looking at him intently, thinking, well, it seems there's no point in standing on ceremony with this one. Not leaving matters in the bottom drawer, he straightaway explained to the colonel thus and so. There was a need for such and such souls, with the drawing up of such and such deeds. As far as I can see from your words, said the colonel, not embarrassed in the least, this is a request. Is that so? Exactly so. In that case, put it in writing. It will go to the Commission for Divers' Petitions. The Commission for Divers' Petitions, having made note of it, will forward it to me. From me, it will go on to the Village Affairs Committee, where all sorts of decisions and revisions will be made concerning the matter. The steward in chief together with the whole office will give his resolution in the soonmost time, and the matter will be settled. Chichikov was dumbstruck. Excuse me, he said. Things will take too long that way. Ah, the colonel said with a smile. There's the benefit of paperwork. It will indeed take longer, but nothing will escape. Every little detail will be in view. But, excuse me. How can one present it in writing? It's the sort of matter that the souls are in a certain sense dead. Very well. So you write that the souls are in a certain sense dead. 
But how can I? Dead? It's impossible to write that. They're dead. But it must seem as if they're alive. Well, then, you write. But it must seem, or it is required that they seem as if alive. What was to be done with the colonel? Chichikov decided to go and see for himself what these commissions and committees were. And what he found there was not only amazing, but decidedly exceeded all understanding. The Commission for Divers Petitions existed only on a signboard. Its chairman, a former valet, had been transferred to the newly formed village construction committee. He had been replaced by the clerk Timoshka, who had been dispatched on an investigation to sort things out between the drunken steward and the village headman, a crook and a cheat. No official anywhere. But where is, but how am I to get any sense? Chichikov said to his companion, an official for special missions, whom the colonel had given him as a guide. You won't get any sense, said the guide. Everything here is senseless. Here, you may be pleased to note, the building commission directs everything, disrupts everybody's work, sends people wherever it likes. The only ones who profit from it are those on the building commission. He was obviously displeased with the building commission. It's customary here for everybody to lead the master by the nose. He thinks everything's as it ought to be, but it's so in name only. He ought, however, to be told that, thought Chichikov, and having come to the colonel, he announced that his estate was in a muddle, and one could not get any sense, and that the building commission was stealing right and left. The colonel seethed with noble indignation. Seizing pen and paper, he straightaway wrote eight most severe inquiries. On what grounds had the building commission arbitrarily disposed of officials outside its jurisdiction? How could the steward-in-chief have allowed the chairman to go on an investigation without handing over his post? And how could the village affairs committee regard with indifference the fact that the committee for petitions did not even exist? Well, here comes mayhem, Chichikov thought, and he began to bow out. No, I won't let you go. In two hours, no more, you will be satisfied in everything. I will now put your matter in the charge of a special man who has just finished a course at the university. Sit in my library meanwhile. Here there is everything you might need. Books, paper, pens, pencils, everything. Help yourself, help yourself, you are the master. So spoke Koshkarev as he led him into the library. It was a huge room, with books from floor to ceiling. There were even stuffed animals. Books in all fields, forestry, cattle breeding, pig breeding, gardening, thousands of assorted journals, guidebooks, and a multitude of journals presenting the latest developments and improvements in horse breeding and natural science. There were such titles as pig breeding as a science. Seeing that these things were not for the pleasant passing of time, he turned to another bookcase. From the frying pan into the fire. They were all books of philosophy. One bore the title, Philosophy in a Scientific Sense. There was a row of six volumes entitled, A Preparatory Introduction to the Theory of Thinking in Their Entirety, Totality, Essence, and Application to the Comprehension of the Organic Principles of the Mutual Divarication of Social Production. Whichever book Chichikov opened, there was on every page a manifestation, a development, an abstract, enclosures, disclosures, and devil knows what was not there. No, this is all not for me, Chichikov said, and turned to the third bookcase, which contained everything in the line of the arts. Here he pulled out some huge book with a modest mythological pictures and began studying them. This was to his taste. Middle-aged bachelors like such pictures. They say that recently they have begun to be liked even by little old men who have refined their taste at the ballet. What can be done about it? In our age mankind likes spicy roots. Having finished studying this book, 
Chichikov was already pulling out another of the same sort, when suddenly Colonel Koshkarev appeared with a beaming face and a paper. It's all done and done splendidly. This man alone decidedly understands enough for all of them. For that I'll set him over them. I'll establish a special higher board and make him president. This is what he has written. Well, thank God, thought Chichikov, and he got ready to listen. The colonel began to read, setting about the consideration of the assignment I have been charged with by your honor. I have the privilege herewith to report on the above. 1. The very request of Mr. Collegiate Counselor Pavel Ivanovich Chichikov, Esquire, contains a certain misunderstanding. In the explanation of the demand for registered souls overtaken by various unexpectednesses, those who have died were also included. This was most probably meant to indicate those nearing death, and not those who have died. For those who have died are not purchasable. What is there to purchase if there's nothing? Logic itself tells us as much. And in literary sciences, as is obvious, he never got very far. Here Koshkarev paused momentarily and said, At this point, the sly boots. He needles you a little. But consider what a glib pin. The style of a state secretary. And he was at the university only three years and hasn't even finished the course. Koshkarev went on. In literary sciences, as is obvious, he never got very far, for he speaks of the souls as dead, while anyone who has taken a course in human knowledge knows for a certainty that the soul is immortal. Two of the above-mentioned registered souls, prescribed or prescinded, or, as he is pleased to put it incorrectly, dead, there are none present who are not mortgaged. For they are not only all mortgaged without exception, in their totality, but they are also remortgaged for an additional 150 rubles per soul, except for the small village of Gurmalavka, which is in dispute on occasion of the lawsuit of the landowner Predeshev, and therefore can be neither purchased nor mortgaged. Why then, did you not declare that to me before? Why have you detained me over nothing? Chichikov said vexedly. But how could I know beforehand? That's the benefit of paperwork, that everything can now be plainly seen in front of our eyes. What a fool you are, you stupid brute, Chichikov thought to himself. You've rummaged in books, and what have you learned? Bypassing all courtesy and decency, he grabbed his hat and left. The coachman stood holding the droshki ready, and with the horses still harnessed. To feed them a written request would have been called for, and the decision, to give the horses oats, would have been received only the next day. Rude and discourteous though Chichikov was, Koshkarev, despite all, was remarkably courteous and delicate with him. He squeezed his hand forcibly and pressed it to his heart and thanked him for giving him an occasion for seeing the course of the paper procedure at work, that a dressing down and tongue lashing were undoubtedly needed, because everything was capable of falling asleep, and the springs of estate management would then slacken and rust, that, owing to this event, he had had a happy thought, to set up a new commission which would be called the Commission for Supervision of the Building Commission, so that no one would then dare to steal. Ass, fool, thought Chichikov, angry and displeased all the way back. He was already riding under the stars. Night was in the sky. There were lights in the villages. Driving up to the porch, he saw through the windows that the table was already laid for supper. How is it you're so late? said Kostans Hoglo, when he appeared at the door. What were you talking about so long? said Platonov. He's done me in, said Chichikov. I've never seen such a fool in all my born days. That's still nothing, said Kostans Hoglo. Koshkarev is a comforting phenomenon. He's necessary, because the follies of clever people are made more obvious by the caricature of their reflection in him. 
They've set up offices and institutions and managers and manufacturers and factories and schools and commissions and devil knows what else. As if they had some sort of state of their own. How do you like this, I ask you? A landowner who has arable land and not enough peasants to work it started a candle factory, invited master candlemakers from London, and became a merchant. There's an even bigger fool. He started a silk factory, but you, too, have factories, Platonov observed. And who started them? They started of themselves. Wool accumulated, there was nowhere to sell it. So I started weaving broadcloth, simple, heavy broadcloth. I have it all sold for a low price at the markets. Fish scales, for example, have been thrown away on my bank for six years in a row. What was I to do with them? I started boiling them for glue and made 40,000. With me, everything's like that. What a devil, Chichikov thought, staring at him with all his eyes. He just rakes it in. And I don't build buildings for that. I have no houses with columns and pediments. I don't invite master craftsmen from abroad. And I'll never tear peasants away from tilling the soil. I have people work in my factories only in lean years, and only those from elsewhere, for the sake of bread. There can be many such factories. Just study your management a bit more closely and you'll see. Every rag can be of use. Every bit of trash can bring income, so much that later you'll just push it away, saying, no need. That's amazing. And what's most amazing is that every bit of trash can bring income, said Chichikov. H.M. And not only that, Kostan's Hoglo did not finish what he was saying. The bile rose in him, and he wanted to abuse his neighboring landowners. There's still another clever fellow. What do you think he set up for himself? An almshouse, a stone building on his estate, a pious enterprise. But if you wish to help, help everyone to do his duty, don't tear them away from their Christian duty. Help the son to care for his sick father, don't give him the chance of getting him off his back. Better give him the means of sheltering his neighbor and brother. Give him money for that, help him with all your powers, and don't pull him away, or else he, or LL give up all Christian obligations entirely. Don Quixote's in every sense. It comes to 200 rubles a year for a man in an almshouse. On that money, I could keep 10 people on my estate. Kostan's Hoglo got angry and spat. Chichikov was not interested in the almshouse. He wanted to talk about how every bit of trash could bring income. But Kostan's Hoglo was angry now, his bile was seething, and the words came pouring out. And here's another Don Quixote of enlightenment. He set up schools. Now what, for instance, is more useful to a man than literacy? And how did he handle it? Mujiks from his estate come to me. What's going on, my dear, they say. Our sons have got completely out of hand, don't want to help us work. They all want to become Scriveners. But there's need for only one Scrivener. That's what came of it. Chichikov had no use for schools either. But Platonov took up the subject. But that should be no hindrance, that there's no need for Scriveners now. There will be later. We must work for posterity. But you at least be intelligent, brother. What do you care about this posterity? Everyone thinks he's some kind of Peter the Great. Look under your feet, don't gaze into posterity. Make it so that the mujik is well off, even rich, so that he has time to study of his own will. But don't take a stick in your hand and say, study, devil knows which end they start from. Listen now, I'll let you be the judge now. Here Kostan's Hoglo moved closer to Chichikov and, to give him a better grasp of the matter, boarded him with a grapnel. In other words, put a finger in the buttonhole of his tailcoat. Now, what could be clearer? You have peasants, so you should foster them in their peasant way of life. What is this way of life? What is the peasant's occupation? 
plowing? Then see to it that he's a good plowman. Clear? No, clever fellows turn up who say, he should be taken out of this condition. The life he leads is too crude and simple. He must be made acquainted with the objects of luxury. They themselves, owing to this luxury, have become rags instead of people, and got infested with devil knows what diseases, and there, s no lad of eighteen left who hasn't already tried everything. He's toothless and bald behind. So now they want to infect these others with it all. Thank God we have at least this one healthy stratum left, as yet unacquainted with such whimsies. We must simply be grateful to God for that. Yes, for me the pluffmen are worthiest of all. God grant that all become pluffmen. So you suppose that plowing is the most profitable occupation? Asked Chichikov. The most rightful, not the most profitable. Till the soil in the sweat of your face. For that is said to us all. It is not said in vain. Age-old experience has proven that man in his agricultural quality has the purest morals. Where plowing lies at the basis of social life, there is abundance and well-being. There is neither poverty nor luxury, but there is well-being. Till the soil, man was told, labor. No need to be clever about it. I say to the mujik, whoever you work for, whether me, or yourself, or a neighbor, just work. If you're active, I'll be your first helper. You have no livestock, here's a horse for you. Here's a cow, here's a cart. Whatever you need, I'm ready to supply you with, only work. It kills me if your management is not well set up, and I see disorder and poverty there. I won't suffer idleness. I am set over you so that you should work. H.M. They think to increase their income with institutions and factories, but think first of all to make every one of your mujiks rich, and then you yourself will be rich without factories, mills, or foolish fancies. The more one listens to you, most honored Konstantin Fyodorovich, said Chichikov, the more one has a wish to listen. Tell me, my esteemed sir, if, for example, I should have the intention of becoming a landowner in, say, this province, what should I pay most attention to? What should I do? How should I act in order to become rich in a short period of time, and thereby, so to speak, fulfill the essential duty of a citizen? What you should do in order to become rich? Here's what, said Kostans Hoglo. Time for supper, said the mistress rising from the sofa, and she stepped into the middle of the room, wrapping a shawl around her chilled young limbs. Chichikov popped up from his chair with the adroitness of an almost military man, flew over to the mistress with the soft expression of a delicate civilian in his smile, offered her the crook of his arm, and led her gala fashion through two rooms into the dining room all the while keeping his head agreeably inclined a bit to one side. The servant took the lid off the tureen. They all moved their chairs up to the table, and the slurping of soup began. Having polished off his soup and washed it down with a glass of liqueur, the liqueur was excellent. Chichikov spoke thus to Kostans Hoglo. Allow me, most honored sir. To bring you back to the subject of our interrupted conversation, I was asking you what to do, how to act, how best to go about, and a state for which, if he were to ask even forty thousand, I'd count it out to him at once. H.M. Chichikov felt a pondering. And why is it, he spoke somewhat timidly, that you don't buy it yourself, but one needs finally to know one's limits. I have plenty to keep me busy around my own properties without that. Besides, our gentry are shouting at me without that, saying I supposedly take advantage of their extremities and their ruined estates to buy up land for next to nothing. I'm sick of it, finally. The gentry are quite capable of wicked talk, said Chichikov. And with us, in our own province, 
You can't imagine what they say about me. They don't even call me anything else but a skinflint and a first-degree niggard. They excuse themselves for everything. I did squander it all, of course, they say, but it was for the higher necessities of life. I need books, I must live in luxury, so as to encourage industry. But one may, perhaps, live without squandering all. If one lives like that swine Costanz Hoglo. That's how it is. I wish I were such a swine, said Chichikov. Ch and all that because I don't give dinners and don't lend them money. I don't give dinners because it would be oppressive for me. I'm not used to it. But to come and eat what I eat, you're quite welcome. I don't lend money. That's nonsense. If you're truly in need, come to me and tell me in detail how you'll make use of my money. If I see from your words that you'll dispose of it intelligently, and the money will clearly bring a profit, I won't refuse you, and won't even take interest on it. But I won't throw money to the winds. Let me be excused for that. He's planning some sort of dinner for his lady love, or furnishing his house on a crazy footing, and I should lend him money. Here Costanz Hoglo spat, and almost uttered several indecent, and abusive words in the presence of his spouse. The stern shadow of gloomy hypochondria darkened his lively face. Down and across his forehead wrinkles gathered, betraying the wrathful movement of stirred bile. Chichikov drank off a glass of raspberry liqueur and spoke thus, Allow me, my esteemed sir, to bring you back to the subject of our interrupted conversation. Supposing I were to acquire that same estate you were pleased to mention, in how much time and how quickly can one get rich to such an extent? If what you want, Costanz Hoglo picked up sternly and curtly, still full of ill humor, is to get rich quickly, then you'll never get rich. But if you want to get rich without asking about time, you'll get rich quickly. So that's it, said Chichikov. Yes, Kostanz Hoglo said curtly, as if he were angry with Chichikov himself. One must have a love of work. Without it nothing can be done. One must come to love management, yes. And believe me, there's nothing dull about it. They've invented the idea that country life is boring. But I'd die of boredom if I spent even one day in the city the way they do. A proprietor has no time to be bored. There's no emptiness in his life. Everything is fullness. One need only consider this whole varied cycle of yearly occupations. And what occupations? Occupations that truly elevate the spirit, to say nothing of their diversity. That here man walks side by side with nature, side by side with the seasons, a participant and conversant with everything that is accomplished in creation. Spring has not yet come, but work is already underway. Supplies of firewood and everything for the flood time. Preparing seed. Sorting and measuring grain in the granaries and drying it. Establishing new rents. The snow and floods are over. Work is suddenly at the boil. Here boats are being loaded. Their forests are being thinned out. Trees replanted in gardens and the soil dug up everywhere. The spade is at work in the kitchen gardens, in the fields the plow and harrow, and the sowing begins. A trifle. They're sowing the future harvest. Summer comes, the mowing, the plowman's greatest feast. A trifle. Then comes harvest after harvest, rye followed by wheat, barley by oats, and then there's the pulling of the hemp. The piling of herricks, the stacking of sheaves. August is now half over. Everything's being brought to the threshing floors. Autumn comes. The plowing and sowing of winter crops, repairing of granaries, threshing barns, cattle sheds, bundling of grain, and the first threshing. Winter comes. Here, too, work doesn't sleep. First deliveries to town. Threshing on all the threshing floors, 
transporting the threshed grain from the threshing floors to the barns, cutting and sawing of wood in the forests, deliveries of brick and materials for spring construction. But it's simply impossible for me to embrace it all. Such a diversity of work. You go and have a look here and there. To the mill, to the workshops, to the factories, and to the threshing floors. You also go and have a look at the mujik working for himself. A trifle. But for me it's a feast if a carpenter has good command of his axe. I'm ready to stand there for two hours. Such joy work gives me. And if you also see with what purpose it is all being done, and how everything around you brings increase upon increase, producing fruit and profit, I cannot even tell you what a pleasure it is. And not because the money's growing. Money is money. But because all this is, your handiwork. Because you see yourself being the cause and creator of it all. How from you, as from some sort of magician, abundance and good pour out on everything. No, where can you find me in equal delight? Said Costanz Hoglo, his face looking up, the wrinkles disappearing. He was as radiant as a king on the day of his solemn coronation. No, you won't find such a delight in the whole world. Here, precisely here, man imitates God. God granted himself the work of creation, as the highest delight, and he demands that man, too, be a creator of prosperity and the harmonious course of things. And this they call dull, as to the singing of a bird of paradise. Chichikov lost himself in listening to the sweet sounds of the proprietor's talk. His mouth was watering. His eyes became unctuous and acquired a sweet expression. He could have gone on listening forever. Constantine, it's time we got up, said the mistress, rising from her chair. Platonov rose, Kostans Hoglo rose, Chichikov rose, though he wanted to go on sitting and listening. Offering her the crook of his arm, he led the mistress back. But his head was not affably inclined to one side. His maneuvering lacked adroitness. Because his thoughts were occupied with essential maneuvers and considerations. However you describe it. All the same it's boring, Platonov said, walking behind him. Our guest seems far from stupid. The host was thinking, temperate in his speech, and no whippersnapper. And this thought made him still more cheerful, as if he had warmed himself up with his own conversation and rejoiced to find a man ready to listen to intelligent advice. Later, when they were all settled in a snug little candlelit room, across from the glass balcony door that served as a window, Chichikov felt cozier than he had felt for a long time. It was as if after long peregrinations, he had now been received under his own roof, and to crown it all, had now obtained all that he desired and had dropped his pilgrim's staff, saying, Enough! So enchanting was the mood brought upon his soul by the host's reasonable talk. For every man there are certain words that are as if closer and more intimate to him than any others. And often, unexpectedly, in some remote, forsaken backwater, some deserted desert, one meets a man whose warming conversation makes you forget the pathlessness of your paths, the homelessness of your nights, and the contemporary world full of people's stupidity, of deceptions for deceiving man. Forever and always an evening spent in this way will vividly remain with you, and all that was and that took place then will be retained by the faithful memory. Who was there? And who stood where, and what he was holding, the walls, the corners, and every trifle. So, too, did everything remain in Chichikov's memory that evening. This unpretentiously furnished little room, and the good natured expression that settled on the host's face, and the pipe brought to Platonov, with its amber mouthpiece, and the smoke that he began blowing into Yarb's fat muzzle, 
and Yarb's snorting, and the comely mistress's laughter, interrupted by the words, Enough! Don't torment him! And the cheery candles, and the cricket in the corner, and the glass door, and the spring night looking in at them through it, leaning its elbow on the treetops, wherein the thicket spring nightingales were whistling away. Sweet is your talk to me, my esteemed Konstantin Fyodorovich, said Chichikov. I may say that in the whole of Russia I have never met a man to equal you in intelligence. He smiled. No, Pavel Ivanovich, he said, if you want to know an intelligent man, then we do indeed have one of whom it may truly be said, this is an intelligent man, and of whom I am not worth the shoe sole. Who is he? Chichikov asked in amazement. Our tax farmer, Murazov. This is the second time I'm hearing about him, Chichikov exclaimed. He's a man who could manage not just a landowner's estate, but a whole country. If I had a country, I'd make him minister of finance at once. I've heard. They say he's a man who surpasses all belief. He's made ten million, they say. Ten. Nothing. It's way over forty. Soon half of Russia will be in his hands. You don't say, Chichikov exclaimed, dumbfounded. Quite certainly. His capital must be growing now at an incredible rate. That's clear. Wealth grows slowly only when you have just a few hundred thousand. A man with millions has a big radius. Whatever he gets hold of becomes two or three times more than it was. The field, the range is all too vast. There are no rivals here. No one can vie with him. Whatever price he assigns to a thing, so it stays. There's no one to bid higher. Pop-eyed and open-mouthed, Chichikov gazed into Kostan's Hoglo's eyes as if rooted to the spot. There was no breath in him. The mind boggles, he said, recovering himself slightly. Thought is petrified with fear. People are amazed at the wisdom of providence as they examine a little bug. For me it is more amazing that such enormous sums can pass through a mortal's hands. Allow me to put a question to you concerning one circumstance. Tell me this, to be sure, was originally acquired not quite sinlessly, in the most irreproachable fashion, and by the most correct means. I can't believe it, my esteemed sir. Excuse me, but I can't believe it. If it were thousands, very well, but millions, excuse me, but I can't believe it. Quite the contrary, with thousands it's hard to be quite sinless, but to make millions is easy. A millionaire has no need to resort to crooked ways. Just go on and take the straight road. Take all that lies before you. No one else will pick it up. The mind boggles. And what's most mind-boggling is that the whole thing started from a kopeck. It never happens otherwise. It's the rightful order of things, said Kostans Hoglo. He who was born with thousands, who was brought up on thousands, will acquire no more. He already has his whims and what not. One ought to begin from the beginning, not from the middle. From below, one ought to begin from below. Only then do you get to know well the people and life amidst which you'll have to make shift afterwards. Once you've suffered this or that on your own hide, and have learned that every kopeck is nailed down with a three kopeck nail, and have gone through every torment, then you'll grow so wise and well schooled that you won't blunder or go amiss in any undertaking. Believe me, it's the truth. One ought to begin from the beginning not from the middle. If anyone says to me, give me a hundred thousand and I'll get rich at once, I won't believe him. He's striking at random, not with certainty. One ought to begin with a kopeck. In that case, I'll get rich, said Chichikov, because I'm beginning, so to speak, from almost nothing. He had in mind the dead souls. Constantine, it's time we let Pavel Ivanovich rest and get some sleep, said the mistress. But you keep babbling. 
and you will certainly get rich, said Costanz Hoglo, not listening to the mistress. Rivers, rivers of gold will flow to you. You won't know what to do with such money. Pavel Ivanovich sat as one enchanted, and his thoughts were whirling in a golden realm of growing dreams and reveries. Really, Constantine, it's time Pavel Ivanovich slept. But what is it to you? Go yourself, if you want to, the host said, and stopped. Loudly, through the whole room, came the snoring of Platonov, after whom Yar began to snore even louder. For a long time already a distant banging on iron rails had been heard. It was getting past midnight. Kostans Hoglo observed that it was indeed time to retire. They all wandered off, having wished each other good night and hastening to make use of the wish. Only Chichikov was unable to sleep. His thoughts were wakeful. He was pondering how to become a landowner like Kostans Hoglo. After his conversation with the host, everything had become so clear. The possibility of getting rich seemed so obvious. The difficult matter of management had now become so plain and simple, and seemed so suited to his very nature, that he began to have serious thoughts of acquiring not an imaginary but a real estate. He decided then and there that with the money he would get from the bank for mortgaging his fantastic souls, he would acquire a by no means fantastic estate. He already saw himself acting and managing precisely as Costanz Hoglo instructed, efficiently, prudently, not introducing anything new before learning thoroughly everything old, examining everything with his own eyes, getting to know all the mujiks, spurning all excesses, giving himself only to work and management. He already anticipated beforehand the pleasure he would feel when a harmonious order was established and all the springs of management began working briskly, energetically pushing each other. Work would be at the boil, and just as a well-running mill swiftly produces flour from grain, so all sorts of trash and rubbish would start producing pure gold, pure gold. The wondrous proprietor stood before him every moment. He was the first man in the whole of Russia for whom he felt personal respect. Until now he had respected men either for their high rank or for their great wealth. He had never yet respected any man for his intelligence proper. Kostans Hoglo was the first. Chichikov also understood that there was no point in talking with such a man about dead souls, and that the mere mention of it would be inappropriate. He was now occupied with another project, to buy Clobeve's estate. He had ten thousand. Another ten thousand he meant to borrow from Kostans Hoglo, who had just himself announced his readiness to help anyone who wished to get rich and take up estate management. The remaining 10,000 he could pledge to pay later, once the souls had been mortgaged. He could not yet mortgage all the souls he had bought, because there was still no land for him to resettle them on. Though he averred that he had land in Kherson province, it has yet existed mostly in intent. The intention was still to buy up land in Kherson province because it was sold there for next to nothing and was even given away free if only people would settle there. He also thought about the need to hurry up and buy whatever runaway and dead souls could be found, because landowners were hastening to mortgage their estates, and it might soon be that in all Russia there was no corner left not mortgaged to the treasury. All these thoughts filled his head one after another and kept him from sleeping. Finally sleep which for four full hours had held the whole house, as they say, in its embrace, finally took Chichikov into its embrace as well. He fell fast asleep. Four illegible words in Gogol's manuscript. Trans. The bracketed words were supplied by the editor of the 1857 edition of Dead Souls. Trans. Two pages are missing from the manuscript. In them, the subject of Clobeve's estate, mentioned in what follows, was introduced. 
Trans. Chapter 4 The next day, everything was arranged in the best possible way. Costanz Hoglo gladly gave him the 10,000 without interest, without security, simply with a receipt. So ready he was to assist anyone on the path to acquisition. Not only that, he himself undertook to accompany Chichikov to Klobiev's, so as to look the estate over. After a substantial breakfast, they all set out, having climbed all three into Pavel Ivanovich's carriage. The host's droshky followed empty behind. Yarb ran ahead, chasing birds off the road. In a little over an hour and a half, they covered ten miles and saw a small estate with two houses. One of them, big and new, was unfinished and had remained in that rough state for several years. The other was small and old. They found the owner disheveled, sleepy, just awakened. There was a patch on his frock coat and a hole in his boot. He was God knows how glad of the visitor's arrival, as if he were seeing brothers from whom he had been parted for a long time. Konstantin Fyodorovich, Platon Mihailovich, he cried out. Dear friends, I'm much obliged. Let me rub my eyes. I really thought no one would ever come to see me. Everyone flees me like the plague. They think I'll ask them to lend me money. Oh, it's hard, hard, Konstantin Fyodorovich. I see that it's all my fault. What can I do? I live like a swinish pig. Excuse me, gentlemen, for receiving you in such attire. My boots, as you see, have holes in them. And what may I offer you? Tell me, please. No beating around the bush. We've come to see you on business, said Kostans Hoglo. Here's a purchaser for you, Pavel Ivanovich Chichikov. I'm heartily pleased to meet you. Let me press your hand. Chichikov gave him both. I should very much like, my most esteemed Pavel Ivanovich, to show you an estate worthy of attention. But, gentlemen, allow me to ask, have you had dinner? We have, we have said Kostans Hoglo, wishing to get out of it. Let's not tarry but go right now. In that case, let's go. Klobiev picked up his peaked cap. The visitors put their caps on their heads, and they all set out on foot to look over the estate. Let's go and look at my disorder and dissipation, Klobiev said. Of course, you did well to have your dinner. Would you believe it, Konstantin Fyodorovich? There isn't a chicken in the house. That's what I've come to. I behave like a swine. Just like a swine. He sighed deeply and, as if sensing there would be little sympathy on Konstantin Fyodorovich's part, and that his heart was on the callous side, he took Platonov under the arm and went ahead with him, pressing him close to his breast. Kostans Hoglo and Chichikov remained behind and, taking each other's arm, followed them at a distance. It's hard, Platon Michalik, hard, Klobiev was saying to Platonov. You can't imagine how hard. Moneylessness, breadlessness, bootlessness. It all wouldn't matter a straw to me if I were young and alone. But when all these adversities start breaking over you as you're approaching old age, and there's a wife at your side, and five children. One feels sad, willy-nilly, one feels sad. Platonov was moved to pity. Well, and if you sell the estate, will that set you to rights? He asked. To rights, ha, huh, said Klobiev, waving his hand. It will all go to pay the most necessary debts, and then I won't have even a thousand left for myself. Then what are you going to do? God knows. Klobiev said, shrugging. Platonov was surprised. How is it you don't undertake anything to extricate yourself from such circumstances? What should I undertake? Are there no ways? None. Well, look for a position, take some post, but I'm a provincial secretary. They can't give me any lucrative post. The salary would be tiny, and I have a wife and five children. Well, some private position, then. 
Go and become a steward. But who would entrust an estate to me? I've squandered my own. Well, if you're threatened with starvation and death, you really must undertake something. I'll ask my brother whether he can solicit some position in town through someone. No, Platon Mihailovich, said Klobiev, sighing and squeezing his hand hard. I'm not good for anything now. I became decrepit before my old age, and there's lower back pain on account of my former sins and rheumatism in my shoulder. I'm not up to it. Why squander government money? Even without that there are many who serve for the sake of lucrative posts. God forbid that because of me, because my salary must be paid, the taxes on poorer folk should be raised. It's hard for them as it is with this host of bloodsuckers. No, Platon Mihailovich, forget it. What a fix, thought Platonov. This is worse than my hibernation. Meanwhile, Kostans Hoglo and Chichikov, walking a good distance behind them, were speaking thus with each other. Look how he's let everything go, Kostans Hoglo said, pointing a finger. Drove his mujiks into such poverty. If there's cattle plague, it's no time to look after your own goods. Go and sell what you have, and supply the mujiks with cattle, so that they don't go even for one day without the means of doing their work. But now it would take years to set things right. The mujiks have all grown lazy, drunk, and rowdy. So that means it's not at all profitable to buy such an estate now, asked Chichikov. Here Kostans Hoglo looked at him as if he wanted to say, What an ignoramus you are! Must I start you at the primer level? And profitable. But in three years I'd be getting 20,000 a year from this estate. That's how unprofitable it is. Ten miles away. A trifle. And what land? Just look at the land. It's all water meadows. No, I'd plant flax and produce some 5,000 worth of flax alone. I'd plant turnips and make some 4,000 on turnips. And look over there. Rye is growing on the hillside. It all just seeded itself. He didn't sow rye. I know that. No, this estate's worth a hundred and fifty thousand, not forty. Chichikov began to fear lest Klobiev overhear them, and so he dropped still farther behind. Look how much land he's left waste, Kostans Hoglo was saying, beginning to get angry. At least he should have sent word beforehand. Some volunteers would have trudged over here. Well, if you've got nothing to plow with, then dig a kitchen garden. You'd have a kitchen garden anyway. He forced his mujiks to go without working for four years. A trifle. But that alone is enough to corrupt and ruin them forever. They've already grown used to being ragamuffins and vagabonds. It's already become their way of life. And, having said that, Kostans Hoglo spat. A bilious disposition overshadowed his brow with a D. Our cloud. I cannot stay here any longer. It kills me to look at this disorder and desolation. You can finish it with him on your own now. Quickly take the treasure away from this fool. He only dishonors the divine gift. And, having said this, Kostans Hoglo bade farewell to Chichikov and, catching up with the host, began saying goodbye to him, too. Good gracious, Konstantin Fyodorovich, the surprised host said, you've just come, and home, I can't. It's necessary for me to be at home, Kostans Hoglo said, took his leave, got into his droshky, and drove off. Klobiev seemed to understand the cause of his departure. Konstantin Fyodorovich couldn't stand it, he said. I feel that it's not very cheery for such a proprietor as he to look at such wayward management. Believe me, I cannot, I cannot, Pavel Ivanovich, I sowed almost no grain this year. On my honor, I had no seed, not to mention nothing to plow with. Your brother, Platon Mihailovich, is said to be an extraordinary man. 
and of Konstantin Fyodorovich it goes without saying, S. A. Napoleon of sorts. I often think, in fact, now, why is so much intelligence given to one head? Now, if only one little drop of it could get into my foolish pate, if only so that I could keep my house, I don't know how to do anything, I can't do anything. Ah, Pavel Ivanovich, take it into your care. Most of all I pity the poor mujiks. I feel that I was never able to be, what do you want me to do? I can't be exacting and strict. And how could I get them accustomed to order if I myself am disorderly? I'd set them free right now. But the Russian man is somehow so arranged. He somehow can't do without being prodded. He'll just fall asleep. He'll just get moldy. That is indeed strange, said Platonov. Why is it that with us? Unless you keep a close eye on the simple man. He turns into a drunkard and a scoundrel. Lack of education observed Chichikov. Well, God knows about that. We were educated, and how do we live? I went to the university and listened to lectures in all fields. Yet not only did I not learn the art and order of living, but it seems I learned best the art of spending more money on various new refinements and comforts, and became better acquainted with the objects for which one needs money. Is it because there was no sense in my studies? Not really. It's the same with my other comrades. Maybe two or three of them derived something truly useful for themselves from it, and maybe that was because they were intelligent to begin with, but the rest only tried to learn what's bad for one's health and fritters away one's money. By God, we went and studied only so as to applaud the professors, to hand them out awards, and not to receive anything from them. And so we choose from education that which, after all, is on the mean side. We snatch the surface, but the thing itself we don't take. No, Pavel Ivanovich, it's because of something else that we don't know how to live, but what it is, by God, I don't know. There must be reasons, said Chichikov. Poor Klobiev sighed deeply and spoke thus. Sometimes, really, it seems to me that the Russian is somehow a hopeless man. There's no willpower in him, no courage for constancy. You want to do everything, and can do nothing. You keep thinking. Starting tomorrow you'll begin a new life. Starting tomorrow you'll begin doing everything as you ought to. Starting tomorrow you'll go on a diet. Not a bit of it. By the evening of that same day you overeat so much that you just blink your eyes and can't move your tongue. You sit like an owl staring at everybody, and it's the same with everything. One needs a supply of reasonableness, said Chichikov. One must consult one's reasonableness every moment, conduct a friendly conversation with it. Come, now, said Klobiev. Really? It seems to me that we're not born for reasonableness at all. I don't believe any of us is reasonable. If I see that someone is even living decently, collecting money and putting it aside, I still don't believe it. When he's old, the devil will have his way with him. He'll blow it all at once. We're all the same. Noblemen and mujiks, educated and uneducated. There was one clever mujik made a hundred thousand out of nothing, and, once he'd made the hundred thousand, he got the crazy idea of taking a bath in champagne. So he took a bath in champagne. But I think we've looked it all over. There isn't any more. Unless you want to glance at the mill? It has no wheel, however, and the building is good for nothing. Then why look at it? said Chichikov. In that case, let's go home and they all turned their steps towards the house. The views were all the same on the way back. Untidy disorder kept showing its ugly appearance everywhere. Everything was unmended and untended. Only a new puddle had got itself added to the middle of the street. An angry woman in greasy sackcloth was beating a poor girl half to death and cursing all devils up and down. Two mujiks stood at a distance. 
gazing with stoic indifference at the drunken wench's wrath. One was scratching his behind, the other was yawning. Yawning was evident in the buildings as well. The roofs were also yawning. Platonov, looking at them, yawned. My future property, my muzhiks, thought Chichikov, hole upon hole and patch upon patch and, indeed, on one of the cottages a whole gate had been put in place of the roof, the fallen, in windows were propped with laths filched from the master's barn. In short, it seemed that the system of Trishka's Captain 5 has been introduced. Into the management, the cuffs and skirts were cut off to patch the elbows. They went into the house. Chichikov was rather struck by the mixture of destitution with some glittering knickknacks of the latest luxury. Amid tattered utensils and furnishings, new bronze. Some Shakespeare was sitting on an inkstand. A fashionable ivory hand for scratching one's own back lay on the table. Clobeve introduced the mistress of the house, his wife. She was top-notch. Even in Moscow she would have shown herself well. She was dressed fashionably, with taste. She preferred talking about the town and the theater that was being started there. Everything made it obvious that she liked the country even less than did her husband, and that she yawned more than Platonov when she was left alone. Soon the room was full of children, girls and boys. There were five of them. A sixth was carried in. They were all beautiful. The boys and girls were a joy to behold. They were dressed prettily and with taste, were cheerful and frisky, and that made it all the sadder to look at them. It would have been better if they had been dressed poorly, in skirts and shorts of simple ticking, running around in the yard, no different in any way from peasant children. A visitor came to call on the mistress. The ladies went to their half of the house. The children ran after them. The men were left by themselves. Chichikov began the purchase. As is customary with all purchasers, he started by running down the estate he was purchasing. And, having run it down on all sides, he said, What, then, will your price be, do you know, said Clobeef. I'm not going to ask a high price from you. I don't like that. It would also be unscrupulous on my part. Nor will I conceal from you that of the hundred souls registered on the census lists of my estate. Not even fifty are actually there. The rest either died of epidemics or absented themselves without passports, so you ought to count them as dead. And therefore I ask you for only thirty thousand in all. And come, now, thirty thousand. The estate is neglected, people have died. And you want thirty thousand. Take twenty-five. Pavel Ivanovich. I could mortgage it for twenty-five thousand. You see? Then I'd get the twenty-five thousand and the estate would stay mine. I'm selling only because I need money quickly and mortgaging means red tape. I'd have to pay the clerks and I have nothing to pay them. Well, take the twenty-five thousand anyway. Platonov felt ashamed for Chichikov. Buy it, Pavel Ivanovich, he said. Any estate is worth that price. If you won't give thirty thousand for it, my brother and I will get together and buy it. Chichikov got frightened. All right, he said. I'll pay you thirty thousand. Here, I'll give you two thousand now as a deposit, eight thousand in a week, and the remaining twenty thousand in a month. No, Pavel Ivanovich. Only on condition that I get the money as soon as possible. Give me at least fifteen thousand now, and the rest no later than two weeks from now. But I don't have fifteen thousand. I have only ten thousand now. Let me get it together. In other words, Chichikov was lying. He had twenty thousand. No, Pavel Ivanovich, if you please. I tell you that I must have fifteen thousand. But, really, I'm short five thousand. I don't know where to get it myself. I'll lend it to you. Platonov picked up. Perhaps then, said Chichikov, and he thought to himself, quite opportune, however, that he should lend it to me. 
In that case, I can bring it tomorrow. The chest was brought in from the carriage, and ten thousand were taken from it for Clobeve. The remaining five were promised for the next day. Promised? Yes, but the intention was to bring three. And the rest later, in two or three days, and if possible, to delay a bit longer still. Pavel Ivanovich somehow especially disliked letting money leave his hands. And if there was an extreme necessity, still it seemed better to him to hand over the money tomorrow and not today. That is, he acted as we all do. We enjoy showing the petitioner the door. Let him cool his heels in the anteroom, as if he couldn't wait. What do we care that every hour, perhaps, is dear to him, and his affairs are suffering for it? Come tomorrow, brother. Today I somehow have no time. And where are you going to live afterwards? Platonov asked Klobief. Have you got another little estate? No little estate, but I'll move to town. That had to be done in any case, not for ourselves but for the children. They'll need teachers of catechism, music, dance. One can't get that in the country. Not a crust of bread. And he wants to teach his children to dance, thought Chichikov. Strange, thought Platonov. Well, we must drink to the deal, said Klobief. Hey, Kiryushka, bring us a bottle of champagne, brother. Not a crust of bread. Yet he's got champagne, thought Chichikov. Platonov did not know what to think. The champagne was brought. They drank three glasses each and got quite merry. Klobiev relaxed and became intelligent and charming. Witticisms and anecdotes poured ceaselessly from him. There turned out to be much knowledge of life and the world in his talk. He saw many things so well and so correctly. He sketched his neighboring landowners in a few words, so aptly and so cleverly, saw so clearly everyone's defects and mistakes, knew so well the story of the ruined gentry, why and how, and for what reason they had been ruined, was able to convey so originally and aptly their smallest habits that the two men were totally enchanted by his talk and were ready to acknowledge him a most intelligent man. Listen, said Platonov, seizing his hand, how is it that with such intelligence, experience, and knowledge of life, you cannot find ways of getting out of your difficult position? Oh, there are ways, said Klobiev, and forthwith unloaded on them a whole heap of projects. They were all so absurd, so strange, so little consequent upon a knowledge of people and the world, that it remained only to shrug one's shoulders and say, Good Lord, what an infinite distance there is between knowledge of the world and the ability to use that knowledge. Almost all the projects were based on the need for suddenly procuring a hundred or two hundred thousand somewhere. Then, it seemed to him, Everything could be arranged properly, and the management would get underway, and all the holes would be patched, and the income would be quadrupled, and it would be possible for him to repay all his debts. And he would end with the words, But what do you want me to do? There simply is no such benefactor as would decide to lend me two hundred, or at least one hundred thousand. Clearly, God is against it. What else thought Chichikov? As if God would send such a fool two hundred thousand. There is this aunt of mine who's good for three million, said Klobiev. A pious little old lady. She gives to churches and monasteries, but she's a bit tight about helping her neighbor. And she's a very remarkable little old lady. An aunt from olden times, worth having a look at. She has some four hundred canaries alone. Lapdogs and lady companions and servants such as don't exist nowadays. The youngest of her servants is about sixty, though she shouts hey, boy, to him. If a guest behaves improperly somehow, she orders him bypassed one course at dinner. And they actually do it. Platonov laughed. And what is her last name? And where does she live? 
asked Chichikov. She lives here in town, Alexandra Ivanovna Konosarova. Why don't you turn to her? Platonov said sympathetically. It seems to me, if she just entered a little more into the situation of your family, she'd be unable to refuse you, however tight she is. Ah, uh, no, quite able. My aunt has a hard character. This little old lady is a rock, Platon Michalik, and there are already enough toadies hanging around her without me. There's one there who is after a governorship, foisted himself off as her relative. God help him. Maybe he'll succeed. God help them all. I never knew how to fawn, and now less than ever. My back doesn't bend anymore. Fool, thought Chichikov. I'd look after such an aunt like a nanny looking after a child. Well now, such talk makes one dry, said Klobiev. Hey, Kiryushka, bring us another bottle of champagne. No, no, I won't drink any more, said Platonov. Nor I, said Chichikov. And they both declined resolutely. Then at least give me your word that you'll visit me in town. On the 8th of June, I'm giving a dinner for our town dignitaries. For pity's sake, exclaimed Platonov. In this situation, completely ruined, and still giving dinners, what can I do? I must. It's my duty, said Klobiev. They've also invited me. What's to be done with him, thought Platonov. He still did not know that in Russia, in Moscow and other cities, there are such wizards to be found, whose life is an inexplicable riddle. He seems to have spent everything, is up to his ears in debt, has no resources anywhere, and the dinner that is being given promises to be the last. And the diners think that by the next day the host will be dragged off to prison. Ten years pass after that. The wizard is still holding out in the world, is up to his ears in debt more than ever and still gives a dinner in the same way. And everybody thinks it will be the last, and everybody is sure that the next day the host will be dragged off to prison. Klobiev was such a wizard. Only in Russia can one exist in such a way. Having nothing, he welcomed visitors, gave parties, and even patronized and encouraged. D. All sorts of actors passing through town, boarded them and lodged them in his house. If someone were to peek into the house he had in town, he would never know who the owner was. One day a priest investment served a moly bin six there. The next day French actors were having a rehearsal. Once someone unknown to nearly everyone in the house installed himself in the drawing room with his papers and set up an office there. Without embarrassing or troubling anyone in the house, as if it were an ordinary thing. Sometimes there was not a crumb in the house for whole days, and sometimes such dinners were given as would satisfy the taste of the most refined gastronome. The host would appear festive, gay, with the bearing of a wealthy gentleman, with the step of a man whose life is spent amid ease and plenty. At times, on the other hand, there were such hard moments that someone else in his place would have hanged or shot himself. But he was saved by a religious sense, which was strangely combined in him with his wayward life. In these hard, bitter moments he would open a book and read the lives of those toil. Heirs and sufferers who trained their spirit to rise above sufferings and misfortunes. His soul softened at such times, his spirit became tender and his eyes filled with tears. And, strange thing, at such moments unexpected help would always come to him from somewhere. Either one of his old friends would remember him and send him money. Or some unknown lady traveler, chancing to hear his story, would, with the impetuous magnanimity of a woman's heart, send him a generous donation. Or some lawsuit, of which he had never heard, would be one in his favor. With reverence, with gratitude, he would then acknowledge the boundless mercy of providence, have a moly bin of thanksgiving served, and again begin his wayward life.
I'm sorry for him. Really, I am, Platonov said to Chichikov, when, after saying goodbye, they left him. A prodigal son, said Chichikov. There's no point in being sorry for such people. And soon they both stopped thinking about him. Platonov, because he looked upon people's situations lazily and half sleepily, just as upon everything else in the world. His heart commiserated and was wrung at the sight of others suffering, but the impression somehow did not get deeply impressed on his soul. He did not think about Klobiev, because he also did not think about himself. Chichikov did not think about Klobiev, because all his thoughts were taken up with the acquired property. He counted, calculated, and figured out all the profits of the purchased estate. And however he considered it, whichever side of the deal he looked at, he saw that the purchase was in any case profitable. He might do it in such a way that the estate got mortgaged. He might do it in such a way that only the dead and the runaways got mortgaged. He could also do it so that all the best parts were sold off first, and only then mortgage it. He could also arrange it so that he himself managed the estate and became a landowner after the fashion of Costan's Hoglo, drawing on his advice as a neighbor and benefactor. He could even do it in such a way that the estate was resold into private hands, if he did not feel like managing it himself, of course, and keep the runaway and dead ones for himself. Then another profit presented itself. He could slip away from those parts altogether without paying this Costan's Hoglo the borrowed money. In short, whichever way he turned the deal, he saw that in any case the purchase was profitable. He felt pleasure. Pleasure at having now become a landowner. Not a fantastic landowner, but a real one. A landowner who already had land and forests and people. Not dream people who dwell in imagination, but existing ones. And gradually he began hopping up and down, and rubbing his hands and humming and mumbling, and he trumpeted out some march on his fist, putting it to his lips like a trumpet, and even uttered several encouraging words and appellations for himself, in the genre of snookums and sweetie pie. But then, remembering that he was not alone, he suddenly quieted down and tried to stifle somehow this immoderate fit of inspiration. And when Platonov, taking some of these sounds for speech addressed to him, asked him, What? He replied, Nothing. Only here, looking around him, did he notice that they were driving through a beautiful grove. A comely fence of birches stretched to right and left of them. Between the trees flashed a white stone church. At the end of the street a gentleman appeared, coming to meet them, in a peaked cap, with a knobby stick in his hand. A sleek English hound was running on long legs in front of him. Stop, Platonov said to the coachman, and jumped out of the carriage. Chichikov also got out of the carriage behind him. They went on foot to meet the gentleman. Yarb had already managed to exchange kisses with the English hound, with whom he had obviously been long acquainted, because he offered his fat muzzle indifferently to receive a lively kiss from Azor. So the English hound was called, the frisky hound named Azor, having kissed Yarb, ran up to Platonov, licked his hands with his frisky tongue, leaped up at Chichikov's chest intending to lick his lips, did not make it and, having been pushed away, ran again to Platonov to try at least to lick him on the ear. Platon and the gentleman who was coming to meet them came together at that moment and embraced each other. For pity's sake, brother Platon, what are you doing to me? The gentleman asked animatedly. What do you mean? Platon replied indifferently. What, indeed? For three days not a word. Not a peep from you. The stable boy brought your horse from Patuk. He went off with some gentleman, he said. Well, sinward at least. Where, why, and how long? For pity's sake, brother, 
How could you do such a thing? God knows what I've been thinking all these days. Well, what can I do? I forgot, said Platonov. We stopped at Konstantin Fyodorovich's. He sends his respects to you, and sister does, too. Allow me to introduce Pavel Ivanovich Chichikov. Pavel Ivanovich, my brother Vasily. I beg you to love him as you do me. Brother Vasily and Chichikov took off their caps and kissed each other. Who might this Chichikov be? thought Brother Vasily. Brother Platon isn't fastidious about his acquaintances. He certainly did not find out what sort of man he is. And he looked Chichikov over as far as decency allowed, and saw that he was standing with his head slightly inclined, and had an agreeable look on his face. For his part, Chichikov also looked Brother Vasily over as far as decency allowed. He was shorter than Platon, his hair was darker, and his face far less handsome. But in the features of his face there was much life and animation. One could see that he did not dwell in drowsiness and hibernation. You know what I've decided, Vasily, Brother Platon said. What? asked Vasily. To take a trip around Holy Russia with Pavel Ivanovich here. It may just loosen and limber up my spleen. How did you decide so suddenly? Vasily started to say seriously perplexed by such a decision, and he almost added, and, what's more, think of going with a man you've never seen before, who may be trash or devil knows what, and, filled with mistrust, he began studying Chichikov out of the corner of his eye, and saw that he behaved with extraordinary decency, keeping his head agreeably inclined a bit to one side and with the same respectfully cordial expression on his face, so that there was no way of knowing what sort of man Chichikov was. Silently the three of them walked down the road, to the left of which there was a white stone church flashing among the trees, and to the right the buildings of the master's house, which were also beginning to appear among the trees. At last the gates appeared. They entered the courtyard where stood the old manor house under its high roof. Two enormous lindens growing in the middle of the courtyard covered almost half of it with their shade. Through their low-hanging, bushy branches the walls of the house barely flickered from behind. Under the lindens stood several long benches. Brother Vasily invited Chichikov to be seated. Chichikov sat down, and Platonov sat down. The whole courtyard was filled with the fragrance of flowering lilacs and bird cherry, which, hanging from the garden into the yard on all sides over the very pretty birch fence that surrounded it, looked like a flowering chain or a bead necklace crowning it. An adroit and deft lad of about seventeen, in a handsome pink cotton shirt, brought and set down before them carafes of water, and a variety of many-colored kvasses that fizzed like lemonade. Having set the carafes down before them, he went over to a tree and, taking the hoe that was leaning against it, went to the garden. All the household serfs of the Platonov brothers worked in the garden. All the servants were gardeners. Or, better, there were no servants. But the gardeners sometimes performed their duties. Brother Vasily always maintained that one could do without servants. Anyone can bring anything, and it was not worth having a special class of people for that. The Russian man is good, efficient, handsome, nimble, and hardworking only as long as he goes about in a shirt and homespun jacket. But as soon as he gets into a German frock coat, he becomes awkward, uncomely, inefficient, and lazy. He maintained that he keeps himself clean only so long as he wears a shirt and homespun jacket, but as soon as he gets into a German frock coat, he stops changing his shirt, does not go to the bathhouse, sleeps in the frock coat, and under it breeds bedbugs, fleas, and devil knows what. In this he may even have been right. 
The people on their estate dressed somehow especially neatly in Natalie, and one would have had to go far to find such handsome shirts and jackets. Would you care for some refreshment? Brother Vasily said to Chichikov, pointing to the carafes. These are kvases of our own making. Our house has long been famous for them. Chichikov poured a glass from the first carafe, just like the linden mead he used to drink in Poland, bubbly as champagne, and it went in a pleasant fizz right up his nose. Nectar, said Chichikov. He drank a glass from another carafe. Even better. In what direction and to what places are you thinking mainly of going? Brother Vasily asked. I'm going, said Chichikov, rubbing his knee with his hand to accompany the slight rocking of his whole body and inclining his head to one side. Not so much on my own necessity as on another man's. General Betrashev, a close friend and, one might say, benefactor, has asked me to visit his relatives. Relatives, of course, are relatives, but it is partly, so to speak, for my own sake as well. For, to say nothing of the benefit in the hemorrhoidal respect, to see the world and the circulation of people, is already in itself, so to speak, a living book and a second education. Brother Vasily lapsed into thought. The man speaks somewhat ornately, but there's truth in his words, he thought. My brother Platon lacks knowledge of people, the world, and life. After a short silence, he spoke aloud thus, I am beginning to think, Platon, that a journey may indeed stir you up. Your mind is hibernating. You've simply fallen asleep, and you've fallen asleep not from satiety or fatigue, but from a lack of living impressions and sensations. I, for instance, am quite the contrary. I'd very much like not to feel so keenly and not to take so closely to heart all that happens. Who makes you take it all so closely to heart, said Platon. You seek out worries and invent anxieties for yourself. Why invent? If there are troubles at every step even without that, said Vasily. Have you heard what trick Linitsyn has played on us? He's appropriated the wasteland where our people celebrate Krishnaya Gorka. Seven, he doesn't know. So he seized it, said Platon. The man's new here, just come from Petersburg. He must be told, and have it explained to him. He knows, he knows very well. I sent to tell him, but he responded with rudeness. You must go yourself and explain it. Have a personal talk with him. Ah, no. He puts on too many airs. I won't go to him. You can go if you like. I go, but I don't want to mix in it. He may deceive me and swindle me. I'll go if you like, said Chichikov. Vasily glanced at him and thought, he loves going places, this one. Just give me an idea of what sort of man he is, said Chichikov, and what it's about. I'm ashamed to charge you with such an unpleasant mission because merely to talk with such a man is already an unpleasant mission for me. I must tell you that he is from simple, petty landowning nobility of our province, got his rank serving in Petersburg, set himself up somehow by marrying someone's illegitimate daughter, and puts on airs. He sets the tone here. But, thank God, in our province people aren't so stupid. For us fashion is no order and Petersburg is no church. Of course, said Chichikov, and what is it about? It's nonsense, in fact. He hasn't got enough land, so he appropriated our wasteland. That is, he reckoned that it wasn't needed and that the owners had forgotten about it, but it so happens that from time immemorial our peasants have gathered there to celebrate Krishnaya Gorka. For that reason, I... Am better prepared to sacrifice other, better land than to give up this peace. Custom is sacred to me. So you're prepared to let him have other land. I would have been, if he hadn't acted this way with me. But he wants, as I can see, to do it through the courts. Very well, we'll see who wins. Though it's not so clear on the map, there are still witnesses. 
Old People Who Are Living and Who Remember. H.M. Thought Chichikov. I see they're both a bit off. And he said aloud, But it seems to me that the business can be handled peaceably. Everything depends on the mediator. In writ, it, that for you yourself it would also be very profitable to transfer, to my name, for instance, all the dead souls registered on your estates in the last census lists, so that I pay the tax on them. And to avoid causing any offense, you can perform the transfer through a deed of purchase, as if the souls were alive. Well, now, Lenitsyn thought, this is something most strange. And he even pushed his chair back, so entirely puzzled he was. I have no doubts that you will agree entirely to this, Chichikov said, because this is entirely the same sort of thing we've just been talking about. It'll be completed between solid people and private, and there'll be no offense to anyone. What to do here? Lenitsyn found himself in a difficult position. He could never have foreseen that an opinion he had just formulated would be so quickly brought to realization. The offer was highly unexpected. Of course, there could be no harm for anyone in this action. The landowners would mortgage these souls anyway, the same as living ones, so there could be no loss for the treasury. The difference was that they would all be in one hand rather than in several. But all the same he was at a loss. He knew the law and was a businessman, a businessman in a good sense. He would not decide a case unjustly for any bribe. But here he hesitated, not knowing what name to give to this action. Was it right or wrong? If someone else had addressed him with such an offer, he would have said, This is nonsense. Trifles. I have no wish to fool around or play with dolls. But he liked his guests so much, they agreed on so many things with regard to the success of education and learning. How could he refuse? Lenitsyn found himself in a most difficult position. But at that moment, just as if to help him in his woe, the young, pug-nosed mistress, Lenitsyn's wife, came into the room, pale, thin, small, and dressed tastefully, like all Petersburg ladies. Following her came a nurse carrying a baby in her arms, the firstborn fruit of the tender love of the recently married couple. Chichikov naturally approached the lady at once and, to say nothing of the proper greeting, simply by the agreeable inclining of his head to one side, disposed her greatly in his favor. Then he ran over to the baby. The baby burst into howls. Nevertheless, by means of the words, Goo, goo, darling, and by flicking his fingers and the carnelian seal on his watch chain, Chichikov managed to lure him into his arms. Taking him into his arms, he started tossing him up, thereby provoking the baby's pleasant smile, which made both parents very happy. Whether from pleasure or from something else, the baby suddenly misbehaved. Lenitsyn's wife cried out, Ah, my God, he spoiled your whole tailcoat. Chichikov looked. The sleeve of the brand new tailcoat was all spoiled. Blast it, the cursed little devil. He muttered vexedly to himself. The host, the hostess, and the nurse all ran to fetch some eau de cologne. They began wiping him on all sides. It's nothing, nothing at all, Chichikov was saying. What can an innocent baby do? At the same time thinking to himself, and so well aimed, the cursed little canal. A golden age, he said when he was well wiped off and the agreeable expression had returned to his face again. And indeed, the host said, addressing Chichikov, also with an agreeable smile. What can be more enviable than the age of infancy? No cares, no thoughts of the future. A state one would immediately exchange for one's own, said Chichikov. At a glance, said Lenitsyn, but it seems they were both lying. Had they been offered such an exchange, they would straightaway have backed out of it. And what fun is it, 
indeed, sitting in a nurse's arms and spoiling tailcoats. The young mistress and the firstborn withdrew with the nurse, because something on him had to be put right. Having rewarded Chichikov, he had not forgotten himself either. This apparently insignificant circumstance won the host over completely to satisfying Chichikov. How, indeed, refuse a guest who has been so tender to his little one and paid for it magnanimously with his own tailcoat? Lenitsyn reflected thus. Why, indeed, not fulfill his request, if such is his wish? One word is illegible in the manuscript. Trans. Two pages are missing from the manuscript. Trans. The rest of the chapter is missing from the manuscript. Trans. One of the later chapters at the very moment when Chichikov, in a new Persian dressing gown of gold satin, sprawling on the sofa, was bargaining with an itinerant smuggler merchant of Jewish extraction and German enunciation, and before them already lay a purchased piece of the foremost Holland shirt linen and two pasteboard boxes with excellent soap of first-rate quality, this was precisely the soap he used to acquire at the Radziwill Customs. It indeed had the property of imparting an amazing tenderness and whiteness to the cheeks. At the moment when he, as a connoisseur, was buying these products necessary for a cultivated man, there came the rumble of a carriage driving up, echoed by a slight reverberation of the windows and walls, and in walked His Excellency Alexei Ivanovich Lenitsyn. I lay it before Your Excellency's judgment. What linen, what soap, and how about this little thing I bought yesterday? At which Chichikov put on his head a skullcap embroidered with gold and beads, and acquired the look of a Persian shah, filled with dignity and majesty. But His Excellency, without answering the question, said with a worried look, I must talk with you about an important matter. One could see by his face that he was upset. The worthy merchant of German enunciation was sent out at once, and they were left alone. Do you know what trouble is brewing? They found another will of the old woman's, made five years ago. Half of the estate goes to the monastery, and the other half is divided equally between the two wards, and nothing to anyone else. Chichikov was dumbfounded. Well, that will is nonsense. It means nothing, it is annulled by the second one. But it's not stated in the second will that it annuls the first. It goes without saying. The second annuls the first. The first will is totally worthless. I know the will of the deceased woman very well. I was with her. Who signed it? Who were the witnesses? It was certified in the proper manner, in court. The witnesses were the former probate judge Bermelov and Kavanov. That's bad, thought Chichikov. They say Kavanov's an honest man. Bermelov is an old hypocrite, reads the epistle in church on feast days. Nonsense, nonsense, he said aloud, and at once felt himself prepared for any trick. I know better. I shared the deceased woman's last minutes. I'm informed better than anyone. I'm ready to testify personally under oath. These words and his resoluteness set Lenitsyn at ease for the moment. He was very worried and had already begun to suspect the possibility of some fabrication on Chichikov's part with regard to the will. Now he reproached himself for his suspicions. The readiness to testify under oath was clear proof that Chichikov was innocent. We do not know whether Pavel Ivanovich would have had the courage to swear on the Bible, but he did have the courage to say it. Rest assured. I'll discuss the matter with several lawyers. There's nothing here that needs doing on your part. You must stay out of it entirely. And I can now live in town as long as I like. Chichikov straight away ordered the carriage readied and went to see a lawyer. This lawyer was a man of extraordinary experience. For 15 years he had been on trial himself, but he had managed so that it was quite impossible to remove him from his post. Everyone knew him, 
and knew that he ought to have been sent into exile six times over for his deeds. There were suspicions of him all around and on every side, yet it was impossible to present any clear and proven evidence. Here there was indeed something mysterious, and he might have been boldly recogni. Zed is a sorcerer if the story we are telling belong to the times of ignorance. The lawyer struck him with the coldness of his looks and the greasiness of his dressing gown. In complete contrast to the good mahogany furniture, the golden clock under its glass case, the chandelier visible through the muslin cover protecting it, and generally to everything around him, which bore the vivid stamp of brilliant European cultivation. Not hindered, however, by the lawyer's skeptical appearance, Chichikov explained the difficult points of the matter and depicted in alluring perspective the gratitude necessarily consequent upon good counsel and concern. To this the lawyer responded by depicting the uncertainty of all earthly things and artfully alluded to the fact that two birds in the bush meant nothing, and what was needed was one in the hand. There was no help for it. He had to give him the bird in the hand. The philosopher's skeptical coldness suddenly vanished. He turned out to be a most good-natured man, most talkative and most agreeable in his talk, not inferior to Chichikov himself in the adroitness of his manners. If I may, instead of starting a long case, you probably did not examine the will very well. There's probably some sort of little addition. Take it home for a while. Though, of course, it's prohibited to take such things home. Still, if you ask certain officials nicely, I, for my part, will exercise my concern. I see, thought Chichikov, and he said, in fact, I really don't remember very well whether there was a little addition or not, as if he had not written the will himself. You'd best look into that. However, in any case, he continued good-naturedly, always be calm and don't be put out by anything, even if something worse happens. Don't despair of anything ever. There are no incorrigible cases. Look at me. I'm always calm. Whatever mishaps are imputed to me, my calm is imperturbable. The face of the lawyer philosopher indeed preserved an extraordinary calm, so that Chichikov was greatly. Of course, that's the first thing, he said. Admit, however, that there may be such cases and matters, such matters and such calumnies on the part of one's enemies, and such difficult situations that all calm flies away. Believe me, that is pusillanimity, the philosopher-jurist replied very calmly and good-naturedly. Only make sure that the case is all based on documents, that nothing is merely verbal. And as soon as you see that the case is reaching a denouement and can conveniently be resolved, make sure, not really to justify and defend yourself, no but simply to confuse things by introducing new and even unrelated issues. You mean, so as, to confuse, to confuse, nothing more, the philosopher replied, to introduce into the case some other, unrelated circumstances that will entangle other people in it, to make it complicated, nothing more, and then let some Petersburg official come and sort it out. Let him sort it out, just let him, he repeated, looking into Chichikov's eyes with extraordinary pleasure, the way a teacher looks into his pupil's eyes while explaining some fascinating point in Russian grammar. Yes, good. If one picks circumstances capable of blowing smoke in people's eyes, said Chichikov, also looking with pleasure into the philosopher's eyes like a pupil who has understood the fascinating point explained by his teacher. They'll get picked. The circumstances will get picked. Believe me, frequent exercise makes the head resourceful. Above all remember that you're going to be helped. In a complicated case there's gain for many. More officials are needed, and more pay for them. In short, 
More people must be drawn into the case. Never mind that some of them will get into it for no reason. It's easier for them to justify themselves. They have to respond to the documents to pay themselves off. So there's bread in it. Believe me, as soon as circumstances get critical, the first thing to do is confuse. One can get it so confused, so entangled, that no one can understand anything. Why am I calm? Because I know. If my affairs get worse, I'll entangle them all in it. The governor, the vice governor, the police chief, and the magistrate. I'll get them all entangled. I know all their circumstances. Who's angry with whom, and who's pouting at whom, and who wants to lock up whom. Let them disentangle themselves later, but while they do, others will have time to make their own gains. The crayfish thrives in troubled waters. Everyone's waiting to entangle everything. Here, the jurist philosopher looked into Chichikov's eyes again with that delight with which the teacher explains to the pupil a still more fascinating point in Russian grammar. No, the man is indeed a wizard. Chichikov thought to himself, and he parted from the lawyer in a most excellent and most agreeable state of mind. Having been completely reassured and reinforced, he threw himself back on the springy cushions of the carriage with careless adroitness, ordered Selifan to take the top down. As he went to the lawyer, he had the top up and even the apron buttoned, and settled exactly like a retired colonel of the hussars. Or Vishnapokromov himself, adroitly tucking one leg under the other, turning his face agreeably towards passers-by, beaming from under the new silk hat cocked slightly over one ear, Selifan was ordered to proceed in the direction of the shopping arcade. Merchants, both itinerant and aboriginal, standing at the doors of their shops, reverently took their hats off, and Chichikov. Not without dignity, raised his own in response. Many of them were already known to him. Others, though itinerant, being charmed by the adroit air of this gentleman, who knew how to bear himself, greeted him like an acquaintance. The fair in the town of Fuislavl was never ending. After the horse fair and the agricultural fair were over. There came the fair of luxury goods for gentlefolk of high cultivation. The merchants who came on wheels planned to go home not otherwise than on sleds. Welcome, sir. Welcome. A German frock coat made in Moscow kept saying, outside a fabric shop, posing courteously, his head uncovered, his hat in his outstretched hand, just barely holding two fingers to his round. Glabrous chin, and with an expression of cultivated finesse on his face, Chichikov went into the shop. Show me your little fabrics, my most gentle sir. The propitious merchant at once lifted the removable board in the counter and, having thereby made a passage for himself, wound up inside the shop, his back to his goods, his face to the buyer, standing back to his goods and face to the buyer. The merchant of the bare head and the outstretched hat greeted Chichikov once again. Then he put his hat on and, leaning forward agreeably, his two arms resting on the counter, spoke thus: "What sort of cloth, sir? Of English manufacture, or do you prefer domestic? Domestic," said Chichikov, "only precisely of that best sort known as English cloth. What colors would you prefer?" Inquired the merchant, still swaying agreeably with his two arms resting on the counter. Dark colors, olive or bottle green, with flecks tending, so to speak, towards cranberry. Said Chichikov, "I may say that you will get the foremost sort, of which there is none better in either capital." The merchant said as he hoisted himself to the upper shelf to get the bolt. He flung it down adroitly onto the counter, unrolled it from the other end, and held it to the light. What play, sir? The most fashionable, the latest taste. The cloth gleamed like silk. 
the merchant could smell that there stood before him a connoisseur of fabrics, and he did not wish to begin with the ten-ruble sort. Decent enough, said Chichikov, stroking it lightly. But I tell you what, my worthy man, show me at once the one you save for last. And there should be more of that color. Those flecks, those red flecks? I understand, sir. You truly want the color that is now becoming fashionable in Petersburg. I have cloth of the most excellent properties. I warn you that the price is high, but so is the quality. Let's have it. Not a word about the price. The bolt fell from above. The merchant unrolled it with still greater art, grasping the other end and unrolling it like silk, offered it to Chichikov, so that he would have the opportunity not only of examining it, but even of smelling it, and merely said, Here's the fabric, sir. The colors of the smoke and flame of Navarino. Eight the price was agreed upon. The iron yardstick, like a magician's wand, meted out enough for Chichikov's tailcoat and trousers. Having snipped it a little with his scissors, the merchant performed with both hands the deft tearing of the fabric across its whole width, and on finishing bowed to Chichikov with the most seductive agreeableness. The fabric was straightaway folded and deftly wrapped in paper. The package twirled under the light string. Chichikov was just going to his pocket when he felt his waist being pleasantly encircled by someone's very delicate arm, and his ears heard, what are you buying here, my most respected friend? Ah, what a pleasantly unexpected meeting, said Chichikov. A pleasant encounter, said the voice of the same man who had encircled his waist. It was Vishnapokromov. I was prepared to pass by the shop without paying any attention, when suddenly I saw a familiar face. How can one deny oneself an agreeable pleasure? There's no denying the fabrics are incomparably better this year. It's a shame and a disgrace. I simply couldn't find. Thirty rubles, forty rubles I'm prepared to. Ask even fifty. But give me something good. I say either one has something that is really of the most excellent quality, or it's better not to have it at all. Right? Absolutely right, said Chichikov. Why work? If it's not so as to have something really good, show me some moderate-priced fabrics. A voice came from behind that seemed familiar to Chichikov. He turned around. It was Klobiev. By all tokens he was buying fabric not merely on a whim, for his wretched frock coat was quite worn out. Ah, Pavel Ivanovich, allow me to speak with you at last. One can't find you anymore. I came by several times, you're always out. My esteemed friend, I've been so busy that, by God, I've had no time. He looked around, hoping to elude explanations, and saw Murazov coming into the shop. A fantasy Vasilyevich. Ah, my God, said Chichikov. What a pleasant encounter, and Vishnapokromov repeated after him. A fantasy Vasilyevich, and Klobiev repeated, a fantasy Vasilyevich, and lastly, the well-bred merchant, having carried his hat as far away from his head as his arm permitted, and all of him thrust forward, pronounced, to a fantasy Vasilyevich, our humblest respects. Their faces were stamped with that dog-like servility that is rendered unto millionaires by the dog-like race of men. The old man exchanged bows with them all and turned directly to Clobeve. Excuse me. I saw you from far off going into the shop and decided to trouble you. If you're free afterwards and my house is not out of your way, kindly stop by for a short while. I must have a talk with you. Clobeve said, very well, a fantasy Vasilyevich. What wonderful weather we're having, a fantasy Vasilyevich, said Chichikov. Isn't that so, a fantasy Vasilyevich, Vishnapokromov picked up, it's extraordinary. Yes, sir, thank God, it's not bad. But we need a bit of rain for the crops. 
We do very much, said Vishnapokromov. It would even be good for the hunting. Yes, a bit of rain wouldn't hurt, said Chichikov, who did not need any rain, but felt it so pleasant to agree with a man who had a million. And the old man, having bowed to them all again, walked out. My head simply spins, said Chichikov. When I think that this man has ten million, it's simply impossible. It's not a rightful thing, though, said Vishnapokromov. Capital shouldn't be in one man's hands. That's even the subject of treatises now all over Europe. You have money. So, share it with others. Treat people, give balls, produce beneficent luxury, which gives bread to the artisans, the master craftsmen. This I am unable to understand, said Chichikov. Ten million. And he lives like a simple mujik. With ten million, one could do devil knows what. It could be so arranged that you wouldn't have any other company than generals and princes. Yes, sir, the merchant added. With all his respectable qualities, there's much uncultivatedness in a fantasy Vasilyevich. If a merchant is respectable, he's no longer a merchant. He's already in a certain way a negotiant. I've got to take a box in the theater, then, and I'll never marry my daughter to a mere colonel. No, sir, I won't marry her to anything but a general. What's a colonel to me? My dinner's got to be provided by a confectioner. Not just any cook. What's there to talk about? For pity's sake, said Vishnapokromov. What can one not do with ten million? Give me ten million. You'll see what I'll do. No, thought Chichikov. You won't do much that's sensible with ten million. But if I were to have ten million, I'd really do something. No, if I were to have ten million now, after this dreadful experience, thought Clobeef. Eh, it would be different now. One comes to know the value of every kopeck by experience. And then, having thought for a moment, he asked himself inwardly, Would I really handle it more intelligently? And, waving his hand, he added, What the devil? I suppose I'd squander it just as I did before. And he walked out of the shop, burning with desire to know what Murazov would say to him. I've been waiting for you, Pyotr Petrovich, said Murazov, when he saw Klobiev enter. Please come to my little room. And he led Klobiev into the little room already familiar to the reader, and so unpretentious that an official with a salary of 700 rubles a year would not have one more so. Tell me now. I suppose your circumstances have improved? You did get something from your aunt? How shall I tell you? A fantasy Vasilyevich. I don't know whether my circumstances have improved. I got only 50 peasant souls and 30,000 rubles, which I had to pay out to cover part of my debts, and I again have exactly nothing. And the main thing is that this thing about the will is most shady. Such swindling has been going on here, a fantasy Vasilyevich. I'll tell you right now, and you'll marvel at such goings on. This Chichikov, excuse me, Pyotr Petrovich, before we talk about this Chichikov, Allow me to talk about you yourself. Tell me, how much, in your estimation, would be satisfactory and sufficient for you to extricate yourself completely from these circumstances? My circumstances are difficult, said Clobeef. And in order to extricate myself, pay everything off, and have the possibility of living in the most moderate fashion, I would need at least a hundred thousand, if not more. In short, it's impossible for me. Well, and if you had it, how would you lead your life then? Well, I would then rent a little apartment and occupy myself with my children's upbringing, because I'm not going to enter the service. I'm no longer good for anything. And why are you no longer good for anything? But where shall I go, judge for yourself? I can't start as an office clerk. You forget that I have a family. I'm forty, I have lower back pains, I've grown lazy. They won't give me a more important post. I'm not in good repute. 
I confess to you. I personally would not take a lucrative post. I may be a worthless man, a gambler, anything you like, but I won't take bribes. I wouldn't get along with Krasnanasov and Samusvistov. But still, excuse me, sir, I can't understand how one can be without any path. How can you walk if not down a path? How can you drive if there's no ground under you? How can you float if the bark isn't in the water? And life is a journey. Forgive me, Pyotr Petrovich, those gentlemen of whom you are speaking are, after all, on some sort of path, they do work, after all. Well, let's say they turned off somehow, as happens with every sinner. Yet there's hope they'll find their way back. Whoever walks can't fail to arrive. There's hope he'll find his way back. But how will one who sits idle get to any path? The path won't come to me. Believe me, a fantasy Vasilyevich, I feel you're absolutely right. But I tell you that all activity has decidedly perished and died in me. I don't see that I can be of any use to anyone in the world. I feel that I'm decidedly a useless log. Before, when I was younger, it seemed to me that it was all a matter of money, that if I had hundreds of thousands in my hands, I'd make many people happy. I'd help poor artists, I'd set up libraries, useful institutions, assemble collections. I'm a man not without taste, and I know that in many respects I could manage better than those rich men among us who do it all senselessly. And now I see that this, too, is vanity and there's not much sense in it. No, a fantasy Vasilyevich, I'm good for nothing, precisely nothing, I tell you. I'm not capable of the least thing. Listen, Pyotr Petrovich, but you do pray, you go to church, you don't miss any matins or vespers, I know. Though you don't like getting up early, you do get up and go. You go at four o'clock in the morning, when no one's up yet. That is a different matter, a fantasy Vasilyevich. I do it for the salvation of my soul, because I'm convinced that I will thereby make up at least somewhat for my idle life. That, bad as I am, prayers still mean something to God. I tell you that I pray, that even without faith, I still pray. One feels only that there is a master on whom everything depends as a horse or a beast of burden smells the one who harnesses him. So you pray in order to please the one you pray to, in order to save your soul. And this gives you strength and makes you get up early from your bed. Believe me, if you were to undertake your work in the same fashion, as if in the certainty that you are serving the one you pray to, you would become active and no man among us would be able to cool you down. A fantasy Vasilyevich. I tell you again that this is something different. In the first case, I see that anyway I'm doing something. I tell you that I'm ready to go to the monastery, and I'll do whatever labors and deeds they impose on me there, even the heaviest. I'm sure that it's not my business to reason about what will be asked of those who make me do it. There I obey, and know that I'm obeying God. And why don't you reason that way in worldly matters as well? In the world we must also serve God and no one else. Even if we serve another, we do it only while being convinced that God tells us to do so, and without that we would not serve. What else are all our abilities and gifts, which vary from one person to another? They are tools for our prayer. The one is in words, and the other is in deeds. You cannot go to a monastery. You're tied to the world. You have a family. Here Murazov fell silent. Klobiev also fell silent. So you suppose that if you had, for instance, 200,000, you would be able to shore up your life and live more economically thereafter. That is, at least I would occupy myself with what I would be able to do. My children's upbringing. It would be possible for me to provide them with good teachers. And shall I tell you this, Pyotr Petrovich, that in two years you'd again be over your head in debt, as in a net? Klobiev was silent for a while, and then began measuredly, 
Not really, though. After such experience, what's experience? said Mirazov. You see, I know you. You're a man with a good heart. A friend will come to borrow money from you. You'll give it to him. You'll see a poor man and want to help. A nice guest will come. You'll want to receive him better, and you'll obey that first good impulse and forget your accounting. And allow me finally to tell you in all sincerity that you are unable to bring up your own children. Children can be brought up only by a father who has already done his own duty. And your wife, she too, is good-hearted. She wasn't brought up at all so as to be able to bring up children. I even think, forgive me, Pyotr Petrovich, mightn't it even be harmful for the children to be with you? Klobiev thought a little. He began to examine himself mentally on all sides and finally felt that Murazov was partly right. You know what, Pyotr Petrovich? Hand it all over to me. Your children, your affairs, leave your family and the children. I'll take care of them. Your circumstances are such that you are in my hands. You're heading for starvation. Here you must be prepared to do anything. Do you know Ivan Potapik? And respect him greatly, even though he goes around in a suburka. Ivan Potapik was a millionaire, got his daughters married to officials, lived like a czar. But once he was bankrupt, what to do? He went and became a shop clerk. It was no fun for him going from a silver platter to a simple bowl. It seemed he couldn't set a hand to anything. Now Ivan Potapik could gobble from a silver platter, but he no longer wants to. He could save it all up again, but he says, no, a fantasy Ivanovich, now I do not serve myself or for myself, but because God has judged so. I don't wish to do anything of my own will. I listen to you, because I wish to obey God and not people, and because God speaks only through the mouths of the best people. You are more intelligent than I am, and therefore it is not I who answer, but you. That is what Ivan Potapik says. And he, if the truth be told, is many times more intelligent than I am. A fantasy Vasilyevich. I, too, am ready to acknowledge your power over me. I am your servant and whatever you want. I give myself to you. But don't give me work beyond my strength. I'm no potapic, and I tell you that I'm not fit for anything good. It is not I, Pyotr Petrovich, who will impose it on you. But since you wish to serve, as you yourself say, sir, here is a God-pleasing deed for you. There is a church being built in a certain place on voluntary donations from pious people. There's not enough money. A collection must be taken. Put on a simple suburka. You see, you're a simple man now, a ruined nobleman. The same as a beggar. Why pretend? With ledger in hand in a simple cart, go around to the towns and villages. You'll get a blessing and a loose leaf ledger from the bishop and go with God. Pyotr Petrovich was amazed by this completely new duty. He, a nobleman, after all, of a once ancient family, was to set out with a ledger in his hand, to beg donations for a church, and go bouncing along in a cart to boot and yet it was impossible to wriggle out of it or avoid it. It was a God-pleasing thing. Thinking it over, said Murazov, you'll be performing two services here, one for God and the other for me. What for you? Here's what. Since you'll be going to places where I've never been, you'll find out everything on the spot, sir, or how the mujiks live there, where the richer ones are where the needy, and what condition it's all in. I must tell you that I love the Mujiks, perhaps because I myself come from Mujiks. But the thing is that all sorts of vileness is going on among them. Old believers nine and various vagabonds confuse them, sir. Get them to rebel against the authorities. Yes, against the authorities and the regulations. And if a man is oppressed, he rebels easily. Why, 
as if it's hard to stir up a man who is truly suffering. But the thing is that reprisals ought not to start from below. It's bad when it comes to fists. There'll be no sense to it. Only the thieves will gain. You're an intelligent man. You'll examine things. You'll find out where a man indeed suffers from others. And where from his own restless character. And then you'll tell me about it all. I'll give you a small sum of money just in case. To give to those who truly suffer innocently. For your part. It will also be helpful to comfort them with your word, and to explain to them as best you can that God tells us to endure without murmuring, and to pray in times of misfortune, and not to be violent and take justice into our own hands. In short, speak to them, not rousing anyone against anyone else, but reconciling them all. If you see hatred in anyone against whomever it may be, Apply all your efforts. A fantasy Vasilyevich. The task you are entrusting to me, said Clobeev, is a holy task. But remember whom you are entrusting it to. You might entrust it to a man who is of almost holy life and already knows how to forgive others. But I'm not saying you should accomplish it all, only as much as possible, whatever you can. The thing is that you will come back from those parts with some knowledge in any case, and will have an idea of the situation in that area. An official will never meet anyone personally, and a mujik will not be frank with him. While you, collecting for the church, will call on all sorts of people, tradesmen, merchants, and will have the chance to question them all. I'm telling you this, sir because the governor-general now has special need of such people, and you, bypassing all official promotions, will get a position in which your life will not be useless. I'll try, I'll apply my efforts, as far as my strength allows, said Clobeef, and reassurance could be noted in his voice, his back straightened, and his head lifted, as with a man upon whom hope shines. I see that God has granted you understanding, and you know certain things better than we nearsighted people. Now allow me to ask you, said Murazov, what Chichikov is and what sort of affair it is. I can't tell you unheard of things about Chichikov. He pulls such deals. Do you know, a fantasy Vasilyevich, that the will is false? The real one has been found, in which the whole estate goes to the wards. What are you saying? But who, then, concocted the false will? That's just the thing. It's a most vile affair. They say it was Chichikov, and that the will was signed after death. They dressed up some woman in place of the deceased, and it was she who signed it. In short, a most tempting affair. They say thousands of petitions have come from all sides. Maria Yeremivna is now besieged by wars. Two functionaries are already fighting over her. That's what sort of affair it is, a fantasy Vasilyevich. I've heard nothing about it. But the affair is indeed not quite sinless. I confess, I find Pavel Ivanovich Chichikov a most mysterious person, said Murazov. I, too, sent in a petition for myself as a reminder that there exists a nearest heir. They can fight it out among themselves for all of me, Klobiev thought on his way out. A fantasy Vasilyevich is no fool. He must have given me this charge after thinking it over. Just let me accomplish it, that's all. He began thinking about the road, at the same time as Murazov was still reap. Aiding to himself, a most mysterious man to me, this Pavel Ivanovich Chichikov. If only such will and perseverance were put to good use, and meanwhile, indeed, petition after petition kept coming to the courts. Relatives turned up of whom no one had ever heard. As birds come flying to carry in. So everything came flying down upon the incalculable wealth left by the old woman. Denunciations of Chichikov of the spuriousness of the last will. Denunciations of the spuriousness of the first will also, evidence of theft and of the concealment of certain sums. 
Evidence turned up against Chichikov of his buying dead souls, of smuggling goods while he was still in customs. Everything was unearthed. The whole story of his past was found out. God knows how they got wind of it all and learned it. Yet there was evidence even of such things as Chichikov thought no one knew of except for himself and his four walls. So far it was all still a court secret and had not yet reached his ears. Though a trustworthy note he had recently received from his lawyer gave him some idea that trouble was brewing. The content of the note was brief. I hasten to inform you that there will be some fuss around the case. But remember that you ought by no means to worry. The main thing is to be calm. Everything will be taken care of. This note set him completely at ease. The man is indeed a genius, said Chichikov. To crown all blessings, the tailor brought his suit at that moment. Chichikov felt a strong desire to look at himself in the new tailcoat of the flames and smoke of Navarino. He pulled on the trousers, which hugged him marvelously on all sides, an artist's ideal. The hips were so nicely fitted, the calves, too. The cloth hugged all the details, imparting to them a still greater resilience. Once he had tightened the clasp behind him, his stomach became like a drum. He beat on it with a brush, adding, Such a fool, but, overall, what a picture he makes, the tailcoat, it seemed, was even better tailored than the trousers. Not one wrinkle, tight all around his sides, curving at the overlap, showing his full curvature. It was a little too tight under the right arm, but that made it fit still better at the waist. The tailor, standing there in complete triumph, merely said, Rest assured, outside Petersburg there's no such tailoring anywhere. The tailor was from Petersburg himself, and had put on his shingle, a foreigner from London and Paris. He was not given to joking, and wanted with these two cities to stop up the maws of all the other tailors at once, so that in the future no one could come out with such cities, and they would have to content themselves with writing some Karlsruhe or Kopenhauer. Chichikov magnanimously paid the tailor and, left alone, began to examine himself at leisure in the mirror, like an artist, with aesthetic feeling and con amore. It turned out that everything was somehow even better than before. The little cheeks were more interesting, the chin more alluring, the white collar imparted its color to the cheek, the blue satin tie imparted its hue to the collar, the shirt front, pleated in the latest fashion, imparted its hue to the tie, the rich velvet waistcoat imparted its hue to the shirt front, and the tailcoat of the flames and smoke of Navarino, gleaming like silk, imparted its hue to everything. He turned to the right, good. He turned to the left, even better. The curve of the waist was like a courtier's, or such a gentleman's as jabbers away in French, so that next to him a Frenchman himself is nothing. One who, even when angry, does not disgrace himself indecently with a Russian word, who cannot even swear in Russian, but will give you a good scolding in French dialect. Such delicacy. He tried, inclining his head slightly to one side, to assume a pose as if he were addressing a middle-aged lady of the latest cultivation. It was a picture to see. Painter, take up your brush and paint. In his pleasure, he straightaway performed a light leap, like an entree chat. The chest of drawers shook and a flask of eau de cologne fell to the ground. But this caused no hindrance. He quite properly called the stupid flask a fool and thought, Whom shall I visit first of all? The best, when suddenly in the front hall, something like the clank of spurred boots and a gendarme in full armor, as if he were a whole army in one person. You are ordered to appear at once before the governor general. Chichikov was simply stunned. Before him stuck up a fright with a mustache, a horse tail on his head, a baldric over one shoulder, 
a baldric over the other, an enormous broadsword hanging at his side. He fancied there was also a gun hanging from the other side, and devil knows what else, a whole army just in one man. He tried to protest, but the fright uttered rudely. To appear at once, through the door to the front hall he saw another fright flit by. He looked out the window. There was a carriage as well. What a do. Just as he was, in his tailcoat of the flames and smoke of Navarino, he had to get in and, trembling all over, drive to the governor general's, the policeman along with him. In the anteroom he was not even allowed to come to his senses. Go in. The prince is waiting for you, said the official on duty. Before him, as through a mist, flashed the anteroom with messengers receiving packages, then a hall through which he passed, thinking only, he'll just up and seize me, and with no trial, no anything, straight to Siberia, his heart began to pound harder than the heart of the most jealous lover. The door finally opened. Before him was the office, with portfolios, shelves, books, and the prince as wrathful as wrath itself. Destroyer, destroyer, said Chichikov. He'll destroy my soul, slaughter me, like a wolf a lamb. I spared you. I allowed you to remain in town when you ought to have been put in jail. And again you've besmirched yourself with the most dishonest swindling a man has yet besmirched himself with. The prince's lips were trembling with wrath. What is this most dishonest action in swindling, your excellency? asked Chichikov, trembling all over. The woman, said the prince, stepping closer and looking straight into Chichikov's eyes. The woman who signed the will at your dictation has been seized and will confront you. Chichikov turned pale as a sheet. Your Excellency, I'll tell you the whole truth of the matter. I am guilty, indeed, guilty, but not so guilty. I've been maligned by my enemies. No one can malign you, because there is many times more vileness in you than the worst liar could invent. In all your life, I suppose, you've never done anything that was not dishonest. Every kopeck you earned was earned dishonestly, and is a theft and a dishonest thing deserving of the knout in Siberia. No, it's enough now. This very minute you will be taken to jail, and there, together with the worst scoundrels and robbers, you must wait for your fate to be decided. And this is still merciful, because you are many times worse than they are. They dress in wool jerkins and sheepkins, while you? He glanced at the tailcoat of the flames and smoke of Navarino, and, taking hold of the bell pull, rang. Your Excellency, Chichikov cried out, be merciful. You are the father of a family. Don't spare me, but spare my old mother. You're lying. The prince cried wrathfully. You pleaded with me the same way before by your children and family, which you never had, and now, your mother, your excellency, I am a scoundrel and an utter blackguard, said Chichikov, in a voice. I was indeed lying, I have no children or family, but, as God is my witness, I always wanted to have a wife, to fulfill the duty of a man and a citizen, so as later to earn indeed the respect of citizens and authorities. But what calamitous coincidences! With my blood, your excellency, with my blood, I had to procure my daily sustenance. Temptations and seductions at every step. Enemies and destroyers and thieves. My whole life has been like a violent storm or a ship amidst the waves at the will of the winds. I am a man, your excellency, tears suddenly poured in streams from his eyes. He collapsed at the prince's feet, just as he was, in his tailcoat of the flames and smoke of Navarino, in his velvet waistcoat and satin tie, new trousers and hairdo exuding the clean scent of eau de cologne. Get away from me, 
Call the guards to take him away, the prince said to those who came in. Your Excellency, Chichikov cried, seizing the prince's boot with both hands. A shuddering sensation ran through the prince's every fiber. Get away, I tell you, he said, trying to tear his foot from Chichikov's embrace. Your Excellency, I will not move from this spot before I obtain mercy, Chichikov said, not letting go of the prince's boot and sliding, together with his foot, across the floor in his tailcoat of the flames and smoke of Navarino. Away, I tell you, he said, with that inexplicable feeling of disgust that a man feels at. The sight of an extremely ugly insect that he does not have the courage to crush underfoot. He gave such a shake that Chichikov felt the boot strike his nose, lips, and nicely rounded chin, but he would not let go of the boot and held the leg still harder in his embrace. Two hefty policemen pulled him away by force, and, holding him under his arms, led him through all the rooms. He was pale, crushed, in the insensibly frightful state of a man who sees black, inescapable death before him. That fright which is contrary to our nature. Just at the doorway to the stairs they ran into Murazov. A ray of hope suddenly flickered. Instantly, with unnatural force, he tore from the grip of the two policemen and threw himself at the feet of the amazed old man. Pavel Ivanovich, my dear fellow, what's happened? Save me. They're taking me to jail. To death, the policeman seized him and led him away without allowing him to be heard. A dank, chill closet with the smell of the boots and leg wrappings of garrison soldiers. An unpainted table, two vile chairs, a window with an iron grate, a decrepit wood stove, through the cracks of which smoke came without giving any warmth. This was the dwelling in which they placed our hero who had just begun to taste the sweetness of life and attract the attention of his compatriots in his fine new tailcoat of the flames and smoke of Navarino. He was not even given time to arrange to take the necessary things with him, to take the chest with the money in it, his papers, the deeds of purchase for the dead souls. The officials now had it all. He collapsed on the ground, and the carnivorous worm of terrible, Hopeless sorrow wrapped itself around his heart. With increasing speed it began to gnaw at his heart, all unprotected as it was. Another day like that, another day of such sorrow, and there would be no Chichikov in this world at all. But someone's all-saving hand did not slumber even over Chichikov. An hour later the door of the jail opened. Old Mirazov came in, if someone tormented by parching thirst were to have a stream of spring water poured down his dry throat, he would not revive as poor Chichikov did. My savior, said Chichikov, and, suddenly seizing his hand, he quickly kissed it and pressed it to his breast. May God reward you for visiting an unfortunate man. He dissolved in tears. The old man looked at him with mournfully pained eyes and said only, Ah, Pavel Ivanovich, Pavel Ivanovich, what have you done? I am a scoundrel, guilty, I transgressed, but consider, consider, can they treat me like this? I am a nobleman, without a trial, without an investigation, to throw me into jail, to take away everything, my things, my chest, there's money in it. All my property, all my property is in it. A fantasy Vasilyevich. Property I acquired by sweating blood and, unable to restrain the impulse of sorrow again overwhelming his heart, he sobbed loudly. In a voice that pierced the thick walls of the jail and echoed dully in the distance, tore off his satin tie and, clutching at his collar with his hand, tore his tailcoat of the flames and smoke of Navarino. Pavel Ivanovich, it makes no difference. 
You must bid farewell to your property and to all there is in the world. You have fallen under the implacable law, not under the power of some man. I have been my own ruin, I know it. I did not know how to stop in time. But why such a terrible punishment, a fantasy Vasilyevich? Am I a robber? Has anyone suffered from me? Have I made anyone unhappy? By toil and sweat, by sweating blood, I procured my kopeck. Why did I procure this kopeck? In order to live out the rest of my days in comfort, to leave something to my children, whom I intended to acquire for the good, for the service of the fatherland. I erred. I don't deny it. I erred. What to do? But I erred because I saw that. I'd get nowhere on the straight path, and that to go crookedly was straighter. But I toiled. I strained. And these scoundrels who sit in the courts taking thousands from the treasury, or robbing people who aren't rich, filching the last kopeck from those who have nothing, a fantasy Vasilyevich. I did not fornicate. I did not drink. And so much work. So much iron patience. Yes. It could be said that every kopeck I procured was redeemed with sufferings. Sufferings. Let one of them suffer as I did. What has my whole life been? A bitter struggle. A ship amidst the waves. And. A fantasy Vasilyevich. I have lost what was acquired with such struggle. He did not finish and sobbed loudly from unendurable heartache. Collapsed on the chair. Ripped off the torn, hanging skirt of his tailcoat and flung it away from him. And, putting both hands to his hair, which before he had zealously tried to strengthen, he tore it mercilessly, delighting in the pain with which he hoped to stifle his unquenchable heartache. Ah, Pavel Ivanovich, Pavel Ivanovich, Murazov was saying, looking at him mournfully and shaking his head. I keep thinking what a man you'd be if, in the same way, with energy and patience, you had embarked on good work and for a better purpose. If only any one of those who love the good would apply as much effort to it as you did to procuring your kopeck, and knew how to sacrifice to that good their own self-love and ambition, without sparing themselves, as you did not spare yourself in procuring your kopeck, a fantasy Vasilyevich, said poor Chichikov, seizing both of his hands in his own. Oh, if I could manage to be set free, to get back my property, I swear to you, I would henceforth lead a completely different life. Save me, benefactor, save me. But what can I do? I would have to fight with the law. Even supposing I ventured to do it, the prince is a just man. He will never back down. Benefactor. You can do anything. I'm not afraid of the law. I can find ways to deal with the law. But the fact that I've been thrown into jail innocently. That I will perish here like a dog. And that my property. My papers. My chest. Save me. He embraced the old man's legs and wetted them with his tears. Ah. Pavel Ivanovich. Pavel Ivanovich, old Murazov kept saying, shaking his head, how blinded you are by this property. Because of it, you don't even hear your own poor soul. I'll think about my soul, too. Only save me, Pavel Ivanovich, old Murazov said and stopped. To save you is not in my power. You can see that yourself. But I'll try to do all I can to alleviate your lot and set you free. I don't know whether I, LL succeed, but I'll try. And if perchance I do succeed, Pavel Ivanovich, then I'll ask a reward from you for my labors. Drop all these attempts at these acquisitions. I tell you in all honesty that even if I lost all my property, and I have much more than you do, I wouldn't weep. By God, the point of the thing is not in this property which can be confiscated, but in that which no one can steal and carry off. You have already lived enough in the world. 
You yourself call your life a ship amidst the waves. You have enough already to live on for the rest of your days. Settle yourself in some quiet corner, near a church and simple, good people. Or, if you're burning with desire to leave posterity behind you, marry a good girl, not rich, accustomed to moderation and simple household life. Forget this noisy world and all its seductive fancies. Let it forget you, too. There is no peace in it. You see, everything in it is either an enemy, a tempter, or a traitor. Chichikov fell to thinking. Something strange, some hitherto unknown feelings, inexplicable to himself, came to him. As if something wanted to awaken in him. Something suppressed since childhood by stern, dead precepts, by the inimicalness of a dull childhood, the desolateness of his family home, by familyless solitude, abjectness, and a poverty of first impressions, by the stern glance of fate, which looked dully at him through some clouded window buried under a wintry blizzard. Only save me, a fantasy Vasilyevich, he cried out. I'll lead a different life. I'll follow your advice. Here's my word on it. Watch out now. Pavel Ivanovich, don't go back on your word, Murazov said, holding his hand. I might go back on it, if it weren't for such a terrible lesson, poor Chichikov said with a sigh, and added, but the lesson is a harsh one. A harsh, harsh lesson, a fantasy Vasilyevich, it's good that it's harsh. Thank God for that. Pray to him. I'll go and do what I can for you. With these words the old man left. Chichikov no longer wept or tore his tailcoat and his hair. He calmed down. No, enough, he said finally, a different, different life. It's really time to become a decent man. Oh, if only I could somehow extricate myself and still be left with at least a little capital. I'd settle far away from, and the deeds? He thought, what then? Why abandon this business, acquired with such labor? I won't buy any more, but I must mortgage those. The acquisition cost me labor. I'll mortgage them, I will, in order to buy an estate. I'll become a landowner, because here one can do much good. And in his mind there awakened those feelings which had come over him when he was at Kostan's Hoglos, listening to his host's nice, intelligent conversation, in the warm evening light, about how fruitful and useful estate management is. The country suddenly appeared so beautiful to him, as if he were able to feel all the charms of country life. We're all stupid, chasing after vanity, he said finally. Really, it comes from idleness. Everything's near, everything's close at hand. Yet we run to some far-off kingdom. Is it not life, if one is occupied, be it even in a remote corner? The pleasure indeed consists in labor. And nothing sweeter than the fruit of one's own labors. No, I'll occupy myself with labor. I'll settle in the country and occupy myself honestly, so as to have a good influence on others as well. What? Am I really such a good for nothing? I have abilities for management. I possess the qualities of thrift, efficiency, reasonableness, and even constancy. Once I make up my mind, I feel I have them. Only now do I feel truly and clearly that there exists a certain duty that man must fulfill on earth, without tearing himself away from the place and corner he has been put in, and a life of labor, far removed from the noise of the cities and those seductions invented in his idleness by the man who has forgotten labor, began to picture itself to him so vividly that he almost forgot the whole unpleasantness of his situation, and was, perhaps, even ready to give thanks to Providence for this harsh lesson. If only he were let go, and at least part of his money were returned to him. But, 
The single-leaf door of his unclean closet opened and in walked an official person. Samus Vistov, an epicure, a daredevil, an excellent friend, a carouser, and a cunning beast, as his own friends called him. In time of war this man might have done wonders. If he had been sent to sneak through some impassable, dangerous places, to steal a cannon right out from under the enemy's nose, it would have been just the thing for him. But, for lack of a military career in which he might have been an honest man, he did dirty and muck things up. Inconceivably, he was good with his friends, never sold anyone, and, once he gave his word, he kept it. But his own superiors he regarded as something like an enemy battery which one had to make one's way through, taking advantage of every weak spot, breach, or negligence. We know all about your situation. We've heard everything, he said. Once he saw that the door was tightly shut behind him. Never mind. Never mind. Don't lose heart. It will all be fixed up. Everything will work out for you and your humble servants. Thirty thousand for us all, and nothing more. Really, Chichikov cried out. And I'll be completely vindicated, roundly, and get a nice reward for your losses. And for your efforts, thirty thousand. It goes to everyone, our boys and the governor generals and the secretary. But, excuse me, how can I? All my things, my chest, it's all sealed now, under surveillance. You'll have it all within the hour. It's a deal, then. Chichikov gave him his hand. His heart was pounding, and he had no trust that it was possible. Goodbye for now. Our mutual friend asked me to tell you that the main thing is, calm and presence of mind. H.M., thought Chichikov, I understand. The lawyer. Samus Vistov disappeared. Chichikov, left alone, still did not trust his words. When, less than an hour after this conversation, the chest was brought, papers, money, and all in the best order. Samus Vistov had come as an administrator, reprimanded the guards for lack of vigilance, ordered more soldiers set to strengthen the watch, not only took the chest, but even selected all the papers that could in any way compromise Chichikov, tied it all together, sealed it, and told a soldier to take it immediately to Chichikov himself in the guise of things necessary for the night and for sleeping, so that along with the papers, Chichikov also even received all the warm things needed to cover his mortal body. This speedy delivery delighted him unutterably. He acquired great hope, and again was already imagining all sorts of attractions. Theater in the evening, a dancer he was dangling after. The country and its quiet paled. Town and noise again grew more vivid, clear. Oh, life! And meanwhile a case of boundless proportions was developing in the courts and chambers. The pens of Scrivener's worked away and, Taking sniffs of tobacco, the quibbling heads labored, admiring, like artists, each scrawly line. The lawyer, like a hidden magician, invisibly controlled the whole mechanism. He entangled decidedly everyone, before anyone had time to look around. The tangle increased. Samus Vistov surpassed himself in his unheard of courage and boldness. Having found out where the seized woman was being kept, he went straight there and entered with the air of such a dashing fellow and superior that the sentinel saluted him and stood at attention. Have you been here long? Since morning, sir. How soon will you be relieved? Three hours, sir. I shall need you. I'll tell the officer to detail someone else instead. Yes, sir, and going home without delaying a moment, to avoid mixing with anyone and to have all ends buried. He dressed himself up as a gendarme, tricked out in mustache and side whiskers. The devil himself could not have recognized him. 
Going to the house where Chichikov was, he seized the first when she found there, handed her over to two daredevil officials, also in the know, and himself went straight to the sentinels, with mustache and rifle all in order. Go, the officer sent me to replace you. He exchanged places with the sentinel and stood there with his rifle. This was just what was needed. Instead of the former woman, another was found there who knew and understood nothing. The former one was tucked away somewhere, so that afterwards nobody knew what had become of her. Meanwhile, as Samusvistov was pursuing his role as warrior, the lawyer was working wonders in the civilian area. He informed the governor indirectly that the prosecutor was writing a denunciation of him. He informed the police official that another official, living undercover, was writing denunciations of him. He assured the official living undercover that there was a still more undercover official who was informing on him, and drove them all into a situation where they had to turn to him for advice. A muddle of the following sort occurred. Denunciation wrote upon denunciation, and such things began to be discovered as the sun had never looked upon, and such as even did not exist at all. Everything was employed and made use of, who was an illegitimate son, and who had a mistress of what family and origin, and whose wife was dangling after whom. Scandals, temptations, and it all got so mixed up and intertwined with the story of Chichikov and the dead souls, that it was quite impossible to grasp which of these affairs was the chief nonsense. Both seemed of equal worth. When the documents finally began to reach the governor general, the poor prince could not understand a thing. The rather intelligent and efficient clerk who was charged with making an abstract almost lost his mind. It was quite impossible to grasp the threads of the affair. The prince was at that time preoccupied with a number of other matters, one more unpleasant than another. In one part of the province there was famine. The officials who were sent to distribute grain managed it somehow improperly. In another part of the province, the old believers were astir. Someone had spread it among them that an antichrist had been born who would not leave even the dead alone and was buying up dead souls. People repented and sinned and, under the pretext of catching the Antichrist, bumped off some non-Antichrists. In another place, the Mujiks had rebelled against the landowners and police captains. Some tramps had spread rumors among them that a time was coming when peasants must be landowners and dress themselves up in tailcoats and landowners must dress in simple caftans and be mujiks, and the whole region, without considering that there would then be too many landowners and police captains, had refused to pay any taxes. There was need to resort to strong measures. The poor prince was in a very upset state of mind. At this moment it was announced to him that the tax farmer had come. Show him in, said the prince. The old man came in. Here's your Chichikov. You stood up for him and defended him. Now he's been caught in such an affair as the worst thief wouldn't venture upon. Allow me to tell you, your excellency, that I do not quite understand this affair. A forged will and such a one. It's public flogging for a thing like that, your excellency. I say this not to defend Chichikov. But the affair has not yet been proved. There has been no investigation. There is evidence. The woman who was dressed up in place of the deceased has been seized. I want to question her purposely in your presence. The prince rang and ordered the woman brought. Murazov fell silent. A most dishonest affair. And, to their disgrace, the foremost officials of the town are mixed up in it. The governor himself. He ought not to turn up together with thieves and wastrels, the prince said hotly. But the governor is one of the heirs, he has the right to make a claim. And if others are latching on to it from all sides, well, your excellency, that is a human thing. A rich woman died, sir, 
without making intelligent and just arrangements. So those eager to profit by it flew down from all sides. It's a human thing. But why such abominations? The scoundrels, the prince said with a feeling of indignation. I don't have one good official. They are all scoundrels, your excellency, who among us is as good as he ought to be. The officials of our town are all human. They have merits and many are quite knowledgeable and no one is far removed from sin. Listen, a fantasy Vasilyevich, tell me. I know that you alone are an honest man. What is this passion of yours for defending all sorts of scoundrels? Your Excellency, said Murazov, whoever the man may be whom you call a scoundrel, he is still a human being. How not defend a man if you know that he does half his evil out of coarseness and ignorance? For we do unjust things at every step, and at every moment are the cause of another's misfortune, and not even with any bad intention. You, your excellency, have also committed a great injustice. What? The prince exclaimed in amazement, completely struck by such an unexpected turn in the talk. Mirazov paused, fell silent, as if pondering something, and finally said, well, let's say for instance in the Derpenikov case, a fantasy Vasilyevich, a crime against the fundamental laws of the state, tantamount to the betrayal of one's country, I am not justifying him. But is it fair when a youth who in his inexperience was seduced and lured by others is judged on a par with someone who was one of the instigators? The same lot fell to Derpenikov as to some Voronoi Dryanoi. Ten, but their crimes are not the same. For God's sake, the prince said with visible agitation, Tell me, do you know anything about it? I just recently wrote directly to Petersburg about alleviating his lot. No, your excellency, I'm not saying it because I know something that you don't know. Though there is indeed one circumstance that might serve in his favor, he himself would not consent because another man would suffer by it. But what I think is only that you were perhaps pleased to be in too great a hurry then. Forgive me, your excellency, I am judging according to my weak understanding. You have ordered me several times to speak frankly. When I was still a superior, sir, I had many workers, both bad and good. One also has to take a man's earlier life into account. Because if you don't consider everything with equanimity, but start by yelling at him, you'll merely frighten him and never obtain a real confession. But if you question him sympathetically, as brother to brother, he himself will speak it all out and won't even ask for leniency. And there won't be any bitterness against anyone because he will see clearly that it is not I who am punishing him, but the law. The prince lapsed into thought. At that moment a young official came in and stood deferentially, a portfolio in his hand. Care and travail showed on his young and still fresh face. One could see it was not for nothing that he served as a special agent. He belonged to the number of those few who do their clerical work con amore burning neither with ambition, nor with the desire for gain, nor with the imitation of others. He worked only because he was convinced that he had to be there and nowhere else, that life had been given him for that. To pursue, to analyze, and, having grasped all the threads of the most complicated case, to explain it, this was the thing for him. The labors, the efforts, the sleepless nights were abundantly rewarded if the case finally began to clarify itself before him, and the hidden causes revealed themselves, so that he felt he could convey the whole of it in a few words, clearly and distinctly, in such fashion that it would be obvious and understandable to anyone. It could be said that a student does not rejoice so much when some very difficult phrase and the true meaning of a great writer's thought are revealed to him, as he rejoiced when a very tangled case untangled itself before him. And yet, 
buy grain in those places where there is famine. I know these things better than the officials do. I'll look personally into who needs what. And, with your excellency's permission, I'll also talk a bit with the old believers. They'll be more willing to speak with their own kind, with simple folk. So, God knows, maybe I can help settle things peaceably with them. And I won't take any money from you, by God. It's shameful to think of one's own gain at a time like this, when people are dying of hunger. I have supplies of ready grain. I've just sent to Siberia, and by next summer they'll deliver more. God alone can reward you for such service, a fantasy Vasilyevich. And I will not say a single word, because, as you can feel yourself, no word is adequate here. But let me say one thing about your request. Tell me yourself, do I have the right to overlook this affair, and will it be just, will it be honest on my part to forgive the scoundrels? Your Excellency by God, you can't call them that, the less so as there are some quite worthy people among them. Man's circumstances are very difficult. Your Excellency, very, very difficult. It may so happen that a man seems thoroughly guilty, but once you go into it, it wasn't him at all. But what will they themselves say if I overlook it? Some of them will turn up their noses still more and even say that they scared me. They'll be the first not to respect, Your Excellency, allow me to give you my opinion. Gather them all together. Let them know that you are informed of everything and present to them your own position exactly as you have just now been pleased to present it to me, and ask their advice. What would each of them do in your place? Do you really think they will understand the noblest impulses better than chicanery and opportunism? Believe me, they'll laugh at me. I don't think so, your excellency. The Russian man, even one who is worse than others, still has a sense of justice. Unless he's some sort of Jew, and not a Russian. No, your excellency, you have nothing to hide. Tell them exactly as you told me for they denounce you as an ambitious and proud man who won't even listen to anything, so self-confident you are. So let them see it all as it is. What do you care? Your cause is right. Tell it to them as if you were bringing your confession not to them, but to God himself. A fantasy Vasilyevich, the prince said, reflecting, I'll think about it, and meanwhile, I thank you very much for your advice and order Chichikov's release, Your Excellency. Tell this Chichikov to take himself away from here as soon as possible, and the further the better. Him I can never forgive. Murazov bowed, and went straight from the prince to Chichikov. He found Chichikov already in good spirits, quite calmly occupied with a rather decent dinner that had been brought to him in covered dishes from some quite decent kitchen. From the first phrases of their conversation, the old man understood at once that C. Hitchikov had already managed to talk with one or two of the pettifogging officials. He even understood that the invisible participation of the expert lawyer had interfered here. Listen, Pavel Ivanovich, sir, he said, I am bringing you freedom, on condition that you leave town at once. Get all your belongings ready and go with God, don't put it off for a moment, because things are worse than you think. I know, sir, that there's a man here who is inciting you. I tell you in secret that yet another case is developing here, and that no powers will save him. He is glad, of course, to drag others down, so as not to be bored, but things are getting sorted out. I left you in a good state of mind, better than you're in now. My advice is not offered lightly. By God, the point is not in this property, on account of which people argue and stab each other, as if one could have well-being in this life without thinking about the next. Believe me, Pavel Ivanovich, sir, until people abandon all that they wrangle over and eat each other for on earth, and think about the well-being of their spiritual property, 
There won't be any well-being of earthly property. There will be times of hunger and poverty, as much for all the people as for each one separately. That is clear, sir. Whatever you say, the body does depend on the soul. How then can you want things to go properly? Think not about dead souls, but about your living soul, and God help you on a different path. I, too, am leaving tomorrow. Hurry, or without me there will be trouble. Having said this, the old man left. Chichikov fell to thinking. The meaning of life again seemed of no small importance. Murazov is right, he said, it's time for a different path. Having said this, he left the prison. One sentry lugged the chest, another the suitcase with linen. Selifan and Petrushka were as glad of their master's deliverance as of God knows what. Well, my gentles, said Chichikov, addressing them benignly, we must pack up and go. We'll get rolling, Pavel Ivanovich, said Selifan. The road must have settled. There's been enough snow. It's time, truly, that we quit this town. I'm so sick of it I don't even want to look at it. Go to the carriage maker and have the carriage put on runners, said Chichikov. And he himself went to town, though he had no wish to pay farewell calls on anyone. It was awkward after all these happenings, the more so as there were many highly unfavorable stories about him going around town. He avoided meeting anyone and only stopped on the quiet to see that merchant from whom he had bought the cloth of the color of the flames and smoke of Navarino, bought another three yards for a tailcoat and trousers, and one of the same tailor. For double the price, the master undertook to increase his zeal, and kept the whole sewing populace sitting up all night working by candlelight with needles, irons, and teeth so that the tailcoat was ready the next day, albeit a little late. The horses were all harnessed. Chichikov did try the tailcoat on, however. It was fine, the same as the previous one. But, alas, he noticed some smooth patches showing pale on his head and remarked ruefully, Why did I give myself over to such contrition? And, what's more, tear my hair out, Having paid the tailor, he finally drove out of town in some strange disposition. This was not the old Chichikov. This was some wreckage of the old Chichikov. The inner state of his soul might be compared to a demolished building, which has been demolished so that from it a new one could be built. But the new one has not been started yet because the definitive plan has not yet come from the architect and the workers are left in perplexity. An hour before him, old Murazov set out in a burlap kibitka with Potapik, and an hour after Chichikov's departure an order was issued that the prince, on the occasion of his departure for Petersburg, wished to see all his officials to a man. In the great hall of the governor-general's house, all the official ranks of the town assembled, from governor down to titular councillor, the heads of offices and departments, councillors, assessors, Kisloidov, Krasnanasov, Samusvistov, those who took bribes, those who did not take bribes, those who were false, those who were half false, and those who were not false at all all waited with a certain, not entirely calm expectancy for the governor-general to appear. The prince came out neither gloomy nor bright. His look was firm, as was his step. The whole official assembly bowed, many quite low. Responding with a slight bow, the prince began. As I am leaving for Petersburg, I considered it proper to meet with all of you and even partly to explain the reason to you. A very tempting affair sprang up among us. I suppose that many of those present know to what I am referring. This affair led to the uncovering of other no less dishonest affairs, which finally involved such people as I had hitherto considered honest. I am also informed of a hidden aim to get everything so tangled that it would prove utterly impossible to resolve it with any formal propriety. 
I even know who is the mainspring and through who's hidden, though he concealed his participation very skillfully. But the point is that I intend to deal with it not through a formal investigation of documents, but through a speedy court-martial, as in time of war, and I hope that the sovereign will give me this right, once I have explained the affair to him. On those occasions when it is not possible to conduct a case in civil fashion, when whole shelves of documents get burned, and when, finally, by a superfluity of false and unrelated evidence, and false denunciations, people try to obscure a case that is obscure to begin with. I consider court-martial the sole method, and I should like to know your opinion. The prince paused, as if awaiting a response. All stood staring at the ground. Many were pale. Still another affair is known to me, though those who did it are quite sure that it cannot be known to anyone. Its investigation will not proceed on paper, because I myself shall be plaintiff and petitioner and bring forth self-evident proofs. Someone among the officials gave a start. Certain of the more timorous ones were also disconcerted. It goes without saying that the main instigators will be stripped of rank and property. The rest will be removed from their posts. Naturally, many innocent people will suffer among this number. No, it cannot be helped. The affair is too dishonest and cries out for justice. I know that it will not even be a lesson to others, because to replace those who are thrown out, others will come, and the very people who hitherto were honest will become dishonest, and the very ones who are found worthy of trust will deceive and sell out. But in spite of all that, I must deal cruelly, for justice cries out. I know I shall be accused of harsh cruelty, but I know that those will also, the same ones will accuse. Me. I must now turn myself into a mere instrument of justice, an axe that must fall upon heads. A shudder involuntarily passed over all faces. The prince was calm. His face expressed neither wrath nor inner turmoil. Now the same man in whose hands the fate of so many lies, and whom no entreaties can sway. This same man now throws himself at your feet. He pleads with you all. Everything will be forgotten, smoothed over, forgiven. I myself will intercede for you, if you fulfill my request. And my request is this. I know that no methods, no fears, no punishments can eradicate falsity. It is too deeply rooted. The dishonest practice of accepting bribes has become a need and a necessity even for people who were not born to dishonesty. I know that for many it is even no longer possible to go against the general current. But now, as at a decisive and sacred moment, when there is need to save the fatherland, when every citizen brings everything and sacrifices everything, I must call out at least to those in whose breast there beats a Russian heart, and to whom the word nobility still means something. Why talk about which of us is more to blame? I am perhaps more to blame than anyone. Perhaps I received you too sternly in the beginning, perhaps, by excessive suspiciousness, I repulse those of you who sincerely wish to be of use to me, though I, for my part, could also reproach them. If they indeed loved justice and the good of their country, they ought not to have been offended by the haughtiness of my treatment. They ought to have suppressed their own ambition and sacrificed themselves. It cannot be that I would have failed to notice their selflessness and lofty love of the good, and not finally have accepted their useful and intelligent advice. After all, the subordinate ought rather to adjust to the character of his superior than the superior to the character of his subordinate. That is at least more rightful and easier, since the subordinates have one superior, while the superior has hundreds of subordinates. But let us leave aside who is the more to blame. The point is that it is time for us to save our country, that our country is perishing, not now from an invasion of 20 foreign nations, but from ourselves, 
that beyond the rightful administration, another administration has been formed, much stronger than the rightful one. They have set their own conditions. Everything has been evaluated, and the prices have even become common knowledge. And no ruler, be he wiser even than all other lawgivers and rulers, has enough power to correct the evil. However much he may restrict the actions of bad officials by appointing other officials to watch over them. Nothing will be successful until each one of us feels that, just as in the epoch when people took arms and rose up against the enemy, so he must rise up against falsity. As a Russian, as one bound to you by ties of blood, of one in the same blood, I now address you. I address those of you who have at least some notion of what nobility of mind is. I invite you to remember the duty each man faces in any place. I invite you to consider your duty more closely and the obligation of your earthly service because we all have only a dim idea of it now and we hardly. The sentence is unfinished in the manuscript. Trans. Thus in the manuscript, it should be Vasilyevich. Trans. The phrase is unfinished in the manuscript. Trans. That is, Tentetnikov, called Derpinikov in Gogol's early drafts. Trans. Part of the manuscript is missing. The text continues on a new page, in mid-sentence. Trans. The phrase is unfinished in the manuscript. Trans. The edge of the page is torn in the manuscript. Trans. Here the manuscript breaks off. Trans.